representatives, the president. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou would be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to elders past and present of all Australia's indigenous peoples. Thank you. Order. Order, Senators. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? I call the clerk. President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. And I'm advised there are no proposals for committees to meet. And I remind Senators that the questions may be put on any proposals at the request of any Senators. And the question, beg your pardon, um, I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, consideration of the Governor General's opening speech. Uh, Senator Payman. <clears throat> President, I move the following address and reply be agreed to. To His Excellency, the Governor General, may it please Your Excellency. We, the Senate of the Commonwealth of Australia in Parliament assembled, desire to express our loyalty to our most gracious sovereign and to thank Your Excellency for the speech which you have been pleased to address to Parliament. I begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal and Ngambri elders and knowledge holders who have paved the way for those here now, those following proudly in their footsteps and those yet to come as custodians and owners of country. I acknowledge the lands in Western Australia of the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, who I am honoured to represent. Sovereignty has never been ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander lands. I recognise the resilience and strength of all First Nations peoples of Australia and appreciate their knowledge sharing and stories that influence the lives of new Australians like me. My name is Senator Fatima Payman, and I stand here proudly as a West Australian, as a, dedic a dedicated citizen, as a compassionate daughter, as a caring sister, as a fun auntie, and, and as a loyal friend to many. We find ourselves paving the annals of history taking part in a parliament that is starting to reflect true diversity of our community, the true Australia we know it to be. I welcome this opportunity to move that the speech given by His Excellency the Governor-General at the opening of the 47th parliament be agreed to. This nation has an incredible indigenous heritage that dates back over 70,000 years of tradition, stories and wisdom. The rest of us who do not identify as a First Nations person, we have at some point immigrated here from another country. That is what makes Australia such an amazing place. That is, and, and this parliament symbolises that coming together of so many different cultures and communities. Australia is a better place and this parliament is a better place when we truly represent the backgrounds of Australian community that elect us. I want to wish my new colleague, Senator Jana Stewart, for the safe birth of her child in the coming days. And it is weeks. And it is so great that a senator can now take maternity leave 
another symbol that this chamber and this parliament continues to reflect more and more of our community than the mostly male senators that sat in the red benches a hundred years ago. A hundred years ago, let alone ten years ago, would this parliament have been as accepting? A <clears throat> hundred years ago, let alone ten years ago, would this parliament accept a woman choosing a, a hijab to be elected? I will have more about this to say in my first speech in September, but for those who choose to advise me about what I should wear or judge, judge my competency based on my external experience, know that the hijab is my choice. I want young girls who decide to wear the hijab to do it with pride and to do it with the knowledge that they have the right to wear it. I won't judge someone wearing boardies and flip-flops across the street. I don't expect people to judge me for wearing my scarf. We have all heard the adage, it takes a village to raise a child. This truly hits home for me. I would like my first gratitude to be expressed to my late beloved father, whose sacrifices will never be forgotten and who I dearly wish he was here to see how far his little daughters come. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I'd like to thank my mum and my siblings who've joined us here today <laughs> for their unwavering support, love and patience. Thank you to all my extended family members, supporters, friends and mentors, those who know me and those who are yet to get to know me. I want to specifically thank all the officials and organisers of United Workers' Union for being my second family. Carolyn Smith, thank you for taking me under your wing of guidance and support. And thank you to the people of Western Australia. You elected four new brilliant representatives in Tracy Roberts for Pierce, Zanita Mascarenas for Swan, Sam Lim for Tangney and Tanya Lawrence in Hasluck. You also elected a third Labor senator, first time since 1984. I am truly honoured to represent my beautiful home state. Who would have thought that a young woman born in Afghanistan and the daughter of a refugee would be standing in this chamber today? Knowing the sacrifices that my dad went through as a taxi driver, security guard, to ensure that he'd saved up enough money to make ends meet, to support his family, and to ensure that my siblings and I had the future that he wasn't able to secure for himself. I am young, I am progressive, and my family were born overseas. I am a representative of modern Australia. And Australia has spoken. They have elected the Honourable Anthony Albanese as their Prime Minister and the most diverse parliament in the nation's history. In his first speech in 1996, the member for Grandla and future Prime Minister said, and I quote, multiculturalism provides Australia with the unique opportunity to be a microcosm of the world, to show that cultural diversity and respect can lead to a more peaceful, equitable and fulfilling life for all." End quote. True words were never spoken before. He is the Prime Minister who will bring the country together and end the politics of division. Be the exemplar of compassion, integrity and hard work. To lead a government that is focused on tackling the spiralling cost of living that is making life tough for too many Australians. We must get wages rising again and make health care, child care and housing more affordable while we grow the economy and maintain its stability. To those who expect immediate results, please allow me to remind you that the previous government left us an economy trillion dollars in debt, declining productivity, wages going backwards and the highest level of inflation in 20 years. This was the result of a decade of deliberate decisions and bad policies from a government who lacked vision, was full of excuses 
and never took responsibility. These problems were a decade in making, and we won't solve them overnight. However, may I indulge you in outlining the key achievements of the Albanese Labor government in the last 10 weeks since our election. We have included the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags in press conference backdrops. We have restored Australia's international re reputation by re-establishing relations with France, rebooting negotiations on the European Union Free Trade Agreement and repairing ties in the Pacific. We have introduced legislation to deliver climate change targets of reducing Australia's emissions by 43 per cent by 2030, an aged care royal commission reform and paid family and domestic violence leave. We acted fast and provided immediate disaster support to flood affected areas in New South Wales. We are standing up for women. We have established the Women's Economic Equality Task Force and held the first face-to-face -face meeting of federal, state and territory ministers responsible for women and women's safety. We have brought a new energy in the fight against COVID by extending funding to support hospital systems. We have also reinstated the pandemic leave disaster payment, ensuring anyone unable to work because they were isolating without paid sick leave is supported. We have seen a much needed increase in the minimum wage. We released the report on the national plan to reduce violence against women and children, which the former government had refused to release. And of course, we have returned the Natasalingam family back home to Biloela. I would go on, but I only have 15 minutes. We have achieved more in 10 weeks than the previous government did in 10 years. A better future we promised and a better future we shall strive to deliver. The Albanese Labor government will strengthen Medicare by making it easier to see a doctor. We will restore integrity back into politics by establishing an anti-corruption commission with teeth. We will create secure local jobs by investing in fee-free TAFE and make university places um, and make jobs more secure with better pay and conditions. We will make childcare cheaper so that it's easier for working families to get ahead. We will make more things here in Australia by working with businesses to invest in manufacturing and renewables to create more Australian jobs. We will implement the Uluru Statement in full, voice, treaty and truth, and work towards closing the gap. We will create jobs, cut power bills, reduce emissions by boosting renewable energy. As mentioned earlier, aged care royal commission reform is very important to me. Organising in aged care showed me how the previous government neglected our elders and workers. I remember Jude Clark, who has been a carer for 48 years, saying that she still loves her job, but she's just exhausted. She recalls stressful nights where she used her tea breaks to spend quality time with residents. Another carer, Emma Bowers, shared with me one of the most horrifying incidents that resulted in blood gushing from her forehead. A high care dementia resident hit her with an object as she was tending to him all by herself. She believes if there were more staff rostered on that night, her health and safety wouldn't be at risk. Understaffed, overworked and underpaid, they deserve better. And Australians know they deserve better. That is why they elected an Albanese Labor government to clean up the mess and return care back, to, back into aged care. We will ensure older Australians receive the aged care they deserve from registered qualified nurses on site 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to more carers with more time to care. We will mandate that every Australian living in aged care receives an average of 215 minutes of care per day, as recommended by the Royal Commission. More time for not just essential medical treatment, but basic important things like helping people take a shower, or helping people get dressed, and helping people eat a nutritious meal. Labor will always back a pay rise for aged care workers Sorry, Labor will also back a real pay 
rise for aged care workers at the Fair Work Commission. Because if we want higher standards of care, we need to support higher wages for our carers. Labor has a plan to put security, dignity and quality, quality and humanity back into aged care. If you're watching this from home, from work, from your device, or in the years to come, know this. Australia is a land of opportunities. A land of opportunities for all. And under a Labor government, no one will be held back and no one will be left behind. No matter where you are born, no matter where, which state or territory you're from, no matter what you choose to wear, no matter who you choose to believe in, no matter who you choose to love, know that Australia is a place where you are welcome and that you can be part of a united collective. Whilst today we find ourselves in the most diverse of all parliaments so far, I know, we know, that this parliament, this very Senate, will continue representing Australians with integrity and a great deal of responsibility that I am honoured to be that I'm honoured to have bestowed upon me. I move that this chamber agrees to the motion. Oh, and by the way, this isn't my first speech. So. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Payman. And yes, if, if you rise again, please say it at the beginning of your speech. Uh, Senator Van. Thank you. Oh, beg your pardon. I'm sorry, Senator. Uh, my list is not correct. Um, okay. Stewart's going to second the motion, then I'll come to you. Senator Stewart. Thank you. I, I'm not sure if I need to say this is not my first speech at the same time, um, but I want to say I second the motion and I reserve my res right to speak. Thank you, Senator Stewart. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam President. With the Governor General's address yesterday, we heard a long speech, a lot of words, but so far we've seen a government that's low on action, if any. It's taken them uh, over two months to recall parliament. It's only going to sit for eight weeks this year. Now that to anyone shows a government that is just not prepared to govern, except in a very few certain circumstances. But the Labor government is now the Labor Party is now in government, and they've been charged with governing Australia and being a government for the people. However, Madam President, the Labor Party's true colours are already beginning to show. And it is clear that with this government, you have to look at not at what they say, but what they do. The Labor Party say one thing, but do another. Prime Minister Albanese said recently he wants to lead a government that does things. However, the only thing this government has done so far is backflip on policy and support their vested interests. Since the Labor Party has come to power, we have seen backflip after backflip. In fact, I think this government should be heading to Birmingham for the Commonwealth Games and compete in gymnastics with the number of backflips that they have already done in such a short period of time. Let us just look at their approach to COVID-19. Seeing as we are in the midst of an outbreak, one of the worst since the pandemic began, I think it is important to revisit the Labor Party's plan to beat COVID-19. In fact, it is interesting that this government has been so silent on their four-point plan. For two years now, we had them carping on from this side of the, the chamber about the handling of COVID. Yet here we are, and they're on those benches, and they have nothing to say. Since given their silence, I'll remind them of their four-point plan. They're going to fix the vaccine rollout, despite it being over 95 per cent of Australians aged 16 over being fully vaccinated. The second point, build dedicated quarantine facilities. Now, no wonder they have backlipped on this one, seeing how the Queensland Labor government are currently paying $300,000 a day 
to a medical company to provide health care services at its almost empty well camp quarantine facility. Big shame, Senator Scar. Big shame. Point number three, have an effective public information campaign. I'm hearing crickets. It's just crickets coming about information on COVID. Now, I understand why they're trying not to compete with the last government on, on this, seeing how the coalition's campaign was so successful, evidently seen in the vaccination rate that we achieved. Finally, the last point was start making mRNA vaccines in Australia. Again, a process already started by the coalition government. We worked very hard on to make sure that we're, um, we're building an mRNA vaccine facility in Victoria, the state that I proudly represent. But Labor have been silent. So we see a, a government that's been so quiet on COVID-19. Their plan is null and void. COVID is rampant in the community, and they don't have the slightest idea what to do about it. You guys remember how you were saying across the chamber we only had two jobs? Well, now you're in for a rude shock about how complex governing Australia actually is. Almost 5,000 Australians have passed away from COVID since the 31st of May this year. As of 22 July, there, are, there were 9,537 active COVID-19 cases and 1,013 active outbreaks in residential aged care facilities across Australia. There have been 2,187 reported deaths in 2022 in aged care facilities. And what is this government doing? Nothing. Nothing. They should reflect back on everything that they said from this side of the chamber over the past two years and take a good hard look at themselves. Now, I cannot be the only one in this chamber to remember the Labor Party inaccurately portraying the coalition government's performance during the COVID-19 pandemic. Senator Gallagher, on the 8th of February, said in this chamber, and I quote, there are problems in aged care where the situation is so dire with thousands infected with COVID, hundreds of dying and staff not being able to perform their jobs. On that same day, Senator Watt, who we heard an awful lot from over the last two years on this topic, said that an aged care facility was, and again in quote, in complete meltdown, with the deaths from COVID of 15 aged care residents and 182 residents and staff testing positive. Now, I read out the numbers before. They're a lot worse under this government, I can assure you of that. And I could go on. I could pull out of Hansard the record over the previous years and find any Labor senator from the previous parliament commenting on how bad the COVID outbreak was and how much more needed to be done. However, the matter of the fact is currently there are more cases, more deaths, more outbreaks in aged care facilities than before. And what are the Labor Party saying about it? Again, at the risk of being repetitive, nothing. The Prime Minister is silent. The Health Minister is silent. The Aged Care Minister is silent. In fact, the whole Labor Party is silent. Now that they actually have to try and solve the problems rather than just carping on, all they can come up with is silence and hope that no one notices. I assure you, we're noticing. This is what happens when you have a government who carry on in the chamber but does not have the slightest idea on how to actually govern. In fact, it was only in January this year that Mr Albanese was posting on social media that, I quote, rapid antigen tests should be free and available. We are in a pandemic. Everyone needs access. And even after the health minister warned that millions of Australians will be infected by COVID over coming weeks, the Prime Minister doubled down on, the, on his backflip to not make rapid antigen tests freely available to Australians. With the Prime Minister labelling the decision as a legacy of the coalition government, this shows the Australian people one thing. This government
has no idea of what they are doing. Now, it might be a bit of a newsflash for Mr Albanese, but you're in government now. You can extend the rats, free rats tests if you wish. Even after the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners asked for an extension, and they weren't the only professional body to do so, asked for an extension of the program, saying it will pull but it will put vulnerable people at greater risk if it is not continued. The Albanese government decided that they were not going to listen to the experts and went ahead and cut the program. Despite campaigning for a pandemic leave payment, the Prime Minister backflipped on his original stance and attempted to axe the payment the first chance he got, claiming that it was not needed because all workers could just work from home. He was backed up by the, claim, the Treasurer claiming that they could not afford, the, afford it. This is despite, mind you, constantly calling for more spending, increased payments while in opposition. However, once again, we saw the Labor Party backflip and continue the program after pressure was applied on them by the state governments. Now, I watched, like many of you, Prime Minister Albanese as opposition leader criticise the government for not just implement, implementing mask mandates, but saying, and I quote, that just shows a Prime Minister who is prepared to play politics as he is during this period, whereby he is too frightened of upsetting some of the hard right who are so obsessed by not having any rules in place. So now you are Prime Minister, Mr Albanese. What are you frightened of? This means one of either two things. Prime Minister Morrison was doing the right thing and as, and as opposition leader, Mr Albanese was just playing politics or Mr Albanese is just playing politics now. Which one is it? You can guess. But what we do know is that while those opposite don't know how to govern, they do know how to dance when their puppet masters in the unions and big super funds pull their strings. Because the only action the Labor Party have taken so far is to remove legislative oversight from their biggest donors. During the last parliament, for the last three, yeah, yeah, some, some very good points. For the three years I listened to those opposite talk about the importance of accountability. It is fascinating then that as one of the Labor Party's first acts, that they start working on reducing transparency and accountability for super funds. The Your Future, Your Super legislation was vitally important and introduced by the coalition government and was widely welcomed for increasing transparency so that everyday Australians were more empowered with their retirement savings. Now the Labor Party are disempowering everyday Australians and giving the power back to the $3 trillion industry super fund sector. Now, I might remind you, and we'll have to wait for the uh, returns, but I'm pretty sure we will find out they were some of the biggest donors to the Labor Party campaign. Labor truly are the party of vested interests. It is really an embarrassment for the government that while we were experiencing a third wave of COVID-19, instead of directing the Treasury to look at how government could support Australians, the Labor Party was directing the Treasury to look at how it could support industry super funds, get away with poor performance and mismanagement, all so they could continue to pocket their millions of dollars in donations. <clears throat> and now, just this week, we've heard the government plans to remove the ABCC's powers to an absolute minimum. Also, that unions, such as the CFMEU, can get away with bullying, sexist and thuggish behaviour. Industry groups and business have widely condemned this move and as it only seeks to disempower actual workers in the construction industry. What happened to the Prime Minister's promise, I ask you, to work with business and industry groups to increase productivity? Because there's only week one of Parliament and that has already gone out the window. Continuing on the theme of transparency and accountability, Ms Albanese has made another backflip on National Cabinet secrecy, opting to continue to prevent the release of documents 
related to meetings of the Prime Minister and state and territory leaders, despite being such a harsh critic of the practice while he was in opposition. Mr Albanese confirmed that he would not be ending the practice, despite his accusation that Prime Minister Morrison was obsessed with secrecy while as Prime Minister. So it's, already, it's also interesting to see that Mr Albanese has not fulfilled his promise of including local government in those meetings of the National Cabinet. What is most amusing is that the Labor Party campaigned on accountability, yet you only have to look at what they do and not what they say, because the two could not be further apart. This is a government that has shown that their interests lie in standing up for their political puppet masters and not for everyday Australians. They have shown absolutely no interest in trying to improve the lives of Australia beyond ch chanting a mere slogan and Australians are beginning to pay for their mistakes. Australians need to look at what this government does and not at what they say, because only, after only such a short time in government they have shown that their actions do not follow their words. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Well, yesterday this parliament was welcomed to country with a powerful speech about the ongoing fight for First Nations justice. All around Australia, we live on stolen and unceded land. The grave injustices inflicted upon First Nations people since colonisation continue, with deaths in custody, poverty, ongoing dispossession and a persistent gap in health, education and employment outcomes. We must tell the truth about our past in order to start to heal. And I'm proud to be part of a party that's deeply committed to the work for First Nations justice, to truth-telling, to treaties and to voice. Yesterday we saw the opening of a parliament with more women, with more people from diverse backgrounds, with more members and senators from outside the two big parties. And it's also now a parliament with the largest numbers of Greens ever. Our now 16-strong Greens Party room is majority women, and women of colour have taken up positions of authority. Uh, Muslim migrant, uh, fantastic feminist Senator Maureen Faruqi uh, is our Greens deputy leader, and our grassroots activist and Jabwaran Gunai Gujamara woman Senator Lydia Thorpe is our Senate deputy leader. I'm also particularly proud that my home state of Queensland became Greensland, and I'm now joined by four wonderful friends, Senator Penny Alman payne member for Ryan, Libby Watson-Brown, member for Griffith, Max Chandler-Mather, and member for Brisbane, Stephen Bates, who gives his first speech in the other place tonight. Many Australians shared on election night that elation that after nine long years we'd seen the back of an embarrassing, incompetent, rampantly self-interested and desperately archaic Morrison government. But what was clear was that the vote for both the Coalition and the Labor Party both went down. The vote for the Greens and independents surged. People want change. They want choice, and they don't just want two parties who frequently agree with each other and often lack courage. People want a democracy that works for them, not just delivers for big political donors and vested interests. They want universal services like fully funded hospitals and schools. They want affordable housing. They want dental and mental health included in Medicare. They want student debt abolished and uni and TAFE made free again. They want free childcare, fair wages at work. They want integrity in government. And they want real climate action that looks after our current coal workers as we transition to 100 per cent clean, cheap, renewable energy. And they understand that if we make the billionaires and the big corporations pay their fair share, that we can actually afford to fund those universal services that make people's everyday lives better and reduce the cost of living. The Greens will push for all of these things in this parliament. And this is a parliament with a real opportunity to change the future. There is hope again. But the new government just being better than the past nine years will not be enough. We need brave, strong action to address the climate crisis, the housing crisis and the inequality crisis. I want to acknowledge the brave young people who gathered in parliament and the lawns yesterday as part of the Tomorrow Movement. Those young people, like so many people I spoke to during and since the election, 
are worried about their future. They understand the science. They know that we can't keep digging up coal and gas. Every year of their lives is hotter than the last. They've seen their communities burned, flooded, suffering through drought. They've read the State of the Environment report. They've struggled to find any work, let alone secure work. Their rent keeps going up and they're burdened with student debt. These brave young people are fed up. They're sick of politicians who listen to their big donors and not them, who care more about their own interests than the future of communities. Those young people voted for change and they're demanding that everyone in this place thinks about them when we're making decisions. They're the ones who'll carry the burden of our choices and our inaction. Now, last night on the 7.30 report on ABC, the Prime Minister said that not opening up new coal and gas would have a, quote, a devastating impact on our economy, end quote. But you know what has a devastating impact? Floods, fires, droughts, keeping emergency services ready to respond to the latest crisis, loss of agricultural land, coal communities left high and dry by changing global markets that the government has refused to plan for. The CSIRO says that extreme weather caused by climate change, including new coal and gas, will cost Australia $39 billion each year by 2050. Despite this marriage to the fossil fuel sector by both the big parties, the young people in the Tomorrow Movement still have hope. They find strength in their solidarity, their shared purpose and their determination to turn things around. They know that a rapid transition to a renewable future is possible. They know that transition offers sustainable job opportunities, stronger communities, better services and a healthier environment. They just need us to act. Now, along with my Greens colleagues, I will be working tirelessly in this parliament to channel their hope into action. It's what the people of Australia voted for, and we intend to push this government to deliver. Now, we're pleased that in relation to the climate target legislation that the government is at the table in negotiations with us and the Crossbranch uh, to improve its tepid bill. We're having productive discussions about improving that bill, but we will continue to push to make sure that we don't open new coal and gas mines in this country. Any target that's legislated will be totally undermined if the 114 coal and gas projects in the pipeline proceed. The Greens will push for rapid decarbonisation and a transition to 100 per cent renewables that the science says is needed to not just keep our habitat livable but to protect the Great Barrier Reef and minimise species loss. And we will look after coal workers and affected communities while that transition happens with jobs guarantees and future planning. We can tax billionaires and make big corporations pay their fair share so that everyone can access the services that they need to live a good life. This government could and should drop the $200 billion stage three tax cuts and redirect that money into things that improve people's everyday lives. Free childcare, wiping student debt, more affordable housing. This government wouldn't need an austerity budget and the cuts that they're flagging if it axed Morrison's stage three tax cuts. Throughout the election campaign, I heard a lot from voters about what would improve their lives. It's clear that we're in a housing crisis. The waiting lists for social housing in all states are out of control and growing, with some people waiting years to get a home. Every night, thousands of people are sleeping rough, couch surfing, they're in crisis accommodation or tenuous housing situations and at real risk of becoming homeless. Older women are among the fastest growing cohort of people facing homelessness. And tonight, 400,000 women over the age of 45 are without a home. Now, we're a rich country. There is no excuse for a single human being to be without a home. We need to build one million social homes. We need to give renters more protection. And we need to fix the perverse and inequitable tax settings that make it cheaper to buy your fifth investment property than your first home. And we need to raise the rate of income support above the poverty line so that people aren't choosing between paying the rent or putting food on the table. Now, on dental, uh, each year, over two million Australians avoid going to the dentist, not because they don't like the dentist, but because they can't afford it. In the papers today, dentists are saying that they're worried that two-thirds of Australians who've put off making an appointment risk minor issues becoming major problems. People who avoid going to the dentist face higher costs, higher risk of things like heart disease, and they can face social isolation. 
The Greens recognise that getting dental care uh, into Medicare for everyone would relieve a significant cost of living pressure. It would address inequality and it would lead to better health outcomes. Now, we also need to get mental health care into Medicare. The ABS National Study of Mental Health and Wellbeing, which was released last week, found that 40 per cent of Australians aged between 16 and 85 have had a mental health disorder during their lifetime, and one in six has had suicidal thoughts or behaviours. Almost half of all young women and 30 per cent of young men suffered an anxiety, depression or substance abuse disorder last financial year. These are horrifying statistics. And we need to work to end the financial insecurity, the housing stress, the gender inequality and discrimination, and the persistent existential threat of a changing climate and an uncertain future that is driving that epidemic of anxiety in our young people. But we also need to make sure that people experiencing mental health issues have accessible, affordable support for as long as they need it. No one should have to suffer because they can't afford mental health care. We need to invest in increasing the mental health workforce, making mental health care available to everyone under Medicare and removing the stigma that sadly still persists around addressing mental health. Now, I've got the portfolio for women uh, for the Greens, and the women of Australia just voted out, in my view, the most sexist government in decades, and they expect real progress from this parliament. We welcome the government's plan for more affordable childcare, although we think it should be free. We welcome the measures to address the gender pay gap. Again, we think they should go further. Um, we're interested in the plans for a national gender equality strategy. We've long supported paid family and domestic violence leave. Um, we desperately need that positive duty on employers to provide a safe workplace, as the Sex Discrimination Commissioner recommended. And we need a strong national plan to end violence against women and their children. Um, they're all positive reforms that the Greens have pushed for for many years. Sadly, this year, 25 women already have been killed by violence, and countless more have been abused, assaulted and live in fear. Family, sexual and domestic violence is a national crisis. It's still a national crisis. It has been for a decade or more, and it's incumbent upon this parliament to do the work to fix it. Now, we welcome the government's decision to delay the introduction of the next national plan to get it right, but getting it right means having ambitious targets in the plan, and it means actual funding to achieve those targets. The Greens are backing the calls from the women's safety sector for $1 billion each year for frontline support services so that no one is turned away when they reach out for help. Shortchanging the national plan will see more women killed. We need to listen to the voices of uh, victim survivors and experts, and we desperately need fulsome investment in prevention, in education and in trauma recovery. We need a standalone plan developed by and for First Nations women. We need specialist services for older women, for young women, for LGBTIQA plus people, for migrant women and women with disabilities. And we have to address the financial insecurity that can make it difficult to leave abusive relationships and start new lives. I want to briefly mention the US decision to overturn Roe v Wade. It shows that hard-won rights for women can be eroded unless we are vigilant. But it's also highlighted the inequity in access to reproductive health care in our country. Some people are having to travel for many, many hours and spend hundreds of dollars to get an abortion. Now, many people can't afford the travel costs or the costs of securing an abortion. And I was very disappointed to hear our new Prime Minister walk away from the Labor Party's previous 2019 commitment to say that people could and should be able to access abortion through public hospitals. Now, we will push the new government to revert back to that original good position, because abortion is health care and it must be available to everyone, no matter where you live or how much money you have. Let us not become America. Now, on integrity, which uh, is my other portfolio of democracy for the Greens, Australians voted resoundingly for more integrity in politics. And people are thoroughly sick of the culture of entitlement and rorting and jobs for mates. They're sick of the donations from the dirty industries that buys policy outcomes to boost their corporate profits from the fossil fuel sectors, big pharma, defence, gambling. They buy the outcomes that work for those sectors and they work against the long-term interests of the community. People are sick of government donors, uh, political donors and government friends getting government grants, subsidies and handouts, while so many other people are doing it tough. 
Now, we're really pleased that the government has publicly committed to establishing a independent integrity commission, and we will hold them to account on that commitment. Obviously, a bill passed this place um, from the Greens several years ago, and we look forward to finally having a federal corruption watchdog. That watchdog has to have broad powers, it needs to have genuine transparency, and it needs adequate resourcing to do its job properly. Um, and we need to punish the rorters and the grifters and protect the brave whistleblowers that call them out. We need to end that jobs for mates culture, the lobbying, the revolving door between government and industry, and we need to get big money out of politics once and for all so that politicians act in the public interest, not their own. Now, lastly, on electoral reforms, this election delivered the most culturally and gender diverse parliament in Australia's history. But there is still such a long way to go before our parliament truly looks like the community it represents. We need to remove those barriers for people running for parliament, including that archaic section 44 restriction on dual citizens and public servants. We should be proud of our multicultural community, and they should be in this place. Um, we desperately need to end the influence of big money on our parliament by stopping um, uh, ending those uh, by putting in electoral spending caps and having donation reforms, truth in advertising laws, and we desperately need that set the standard report legislated. The election sent a clear message. Australians are sick of a political system that doesn't listen to them, that doesn't look like them and that doesn't fight for them. We've got so much work to do to restore Australia's confidence in politics in this place, and the Greens are here for it. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Grogan. Thank you. I stand here in what is the most diverse parliament that Australia has ever seen. And that makes me so proud. I also wish to take this opportunity to pay my deep and abiding respects to the First Nations people of Australia. This is a parliament that is beginning to look more like the Australia that we purport to represent. And that makes me very proud. Proud of an Albanese Labor government for its approach of progressive, consultative and respectful engagement in running this parliament. With a strong agenda that we intend to deliver, a strong agenda that includes strengthening our health care, improving aged care, delivering on a First Nations voice to parliament a strong and transparent National Anti-Corruption Commission, action on climate change and so much more. We are a government committed to workers' rights in all forms. We're investing in creating jobs, in creating educational opportunities and in protecting workers' rights. We'll start that with Jobs and Skills Australia. We've committed to the creation of this independent body and it will tackle the current skills shortages and get more people into meaningful work. We've committed to a range of educational policies that will drive that. We will target the current skills shortage, promote educational opportunities, and that includes fee-free TAFE. It is not exclusively about having a job, but also about fostering safe workplaces and enabling new investment and new development to build our economy and provide more and better opportunities. This is why we have a range of policies that will deliver on that to help strengthen workers' rights, including 10 days paid domestic violence leave, enshrining job security in our legislation and making wage theft illegal. The Albanese Labor government is committed to creating jobs. While we are currently experiencing a skills shortage, we are also in a situation where we have 1.3 million people unemployed or underemployed, and many more struggling on low wages and in insecure work. A skills focus is essential to the well-being of Australians in our economy. We must address the disconnect between the unemployment and the skills shortage. And that's exactly what we intend to do. To appropriately deliver on this, it's essential that we get a better understanding of the skills we require to drive our national skills policy and our industry development. We will take immediate action to address the skills crisis affecting our workforce. The Jobs and Skills Summit on the 1st of September 
is the first major step there. There are various consultations going on to shape that summit, and that summit will come up with immediate actions, mid-term actions and a longer-term plan. We have a plan to create and strengthen the workforce, and Skills and Jobs Australia is a central part of that. It is an independent agency that will engage with state and territory governments, as well as industry, unions and training providers and employers. We will not be excluding anyone. We will not be preferencing anyone. We will be consulting with all of those interested groups who can help build a stronger future. This will operate as a genuine partnership, foster discussion and ensure that we have a shared understanding of the issues, not just of today, but the emerging issues for our workforce. It will work to investigate the adequacy of our vocational training system and then address those skill shortages in conjunction with the available training across the country. As I travel around my home state of South Australia and I meet with training providers, TAFE, universities, employers, I hear about opportunities and initiatives that have languished. Our plan will change that. We will drive change to connect those together. We will work to ensure that Australia's training systems will deliver on the skills necessary for workers and to provide them with job opportunities. It is clear through our commitment to, the jobs, to Jobs and Skills Australia that an Albanese Labor government is dedicated to creating educational opportunities. And we know one of the biggest factors in our skills makeup is how many Australians that we educate and that we provide opportunities, that our education system is not exclusive. We've also committed to introducing fee-free TAFE so if you're looking for training, your current income or lack of it will not influence that. You will be able to access training and build your career. There will be 600, 465,000 fee-free TAFE places for Australian students. And they will be predominantly reserved for those industries of national importance. Industries are impacted by COVID-19 industries that are facing skills shortages and industries that are going to shape the future of this country and our economic prosperity. We'll also include, increase the university places, up to 20,000 university places in areas such as engineering, nursing, technology and teaching. These commitments will help to build a bigger workforce and create educational opportunities. We know that urgent action is required and we will deliver. These initiatives contribute directly to our plans for a future made in, in Australia. We will provide up to 15 billion of capital to invest in job creating projects through the National Reconstruction Fund. We have opportunities in Australia that are vast. We can build the strongest renewable energy sector. We can revise our entire energy system to be better, to be cheaper, to be more efficient and to drive industry development because of the efficiencies and effectiveness of that energy system. We will maximise the use of Australian goods made here. We will rebuild our proud manufacturing industry. We will support new and emerging industries and commercialise innovation and technology. And we will supercharge national productivity and fix the MBN. There are so many initiatives, we need to ensure a comprehensive approach. So while we are building the skills system, while we are investing in the industries, the employment opportunities and the businesses of the future, we will also be delivering on cheaper childcare. We will also be creating a skills culture that will build us into the future. In addition to that, we need to improve our workplace culture. We cannot just focus on building the skills, we have to focus on the culture as well. And as I've said, I'm very proud to be part of an Albanese government that is dedicated to workers' rights in all forms. 
Creating safe workplaces and helping to provide protection for workers will improve the quality of jobs in our country. All workers in Australia deserve the right to be safe at work. They all deserve the right to be safe at home. And they should never have to choose between their safety and their income. This can be seen through a range of commitments, one of which is introducing 10 days domestic violence leave. In this country, one in four women over 15 have experienced domestic violence by an intimate partner. On average, one woman is killed by her partner or former partner every 10 days in Australia. And paid leave is essential, absolutely essential, to helping these women leave violent relationships, access critical services and look to the future. Our commitment to paid family and domestic violence leave will give workers the means to escape these circumstances without sacrificing or risking their job or an opportunity for an income. Leave is particularly necessary for casual employees who are even more marginalised in these circumstances. Nobody should be put in that kind of precarious situation. Nobody should have to choose between being safe and an income. This is key to economic equality. Other measures that we intend to pursue and deliver on um, include the same job, same pay commitment, which outlines that if you do the same job as somebody else, you should be, say, you should be paid the same amount of money. Around Australia, we have work sites where workers do the same job, the same hours, the same conditions, but they get paid less. That's got to stop. We also have a commitment to tackling insecure work with a particular focus on the gig economy and short-term contracts. We will ensure that job security is at the heart of decision-making, and we will ensure that wage theft is made a crime at the national level. Wage theft currently rips off more than $1 billion from Australian workers each year, and this has got to stop, and we intend to stop it. So it is clear, I believe, that the Albanese Labor government is committed to workers' rights in all forms. We respect all workers and we will work to protect all workers. We have a comprehensive plan to tackle Australia's skills shortage and we will do that through a range of measures, including the Jobs and Skills Australia plans. We will invest in fee-free TAFE and increase university places to help create job opportunities and address training shortages in those vital industries that are going to build a stronger future, both economically, socially and in every single workplace across the country. We will, will, we will rebuild our proud manufacturing industry. It is an area that has suffered so much but gives us so many opportunities, not just to make things at home, not just to build our own sovereign resilience, but for export purposes and to build an, economic, an, eco, an economy that we can all be proud of. We will protect workers experiencing family and domestic violence, overwhelmingly women, and we will protect them from having to choose between their safety and their income. We will protect vulnerable workers by tackling insecure work and wage theft. In short, we intend to build our future on respect and on fairness and on a shared opportunity. As I travel around South Australia, I see so many opportunities, particularly at the moment in the hydrogen industry, where we will start to see the fruits of the work of the South Australian government supported um, by the plans of the Albanese Labor government to develop a hydrogen industry that we can all be proud of. The interest in this was proven um, in a recent expression of interest put out by the South Australian government, which resulted in over 60 businesses um, putting in an expression of interest to be part of that hydrogen future. It is an exciting time, and I know that the South Australian government is bolstered 
by now having a federal government who will commit to these important industries that not only help us build our future economically, help us address climate change, help us build an industry that is cleaner, that is more effective and that provides more jobs into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Grogan. Senator Scar. And, uh, and can I just say before I start how much uh, I was moved by the contribution from our new Senator, Senator Payman uh, in relation to her, uh, her first contribution, not first speech, but her first contribution uh, in this chamber. And as someone who has worked extremely closely with our wonderful Australian Afghani community since the tragic fall of Afghanistan to the Taliban last year, uh, can I say to you that your presence here today is a testament to the wonderful contribution that community has made to Australia, uh, and it is an extremely significant milestone that you are here today. And I'm sure your father, uh, were he uh, with us, would just be so, so, so proud of you, and, and rightly so. Madam Acting Deputy President, so we gather here today in light of the last federal election campaign, and I must say at the outset that in my home state of Queensland, the Liberal National Party holds 70 per cent of all the federal lower house seats in Queensland, and the Queensland Liberal National Party now holds approximately 40 per cent of all coalition seats held across Australia. So my home state of Queensland did not vote for change. They did not vote for change at the last federal election, and that needs to be recognised at the outset. They did not vote for change, Senator McKim. I would like to acknowledge the wonderful work that was done by a whole series of great Queenslanders to contribute to that result in my home state of Queensland. First, to the Liberal National Party grassroots members. You are the heart, the soul and the backbone of the Liberal National Party in Queensland. And none of us would be here. None of us would have the opportunity to make our contributions to this Senate but for your efforts. So to each and every one of you, I say thank you. I'd also like to give uh, a tribute, pay tribute to my colleagues Trevor Evans, Julian Simmons and Amanda Stoker, who unfortunately lost their seats at the last federal election. They could not have worked harder. They could not have worked harder for their constituencies and for the state of Queensland during the course of the last parliament. And I congratulate them on their efforts and wish them all the best in their future endeavours. I'd also like to congratulate all of the other unsuccessful Liberal National Party candidates in the state of Queensland. And in my first speech in this place, I recognised the special contribution, and I call them the heroes of Australian democracy, who stand for their party, stand for their beliefs in seats where there is little prospect of victory, but every prospect of demonstrating the commitment to their values and participating in our democratic process. So, in particular, I pay tribute to Sam Biggins, our wonderful candidate in the federal seat of Blair, Olivia Roberts, who has stood twice for the party in the difficult seat of Griffith, Bryce MacDonald, who achieved an outstanding result in Kennedy in far north Queensland, Vivian Lobo in the seat of Lilly, my dear, dear friend Stephen Wang in the seat of Morton, Kyle McMillan, who arrived onto the electoral landscape like a knight on a white charger at the 11th hour, two minutes to midnight, after our candidate had pulled out of the race, something like an hour before nominations closed, and Kyle rode in on his white charger and did an absolutely fantastic job representing the party and its values in the seat of Oxley. And I should also acknowledge that the member for the seat of Oxley, Milton Dick MP, uh, we cover the same patch in many respects, has had the honour of uh, achieving the post of speaker in the other place, and I'm sure he'll do an outstanding job in that regard. And lastly, Paul Darwin in the seat of Rankin, the Treasurer's seat uh, of Rankin, another seat uh, which is a difficult seat for our side of politics in terms of securing victory. And again, he did a wonderful, wonderful job. To the Senate candidates, in addition to 
Amanda Stoker, who were unsuccessful, Nicole Tobin, Andrew Cripps and Fiona Ward. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And to the new colleagues who come to this place, Henry Pike representing the uh, constituency of Bowman, Andrew Wilcox Dawson, Colin Boyce representing Flynn, you will all make outstanding contributions to this place as your predecessors did. Now, having dealt with the preliminaries, I'd like to get straight into it and talk about the ABCC. The Australian Building and Construction Commission and the outrageous, unlawful behaviour, recidivist behaviour of the CFMMEU. One of the first actions, one of the first actions which the Albanese federal government did was to gut the powers out of the ABCC. But we see no reference. We see no reference to the CFMMEU in the governor's address to this place yesterday. And in fact, in fact, when the industrial relations minister, Mr. Tony Burke, put out his three-page press release called "Restoring Equal Rights for Construction Workers," restoring equal rights for construction workers on his website, in three pages he could not bring himself to mention the recidivist unlawful activities of the CFMMEU. The whole reason why the Australian Building and Corrupt Construction Commission was established because of the unlawful behaviours of the CFMMEU. And he couldn't bear to mention it once. Couldn't bear to mention it once. And I'll be listening very carefully to the contributions made by other senators in this place during this debate as to whether or not they've got the gumption as to whether or not they've got the gumption, Senator Pratt, to talk about head-on, head-on, the recidivist behaviour of the CFF, CFMMEU. And it's not just me who says that. It's not just me who says that, Madam Acting Deputy President. After the writs for the last election were issued, the High Court brought down a judgment, a unanimous judgment, a unanimous judgment in the case of Australian Building and Construction Commissioner versus Pattinson. In this case, this case, this case involved the unlawful activity, the unlawful activity of the CFMMEU with respect to using unlawful measures to promote their business strategy of no ticket, no start on construction sites across this country. And what did the highest court in our nation say? Not Senator Scar, not someone from the coalition. Certainly, don't wait for Tony Burke to refer to it in his, uh, in his media releases on the CFMMEU. It doesn't exist to him. It's the elephant in the room that doesn't exist. But what did our High Court say? Let me quote from paragraph 43. And I'll be very interested to hear what the Greens have to say about this. I'll be very interested to hear what the Greens say about this, Madam Acting Deputy President, as well, because I'm going to talk to uh, an issue dealing with occupational health and safety and women on our work site shortly. And this is what the High Court said at paragraph 43. Not a Liberal coalition senator, the High Court, that the full court's approach in this case is apt to undermine the primacy of deterrence as the objective of the civil penalty regime in the Act is amply demonstrated once regard is had to the failure of previous penalties to have any deterrent effect, to have any deterrent effect right. on the CFMMEU's repeated contraventions of section 3491 of the Act. Their repeated contraventions of section 3491 of the Act. What do those opposites say to that? The circumstance that the CFMMEU has continued to breach section 3491, steadfastly resistant, steadfastly resistant, the High Court's words, not mine, to previous attempts to enforce compliance by civil penalties fixed at less than the permitted maximum is a compelling indication that the penalties previously imposed have not been taken seriously because they were insufficient to outweigh the benefits flowing unlawfully this is our high court flowing unlawfully to the contravener the CFMMEU from adherence to the no ticket no start policy to the contrary our high court our high court saying this to the contrary the CFMMEUs Continuing defiance, continuing defiance, snubbing their nose at the rule of law in this country, indicates that it regards the penalties previously imposed as an—and I quote the High Court, Senator Pratt—the High Court 
an acceptable cost of doing business. End quote. That's what our High Court said, right. ladies and gentlemen. And then subsequently, in the election campaign, His Honour Justice Logan, in the case of Australian Building and Construction Commissioner, the Construction, Forestry, Maritime, Mining and Energy Union, the Titan Cranes case, referring to activity, unlawful activity conducted by the CFMMEU in accordance with its standard business practices referred to by the High Court. This is what His Honour Justice Logan said. Not my words, not my words, not the words of an ideologically driven Liberal Coalition senator, but the judge's words. The time, the time when enough was enough, enough was enough in relation to compliance with the law of the land by this union, by the CFMMEU, its immediate pre predecessor, and for that matter, others in history and its officials, no doubt referring to the BLF, has well and truly passed. Has well and truly passed. That's what His Honour Justice Logan said in this case. There's no mention of this case in Minister Tony Burke's media release put out on Sunday. No mention of this case in the speeches we're, which we're going to hear about, about workplace health and safety on our construction work sites around Australia. Absolutely none. Absolutely none. It's the union they dare not speak its name. The, it's the union they dare not speak its name. The CFMMEU. And when they're found out in photographs with, with senior officials of the CFMMEU, they can't scamper quick enough in the other direction and say, oh, I didn't know such and such was subject to all these penalties and engaged in all this unlawful activity. I didn't know he just turned up at the May Day party and, and the parade wearing a big CFMMEU t-shirt. I didn't know the history. I didn't know the history of the member of the CFMMEU, Michael Radbar, who sits around your national executive of the Labor Party in terms of his unlawful activity. No, I don't know. I don't know. We will not hear the word CFMMEU contributed in this debate from the Labor Party. I am absolutely certain of that. Absolutely certain of that, because you're embarrassed by them. You're embarrassed. It's your dirty little secret. You're trying to keep it secret from the Australian public, and it's pathetic. Absolutely pathetic. And what did we hear from the Industrial Relations Minister Tony Burke in relation to uh, in, in relation to uh, the uh, exercise of? Uh, the rule of law with respect to these industrial relations powers. This is what Tony Burke said. We're going to move it to the state workplace health and safety agencies in the states. They can look after this. They can look after this. There's no, there's no need. There's no need for an ABCC. Do you know what happened? I say, I see Senator Roberts is here from my home state of Queensland. The issue we had in Queensland in 2019 is that the Together Union representing public servants in Queensland had to take industrial action to protect their workplace health and safety inspectors who were members of the Together Union from the CFMEU. <laughs> how ironic, how pathetic wow. that Together Union, public service union, had to take industrial action so that their own members, workplace health and safety inspectors, could not be forced to attend at 17 construction sites around Queensland because they were in fear of their own safety on those construction sites. What is your what, well? That's a nice quip, Senator Pratt. But what's going to be your answer to that? Are you going to defend the CFMMEU? Workplace health and safety inspectors in Queensland had to take union action to protect themselves from the thuggery of the CFMMEU. What is your response to that, Senator Pratt? You don't have one, because there is no response. It's your dirty little secret. You want to keep it your dirty little secret, keep it secret from the Australian public. And I can assure you this, Madam Acting Deputy Senator, President, Senator, we will shine Senator, a bright light. Senator Scar, Senator McAllister. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, in this chamber, it is not courteous to accuse other senators of failing to respond when Senator Scar knows full well that without the call, Senator Pratt may not respond to his speech, um, which 
imputes a range of observations about Senator Pratt and her position on certain questions. I think that you might ask Senator Scar to cease harassing Senator Pratt in the way that he is doing so at the moment. Uh, Senator Scar, I note that you've just got 50 seconds uh, remaining. So, so I'm sorry, I'm speaking at the moment. Um, so, Senator Scar, I notice that you've only got 50 seconds remaining. So, if you could try to return to the, the Governor General reply and, and you know, improve your tone, that'd be appreciated. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. It'll be interesting to see if Senator McAllister is actually interested in relation to the harassment that occurs on our construction sites in terms of the activities of the CFMEU. I've spoken to construction site employees who've had the number plates of their personal motor vehicles photographed by members of that union with a view to personally intimidating them, personally intimidating them and causing them great stress. That is harassment. That is harassment, Senator McAllister, not what I said in a rhetorical flourish with respect to Senator Pratt, and I don't appreciate the imputation. Please rest assured we will shine a bright light on the Labor Party's dirty secret and the role of the CFMMEU all the way to the next election. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, this is one nation's address in reply to the Governor-General's opening speech for the 47th Parliament a speech on behalf of his government. The reviews on social media were underwhelming. Everyday Australians struggling with cost of living were looking to the government for a real plan to bring inflation under control. None was forthcoming. No plan. The truth is we have a new government that has a long list of sponsors that it needs to placate. Everyday Australians, sadly, are not on the government's list. One Nation is ready with bold nation-building ideas to deliver breadwinner jobs lower inflation and energy security. So let me start where all good government should start, with the people. If everyday Australians today feel like they're working harder and going backwards, it's because people are. This month's Treasury financial data shows that the share of our GDP going to people, that's wages and salaries, is at an all-time low. Yet the percentage of going to corporate profits is at an all-time high. Over the last 30 years, education, health care and housing have increased 300 per cent, far outstripping wages growth. Next, One Nation continues to pursue our commitment to workers' rights across the course of this parliament. Today we reintroduce our Fair Work Amendment, Equal Pay for Equal Work Bill 2022. This bill ensures casuals on labour hire contracts in industries that do not have provision for casual employment receive the same pay as the full-time worker alongside doing the same job. Our bill covers black coal, airline crew and stevedoring. In anticipation of any future exploitation of workers, the bill is worded to allow additional awards to be added. Next, energy. It's unbelievable that a nation as resource-rich as Australia has plunged its people into an energy crisis. Our government should be able to guarantee affordable and reliable energy. Yet in 2022, state and federal governments are failing. I remind the Senate, Australia has enough coal and uranium reserves to last hundreds of years. Yet we have the highest electricity prices in the world, the highest in the world. We're the world's largest exporters of energy, number one in gas, number two in coal. Yet due to government subsidies for unreliable wind and solar, we have the world's highest domestic prices of gas and electricity. Australian families bear the cost of the unreliable wind and solar fairy tales, with our living standards declining and electricity bills climbing. The inefficiencies and consequences of unreliable and expensive wind and solar are breathtaking, devastating and totally unchecked against reality. Small and medium businesses are struggling to keep the doors open in the face of frightening electricity bills causing supply chain inflation. Large corporations with dominant market power are able to simply pass on higher energy prices. Small businesses are not. 
Small business employs 4.7 million Australians who are struggling because their employers are struggling. This government has signalled their intention to use unreliable wind and solar to lead an attack on the living standards of everyday Australians, or more accurately, unreliable, unstable, unscientific electricity. Let me break it down for you. It's simply impossible to build the volume of wind and solar and batteries needed to meet the 2030 deadline. Wind and solar constructed so far in Australia operate at just 23 per cent of rated capacity because relying on nature's variability gets you just 23 per cent, not 100 per cent. To meet the Prime Minister's 43 per cent target, for every one megawatt of reliable baseload coal power that's shut down, Australia will need to build 4.3 megawatts of unreliable wind and solar power. For example, replacing the 2,000 megawatt Liddell coal-fired power station will require 8,600 megawatts of wind or solar. Even this will only deliver power reliably if matched with a big battery having a similar capacity. Absurd. To build the volume of unreliable wind and solar and batteries needed by 2030 is simply impossible. So the 2030 carbon dioxide reduction target of 43 per cent is not a target for the construction of unreliable wind and solar electricity generation. We know that's impossible. Rather, it's a sneaky target for reducing electricity usage. In 2010, Australia's electricity consumption was 213 terawatts. It's already fallen in 2021 to 188 terawatts, 11 per cent decrease, despite Australia's population growing from 22 million to 26 million, almost a 24 per cent increase. At 10,071 kilowatt hours per capita, Australia ranks 14th in per capita electricity consumption. Now, it's a legitimate argument to say that Australia should reduce our electricity consumption further only once the rest of the world reduces theirs. Anyway, why should we reduce electricity consumption? High prices are not an unintended or transitional outcome of unreliable energy. High prices are designed to deliberately reduce electricity consumption. That's why Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has already abandoned his campaign promise to cut electricity bills. That was never real. It was hollow tokenism, a deliberate lie. Parliamentarians, corporate leaders and their media mouthpiece in protected ivory towers live in a parallel reality where cost of living price hikes like fuel and electricity are a mild inconvenience, not the bloody difference between eating dinner or, or staying warm that confronts many people in Australia today. Destroying baseload power with reckless abandon is hurting the people who must make the choice between food and warmth. Where's the humanity in that? Where is the care? The fairy tale climate contradictions making electricity production dependent on nature's variable wind and solar is a nightmare. There's no happy ending. Increasing numbers of businesses are failing, jobs are vanishing, families are being torn apart, and communities, especially regional centres, are being destroyed. The Australian Bureau of Statistics data shows that there are currently 24,000 people directly employed in unreliable energy. To contend that these same unreliables will cause an increase in jobs of 600,000 is the lie of the century. It will never happen. Indeed, the reverse will be true, because studies overseas show that for every unreliable wind and solar job, there are 2.2 jobs lost in the real economy. They are facts. One only has to understand the inherent inefficiency of wind and solar and the low energy density to understand and their high consumption of resources and being built. That is basic. Baseload power, though, and jobs go hand in hand. The Prime Minister and the Labor Party, after nine years in opposition, have admitted they have no idea how to create jobs for everyday Australians. 
Instead, the Prime Minister will host a stage-managed talk fest on job creation. Why? Where's his plan we heard so much about before the election? The Albanese plan is revealed to be a plan to ask other pl people what the plan should be. One nation, though, does know how to create jobs. Get back to basics. Today, the biggest cost in manufacturing is electricity. Not the cost of employing workers, not the labour cost. High energy prices have destroyed jobs and with that gutted workers' power. And what drives, what drives wages? Supply and demand drives wages. Australia has significant reserves of iron ore, bauxite, copper and rare earths. Yet we import our electronics, our white goods, our finished products, made from these same materials. If Prime Minister Anthony Albanese was serious about job creation, he only needs to safeguard our baseload power through coal and nuclear. That will bring down energy prices and supercharge our manufacturing sector. A one-nation government will do that, get back to proven, common sense, basics, fundamentals. Why has the Albanese government agreed to increase immigration when the Prime Minister has admitted to having no idea how to create the jobs for these people? High immigration without addressing jobs, housing and energy sells out workers. It sells them short and creates disadvantaged groups. It's that simple. So let's turn to infrastructure. An ambitious infrastructure program will deliver the jobs growth needed to restore workers' rights and restore secure employment. Real infrastructure, not the green fairy tales that we hear from the government and the previous government. One Nation will advocate for a national rail circuit. Northwest Queensland's copper string 2.0 high voltage power transmission. The Tully Millstream hydro project. Urana Dam. The Bradfield scheme, conditional on the business case, and many more nation building projects. Let's turn to the Reserve Bank. During COVID, the Reserve Bank admitted conjuring up $500 billion using electronic ledger entries called quantitative easing. The Reserve Bank's words electronic journal entries. We now have, as a result, the highest inflation since the 1980s. Quantitative easing is undoubtedly related to the current spike in inflation. It's driving it. Money conjured out of thin air and spent on recurring expenses rather than nation building is inflationary. Both sides of this chamber took the decision to conjure so much money and spread it on economic and spend it on economic sherbet. Now we have the Albanese Labour Party, while in, in opposition, was complicit in this economic catastrophe. So they inherit the consequences of their complicity. But don't point fingers across the chamber on this. Work together. If this parliament gets it wrong, everyday Australians will suffer through inflation or worse, stagflation for decades. And instead of working together to push Klaus Schwab's World Economic Forum plan based on United Nations policies, work together instead for our country. Klaus Schwab's life by subscription, quote, is really serfdom, it's slavery. Billionaire globalist corporations will own everything, homes, factories, farms, cars, furniture, and everyday citizens will rent what they need, if their social credit score allows. The plan of the Great Reset is that you will die with nothing. To pull off this evil plan, Klaus Schwab's World Economic Forum will need to take more than just material possessions from Australians. Senators in this very chamber today who support the Great Reset threaten our privacy, freedom and dignity. Yes, they're in this Senate chamber. One Nation vehemently opposes the Great Reset the Digital Identity Bill, theft of agricultural land use, forcing farmers off their land, and all of the Great Reset. One Nation has a comprehensive plan to bring our beautiful country back to sustainable prosperity. And in the months ahead, we will be rolling that plan out. Instead of Lib Lab pushing Klaus Schwab's Great Reset with the tagline, you will own nothing and be happy, One Nation advocates the Great Resist. 
We stand for a world where individuals and communities have primacy over predatory globalist billionaires and their quizzling bureaucrats, politicians and mouthpiece media. One Nation accepts the challenge to provide a better future for everyday Australians. We have one flag, we are one community and we are one nation. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to address the address and reply motion in response to the Government General's speech about our plans as a Labor government and our plans to deliver on the responsibility entrusted to us by Australia's people. It's been a very long nine years of dangerous coalition leadership, but thankfully we're past that now. Because the Australian people shouted for change, and they shouted loudest in Western Australia. They demanded that their parliament be a more progressive, more representative and kinder place. And our government does not take this responsibility lightly. As the Governor-General outlined so well last night, we have a lot on our agenda. Importantly, as he said, we have a renewed ambition as a nation to reconcile with our past, to tell the truth about our history and place First Nations voices at the heart of our democratic processes. And you can feel the nation changing for the better day by day as we really come to grips with who we want to be as a nation. I was chatting with my son yesterday, who's seven and who had the privilege of um, coming to the opening of parliament. And we were enjoying the welcome to country. And he said with great pride, we do this every day at my school. So you can see we've come a long way from the omnipresent institutional racism of the past and a long way towards a national identity where the symbolic things we do culturally create a new sense of nationalism and pride that puts First Nations culture uh, at its heart in a way that makes us feel like we all belong. But we still have so many truths to hear and to tell about the history of genocide and dispossession of Australia's First Nations people. We need a voice to this parliament and a treaty to progress us as a nation towards justice and to reconcile our history as a people. I'm excited by this work and I'm keen to get to work using my knowledge of our parliamentary systems to work with others to make a voice as effective as possible. Speaking of a voice, one of the first pieces of business this new government will, will, uh, will be to abolish the coalition's cruel, cashless welfare card. I've travelled to Kimberley and Western Australia where the cashless debit card was unfairly forced on people. I heard their opposition loud and clear, opposition that the last government refused to listen to. It was unjust, racially discriminatory, whether intentionally or otherwise. There's something so deeply wrong when private for-profit companies control people's welfare and income support payments. Uh, and that is something indeed we'll have to look at in the context of the role of the companies in Workforce Australia that have those contracts too. We've seen millions of dollars go to companies while those on payments lived in poverty. If the same money, the very same money, had gone into services or into the pockets of card recipients, those people would have been tens of thousands of dollars better off over the time of this program. It was nearly impossible to get off the card. It wouldn't matter how well you were doing. And I can certainly say that the promised services to support people struggling with addiction never eventuated. It's also evidenced uh, in the fact that the card has not been shown in any meaningful study to have prevented alcohol or other drug abuse. They weren't put on the card because they had been assessed uh, as it, uh, having an important role to support them. 
They were put on the card simply because of where they lived. And the communities that were put on the card are where a majority of First Nations population live. So make no mistake, this can only be seen as racially motivated. I've spoken with people who've had to carefully plan out how and when they were going to the store and budget for the insane price of fuel that would, it would cost them to get to that store, which could be hundreds of kilometres away, to get to a store that would even accept the CDC card to get basic food essentials. He preached every principle of good policy, including evidence, and most importantly, that important principle of nothing about us without us. First Nations people were not included in uh, these policy decisions. They told us that this card would not help, and indeed it did not. I've got great confidence that a voice to parliament, we can stop this parliament from being racially blinkered in the future, or at the very least, will be called out loud and clearly by a First Nations voice before it happens. I can already see the difference uh, over the last few years that elected First Nations people have made on this issue and how important it is to have a critical mass of First Nations representatives who have seats in both chambers. We can already see what an incredible difference it makes to how uh, these policy issues are debated and changed. And indeed, they have been critically important in the leadership uh, to bring the Labor Party to this decision to abolish the card. I'm extremely excited that we're doubling the number of Indigenous Rangers. I've seen the incredible success of this program, addressing what have often been devastating impacts of co colonisation on Australia's land masses. Feral cats, rabbits, invasive species, land clearing and so much more. As a nation, we have to continue to value both economically and culturally the incredible work of Indigenous communities in caring for country. This is such a significant asset to Australian culture and identity and that their relationship to country is an asset to us all. It brings me to talk now about climate change. The Australian public has called for action on climate change after a decade of denial and delay, not to mention all the disruption uh, that they caused uh, in uh, Labor's time of government preceding that. Labor will give workers, their unions, industry, energy investors and the wider community certainty that we're headed in the right direction and we're looking to do it quickly and swiftly. An emissions reduction target of 43 per cent before 2030, this puts Australia back on track for net zero before 2050. We must do this. This certainty is critical to ensuring that Australia is positioned to re revive Australian manufacturing and to turn our country into a renewable energy superpower that we know it can be. Importantly, though, we know this means doing the hard work of organising in local communities that are already at the coalface, literally, of this change. You can see this in my home state of WA, uh, where we are working towards not only building our, nationals, uh, sorry, our nation's capacity as a renewable energy technology manufacturer, but also moving along the path of a just transition for workers and their communities. A future that moves towards secure jobs in our economy. The southwest Australian town of Collie is a long, very long, long way away from Canberra. But if you want to see what climate change action looks like, action that puts workers and their communities first, you would go to Collie, you would look to Collie. Since 2019, this small coal mining town has been 
undergoing a major economic shift. It has two coal mines and three coal-powered fire stations. For a hundred years, Collies miners, plant operators, sparkies and fitters have provided energy to Western Australians and powered our economy. Think of all those beautiful West Australian stories made and told under the lights powered by Collie coal workers. But Collie knows, and we know, that the world is changing that our climate is changing in dangerous ways because of fossil fuels, and coal cannot power our future. A few weeks ago, the state government announced that all publicly owned coal-fired power stations in the state would be shut before 2030. And this is because of the work done by unions, the Collie community and the WA. Labor Party. Since 2019, the Australian Manufacturing Workers Union, other unions, community groups and the state government have met every six weeks. They have met every six weeks as the Collie Just Transition Working Group. They have developed and implemented a worker and community-led strategy that is transitioning Collie from an economy built around and for coal to something more diverse and economically sustainable. We are, for example, under state labour, moving bushfire operations uh, to Collie. A zero carbon magnesium plant is planned. Other processing operations are being considered for manufacturing of renewable technologies. So a key part of the state's future uh, is going to be made in Collie. It's been, ma it's been made from Collie in the past and it will continue to be in the future. So if you want to know what a just transition looks like, how real action on climate change is achieved and what a Labor government can do, go and see the work that's being done there. It's not without its difficulty or without its debate and conflict. But we are making incredible progress, and we are doing hand in hand, doing that hand in hand uh, with the local community. We also know as a government that reducing transport emissions will be pivotal to making our cities and towns cleaner and healthier places to live. Electric cars need to be more affordable and more available to families and businesses that want them. They're cheaper to run, they're better for the environment, they've got fewer moving parts, and so they actually have less wear and tear and need to be serviced less, less often. But the issue remains that they are far outside the price range for uh, regular Australians. It's why our government has already moved this week to remove the fringe, fringe benefits tax from electric cars and to make them affordable to working people across the country. It, <coughs> this means uh, to make electric cars work for Australians, it also means covering our big distances. Unlike the opposition, who's historically negated the feasibility of charging stations and of electric cars. But this government, our Labor government, is committed to building a network of charging stations across the Kimberley in WA. There are already stations spanning from Broome to Kalinara, which is over 1,000 kilometres. So we can support Australians to a new, cheaper and cleaner transport system with this work. I'd like to end now by mentioning how proud and honoured I am to welcome my new West Australian colleagues to this exciting place, uh, including in the lower house, Tanya Lawrence in Hasluck, Tracy Roberts in Pearce, Sam Lim in Tangney, Zanita Mascarenas in Swan, who I'd like to congratulate now on her incredible and rousing first speech last night. I also very sincerely and deeply want to welcome and congratulate uh, Senator Fatima Payman on her election to the Senate. 
It's such an honour to have you here, to have you move the address and reply, and I'm so excited for all the work we'll now get to do together, making Australia a better place. Senator Davey. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I found the Governor-General's speech yesterday uh, quite enlightening at outlining the new government's agenda. Um, despite, uh, in the lead-up to the election, the government claiming that they will govern for all Australians, regardless of where they are and where they live, um, there is concern that uh, there are big cuts coming to a lot of infrastructure investments, particularly in regional areas. Um, including, you know, we've now read reports about the abolition of the modern manufacturing or the, or the uh, pause on the modern ma manufacturing investments that our government put in place, particularly looking at clean energy and food security uh, issues, which um, the government has said were priorities. As a nation facing many challenges, cutting infrastructure funding to key regional areas should not be an option. Cost of living is another major issue facing our communities, and it's one that is increasingly being highlighted by the public, recognised by the Labor Party in the lead-up to the election with a promise to cut power bills by $275 a year. Yet there was not a mention of that figure in the Governor-General's speech. Within two months of getting into government, that promise seems to have been forgotten. It's no wonder that recent polling by uh, Essential Polling, done for The Guardian, which is not necessarily a right-leaning uh, publication, uh, that polling found just one quarter of voters think Labor is actually handling the surging cost of living pressures. The poll of over 1,000 respondents indicates that a majority of Australians believe, even in an era of deregulation, governments can exert influence over a range of economic factors, including debt, unemployment rates, inflation, fuel prices, workforce supply and interest rates. So, at the moment, while the government likes to pretend it's hit the ground running, much of its election commitment are low on details and how it plans to implement the campaign promises are thin on the ground. And what we heard yesterday in the Governor-General's speech was that real action is actually being supplemented by a plethora of new reviews, strategies, task forces, summits, white papers, plans to have plans, a policy to have a cultural policy, committees, councils, changes to the machinery of government and inquiries announced to give the impression of action. But what I see is more bureaucracy, more red tape and more talk. Last time Labor was in government, they failed to plan for emergencies. They then introduced a one-off tax levy to help fund and pay for flood damage. This contrasts with the coalition's action in government. We established the nearly $5 billion emergency response fund. We've established systems to put in place disaster recovery payments and disaster allowance payments within days of a disaster. With the state governments, we've put in place systems around the disaster recovery funding arrangements which the government very swiftly implemented following the recent floods in Western Sydney. But had it not been for the coalition government's actions and the coalition's govern government's preparedness, that wouldn't have been able to have been um, rolled out as swiftly as, and efficiently as it was. Our communities have every right to be concerned about Labor's plans for helping during a crisis. After nine years in opposition and five years of drought, fires, floods and pandemic, the best that they can come up with for their emergency management policy is to rebadge 
our emergency response fund into the disaster ready fund. No details about any other changes with it. They're also going to uh, restructure the agencies. They um, started by sacking the National Resilience and Recovery, Recovery Agency Coordinator General, uh, the Honourable Shane Stone ACQC, and they're now merging this agency's functions with those of Emergency Management Australia. And they've got a new acronym to go with it the NEMRRA, or the National Emergency Management Resilience and Recovery Agency. Uh, but not just content with sacking the independent arm's length commissioner, they've now announced a new role for one of their own, appointing Senator Tony Sheldon as special envoy for disaster recovery. But we don't yet know what the special envoy will do what his responsibilities will be, what his accountabilities will be and, importantly, how much extra resources he gets in terms of staff and salary. Because, as a public servant, the NRRA commissioner and, before him, the Coordinator General for Drought, they were accountable to the Senate estimates processes. We don't know yet who Senator Sheldon will be accountable to. And as far as the people on the ground are concerned, they're more concerned about action than seeing another politician getting a title. The people of Lismore are still waiting to see what support there will be for commercial landlords, what the industry-specific support packages will look like. Much was made of this in the lead-up to the election, but the detail post has been scanned. We acknowledge there's a time and a place for envoys, but we also acknowledge that when they're used, there needs to be clear terms of reference and proper accountability. We need to understand how a politician in this instance will be better than an independent commissioner. And while Labor can outdo themselves when it comes to long-winded agency titles and departmental names, they also fail when it comes to delivering services to our communities on the ground. Since Labor formed governments, we are seeing more concern about where bureaucratic offices will be than helping the Australians most in need. We need to get back in business. Another aspect that I found very concerning in the Governor-General's speech was the statement that, and I quote, the government will also deliver on water commitments under the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, including 450 gigalitres for South Australia. Since when has the Basin Plan been purely about one state? The entire point of the Basin Plan was to get away from the interjurisdictional fights. The Basin Plan was about the entire Murray-Darling Basin. None of the targets in the Basin Plan were for a specific state, not even the 450 gigalitres, which was for the Basin. If you let me continue, Senator McAllister, I will get to the point. As former John How uh, Prime Minister John Howard said on Australia Day in 2007, when he announced the creation of the Water Act, which spawned the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, he said, rivers do not recognise lines on a map that we call state borders. Yet, in the Governor-General's speech, it showed that Labor is again prepared to turn state against state and play politics with one of the most contentious reforms this country has ever undertaken. On 29 June 2012, the Murray-Darling Basin Ministerial Council, at the instigation of the South Australian government, requested the MDBA model and assess the benefits of further water recovery and what uh, extra water for the environment would do if key constraints were relaxed. The authorities' subsequent report, released in October 2012, showed 
that the combination of relaxed constraints and an additional average of about 400 gigalitres of water could increase environmental benefits, with many more flow indicators being met for the River Murray. And it could provide capacity to water mid to high level parts of the floodplain in the Lower Murray. However, the same report also made it clear that undertaking detailed assessments and analysis to identify whether any of the constraints tested in the study could actually be relaxed were not within the scope of the report. And the modelling also did not include explicit environmental demands for the Lower Darling River and the Anna Branch. So in plain English, this meant that the MDBA and at the time the former Labor government had a model, but I had no idea whether in the real world, outside of the model world, constraints identified could be relaxed. And worse, the model made no allowance for the Lower Darling environmental needs. So unless we acknowledge that the Lower Darling has environmental needs, we will continue to see fish kills. As it was, the constraint strategy if it was delivered, would cut the Darling Anna branch and two key wetland lakes from the Lower Darling River to try to get higher flows from Menindee Lakes into the Murray River for South Australia. If we don't want fish kills, if we don't want the Lower Darling to become the drying of the Lower Darling to become a regular occurrence, <coughs> then we need to accept the cries of the communities and now the New South Wales government that the Menindee Lakes water saving project needs to be completely rescoped uh, to make sure that we can look after the environment of the Lower Darling and the environment of the Anna Branch and also look after the communities. For too long we've ignored what the communities are telling us, particularly when it comes to making sure there is no social and economic downside. The Gillard government itself, in announcing the 450 gigalitres of environmental water, said it would be obtained through projects to ensure there is no social and economic downside for communities. But report after report since then has shown Water recovery has already had a negative impact. The state governments acknowledge this, and that's why in December 2018 the Ministerial Council agreed to a set of socio-economic assessment criteria to ensure the neutrality of efficiency measures projects proposed as part of the 450 gigalitres. That criteria is still on the department's website, and it should be noted it is still very much uh, the Victorian Labor government and the New South Wales coalition government's intent to maintain that criteria. I also want to note that uh, the 450 gigalitres was to be um, recovered proportionately across states. That means there is about 56 gigalitres to be recovered from South Australia if this target is going to be pursued. There is nothing stopping the South Australian government bringing forward projects to be approved and pursued under that project. I also want to note that contrary to the negative picture painted by the new Water Minister about supposedly failing Murray-Darling Basin Plan, recent reporting from the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder and the Department of Climate Change, Energy, the Environment and Water, that's another long name, native fish are fighting back. We have recovered over 4 million megalitres of water entitlements since 2004 under various water reforms, and they are working. Our environment water managers have learnt since that time how better to utilise infrastructure available and how to target their environmental water management. So this year, in a year with full allocations, farmers growing crops, gangbusters, we have birds breeding, fish flourishing and wetlands being watered. That 
is what a good Murray-Darling Basin plan can lead to. On that note, I thank the Senate for their time. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Deputy President. Firstly, congratulations on your appointment yesterday to Deputy, Sorry, to Pre uh, Deputy President of the Senate. Um, we're all human beings in this place, uh, Deputy President, as hard as it might be for some of the general public to believe that. Uh, we are, and uh, I just wanted to make a personal reflection to begin with and just say um, uh, just how positive and optimistic and happy I am to be coming back to the Senate and getting on with the job. And I know um, many others in the chamber are, are feeling the same way. Um, and, and so are the Australian people. So are the Australian people. Now, there's a lot of uh, messages we could take away from, from this election and the result of the election and the change of government. But I think the most important one is that Australians have voted for doing politics differently in this country. They have voted for a more caring, uh, a more considered, uh, a more collaborative and constructive parliament. Uh, I've got that everywhere I've gone. And believe it or not, I've gone a, a lot of places in the last month. Uh, I've driven 8,000 kilometres and seen a lot of the country and talked to lots of people. Uh, and I've even had some people say to me they really feel like they're living in a different country right now. Uh, and I share that enthusiasm for change and for achieving great things in this 47th parliament. Um, they've also voted for a more representative parliament. Now, in the 2019 election, we saw nearly a quarter of Australians vote for third voices in this place, for the Greens, for independents, for other minor parties. That's jumped to nearly a third of Australians now, following the last term of parliament. And it will continue to grow. Mark my words, it will continue to grow in this parliament if this government and this Senate, this parliament, doesn't work constructively on facing the great challenges of our time, like tackling climate change and tackling the inequality crisis that we all know exists and urgently needs our attention. It will continue to grow. And also, I'm happy to put on record today that I do believe that we are witnessing the continued decline and destruction of the two-party system in this country. Uh, I have no doubt that within two or three parliaments' time, uh, I won't be around in two or three parliaments' time, I can assure you of that, uh, perhaps some will be in this chamber, uh, we will see a much more representative parliament as more young people get to the polling booths and demand that the, we, as decision makers in this place, listen to them about their concerns uh, on their future. So, to juxtapose those two things about people wanting to see a more collaborative approach to politics, a more constructive approach, a kinder parliament, let me say this. It's not kind of this parliament to delay further climate action. It's not kind of this parliament or this government to approve new fossil fuel projects that are only going to continue to pour petrol on the fire of climate change. It's not kind to ignore the public housing crisis in this country or the millions of Australians who need to get mental health and full dental care into Medicare. If we want to be a kinder parliament and a more collaborative parliament and more representative parliament, then we need to move away from the state capture of politics that we've seen in recent decades. And we need to represent the people uh, that voted for us. Um, we'll have debate in this chamber very soon uh, on a significant piece of legislation, uh, the government's uh, climate, climate bill, let's just call it that. I haven't seen the full title of it yet. Um, and there'll be a lot more time to talk about uh, what is an, an adequate target for climate action uh, and a, a blueprint a transition to what real climate action looks like. And I look forward to contributing to that debate, as I know many of my colleagues do, uh, after uh, campaigning so hard to get elected to this place. And I congratulate uh, all my new colleagues uh, to this uh, chamber and to the other place. But also those of us who have been here for the last nine years, during the swamp years and the desert years, 
those who have come in here every day and fought for climate action, fought for representation. Um, there's nothing kind about the pressures that climate change is adding to the cost of living in this country. Um, have no doubt the climate crisis that we are in that will only get worse if we don't act. The climate crisis is a cost of living crisis. Um, inaction on climate change is going to continue to build the cost of living crisis in this country. Um, last night on the TV, I saw a, a new Prime Minister, and congratulations to um, Mr Anthony Albanese on his, his election as Prime Minister. Uh, he may not remember it, but I was on a panel with him three years ago at Splendour in the Grass, uh, and I did say to him, um, I hope you're our new Prime Minister uh, uh, in three years' time, Albo, but you need to grow a spine on tackling Adani and stopping new coal and gas projects in this country. Um, and he's there, and, and I'm glad about that. Um, and the next bit concerns me, because last night on TV he talked about, to quote unquote, the devastating economic impacts uh, of stopping or saying no to uh, new coal and gas projects. The economic impacts of continuing to ramp up fossil fuel production, somehow uh, that was going to cause economic pain. What about the pain that's caused by burning more fossil fuels and exporting more fossil fuels, adding to global warming? Um, Ironically, the comments by the Prime Minister last night were follow up, followed up this morning by a new report from CSIRO that they've been working on for many years that shows that the cost of climate inaction, the cost of inaction, will top $39 billion annually, annually by 2050, uh, complete with chronic hits to Australia's food supply chain. Uh, that devastates the economy. That qualifies as a devastating economic impact. Globally, it's estimated that 75 billion tonnes of fertile soil and 12 million hectares of productive farmland capable of producing food for the world, 20 million tonnes of grain, is lost to desertification and land degradation every year from climate impacts. So farmers are going to do it tougher. We know droughts and floods are part of the history of this country, but we know the science tells us that they're getting worse. And I think every farmer understands that they are custodians uh, of their land and they need to live off that land and they do a great job feeding us. They know what climate change is and they understand the costs of climate change and the costs of inaction. Australian farms it's estimated are losing, and I asked questions about this at estimates uh, earlier in the year, on average $30,000 per year due to the impacts of climate change. How's that for a cost of living crisis if you're a farmer? How do you feel if you're a farmer who's lost their third crop in 18 months in the northern rivers of New South Wales thanks to flooding? Why do you think uh, lettuce in this country uh, we're, we're selling for around $11. Why do you think avocado prices have gone up? How's that for a cost of living crisis? What about insurance premiums that have been turbocharged by climate impacts? By the way, that's if you're lucky enough to be insured in some parts of this country now. Homes and contents insurance is costing about 1.8 times more than it is in the south of Australia if you live in northern Australia. As of 2020, because of the off-the-charts weather events that we have witnessed uh, in this country, the climate crisis is a cost-of-living crisis. And the sooner we understand that, the better off we will be. The sooner we act on that, the better off this nation and its people will be. Now, I'd like to point out that this has all happened, the science tells us, on around one degree of warming on pre-industrial levels, on one degree of warming. Some say 1.1 degree of warming. The target we're about to vote on in the climate legislation is a 43 per cent reduction of 2030 emissions 
based on 2005 levels. Now, the science tells us that will lead, or the ambition embedded in that will lead to a two degree warming. If the rest of the world complies, this planet will warm by two degrees. So that is a 100 per cent increase on what we've already seen in our system. If you want to talk about three, back to, three bleachings of the Great Barrier Reef in five years, including in an a La Nina year, the loss of Tasmania's giant kelp forests and the devastating impacts that's had on our commercial fisheries, the most productive and valuable fishery in the world, for example, our abalone fishery, the loss of seagrasses, droughts, hundreds and thousands of hectares of land burnt from fires, unprecedented fires in just about every state of this country, floods. That's all happened on one degree of warming. Imagine a doubling of that. Now, I'm happy to say here on record that the green 75 per cent emissions reduction target on 2030 levels that we took to the election puts us in, t uh, in line with the Paris Agreement. That's still a 1.5 degree warming, still a 50 per cent increase on what we're seeing in the system now. That's, a, that's achievable. That's a, pragmatic, that's a pragmatic stance by the Greens. We know we need to get it back to 350 parts per million to have any chance of reversing the kind of climate impacts we've seen, even for 50 or 100 years' time. So I just wanted to put on record my personal view that even a 75 per cent emissions reduction is still potentially catastrophic for this country and for the planet. But it's achievable if we all work together. 43 per cent, you know what that is? That is surrender. 43 per cent is surrender. And as far as net zero by 2050, so when we get to 2050, none of us will be here, by the way, in 2050. Hopefully we'll all still be alive. But I can tell you what, younger generations like the, the, the young people we saw out on Parliament lawns, they'll be here and they'll be alive and they'll be inheriting it. What's the point of having net zero emissions by 2050 if the barrier reef as we've known it is dead, if it's gone, if our world is irrevocably changed? What's the point when we can act now and save those volumes of carbon emissions going into the atmosphere and act on it immediately, do something meaningful. We can all do it. And I just wanted to finish by uh, uh, making a few personal uh, thanks, because it, um, it would be wrong for me not to uh, thank today some of the people that, uh, in my own election in Tasmania uh, as, a Senate, uh, as a Senate candidate. Uh, we had a great result in Tassie. I think Tasmanians, uh, as they did for Senator McKim in 2019, the Greens saw a big swing to us in Tasmania. Uh, by the way, as we did, as we did around the country, um, uh, we, uh, the Greens in Tassie achieved uh, the highest Senate vote across the country, nearly 15.5 per cent, so over a quota. Um, and I'd like to thank, uh, in particular, the candidates. Well, I'd like to thank all the people that voted for the Greens, all the thousands of supporters and volunteers who are out there on polling booths who did all this amazing work because they cared about acting on climate change. They cared about tackling the inequality crisis. I'd particularly like to thank my two Senate candidates, uh, Vanessa Blyer, uh, who's based in Launceston, and Tabitha Badger, who's down in the south. Uh, they worked tirelessly to help me and support me uh, in my Senate campaign. I'd like to also thank Cecily Russell, uh, our candidate in Bass, uh, Liz Johnson, our candidate in Lyons. Um, I'd like to thank um, Jay Darko, our candidate in Franklin, Janet Shelley, uh, our candidate in uh, Clark, and Darren Briggs, uh, Dr. Darren Briggs, uh, our candidate uh, in Braddon. Uh, in particular, there was lots of great people within the party, but a special thanks should go also to Deb Rees, who texted me yesterday and told me how happy she was to see me swearing in uh, as a Senate again, our party manager. Thanks for everything you've done, Deb. We, we absolutely couldn't have done it without you. Uh, and of course, uh, the other party uh, organisers, uh, Danny Carney, who I first started campaigning with back in 2004 when he was a 17 year old student at university, um, Bridget Ferrier, uh, Steve Wright, um, Nina Hamasake, and uh, Ebony Campbell. Uh, there were many, many other people that contributed uh, in Tasmania uh, and right, indeed right around the country. Um, I wouldn't be standing here today without you. Uh, and uh, look, I, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for backing us in. Uh, and I pledge to you, as I'm sure all my uh, fellow party room uh, colleagues will also pledge, we'll do everything we can 
everything we can in this parliament, as we have done uh, since the Greens were first elected into this place, to fight for climate action, to fight to tackle the inequality crisis and to fight for your future. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. And I take this opportunity to congratulate you on election to the position of Deputy President. I rise today to respond to the Governor-General, His Excellency General the Hon. David Hurley's address, and I acknowledge this government's commitment to improving the lives of First Nations peoples and, indeed, all Australians. It is incredibly important to me, as the Assistant Minister for Indigenous Australians and Indigenous Health. It is also important to me, as a Yanua Garo woman who grew up in the Gulf country of the Northern Territory, I'm honoured and humbled to be again elected to represent all people of the Northern Territory and Christmas and Cocos Keeling Islands. And indeed, it is an honour to stand here for a third time in the Senate uh, for a third term to represent all Australians. It's important to recognise our government will be working to the betterment of all Australians, Mr Deputy President, in these two important portfolios that I hold. Our nation cannot move forward if our First Peoples cannot, or anyone else, for that matter, is also left behind. His Excellency reminded us and reminded the parliament that our new government has pledged to govern for all Australians, whoever they are, wherever they live and whoever they voted for. I've travelled thousands of kilometres in the lead-up to the federal election campaign but I continually travel thousands of kilometres because that's just what we do in the Northern Territory, because we need to understand what the views and the feelings are of people on the ground, whether they live in uh, major towns and cities or whether they live in remote and regional areas of Australia or the homelands. There's certainly a lot of sad stories, Mr Deputy President, that come out of our communities. A child born in a remote community today already has a lot of the odds stacked up against them, and they will have a lower life expectancy, higher burden of disease and fewer opportunities for jobs and a good education. It's something I carry very deeply, uh, not only as the Assistant Minister with these portfolio responsibilities, but also as a woman in Australia who wants to see something better for our fellow Australians. And this is the real challenge here. We have sat in opposition for nine years. We are now in government. And the real challenge here is how we can turn this around and how do we turn this around. All the policies that we've taken to the Australian people, we do want to bring to the Senate and bring to the lower house uh, to push through in legislation and to debate and discuss with fellow senators and fellow members. But we are sincere in wanting to see those policies delivered. Labor will work every day to close the gap that still exists between First Nations and non-Indigenous Australians across a range of life outcomes. We will start with investments that include improving housing in remote communities and homelands. That is a message that has been consistent throughout uh, the last decade, the need to be able to revitalise our homelands and provide opportunities uh, for families to be able to live on country, to be able to care for country, work on country and preserve and protect what has been valued in their system. This weekend we head to Gama, to the Gama Festival, to Yolngu country, and again we will hear that consistent message of what about our homelands, what about our ability to grow and raise our children and our families in environments that we believe are safe for our families. This is what we want to do with working with First Nations people and offer those opportunities and options. Not everyone will want to live on a homeland, but what about those that do? And this is what our government want to pursue in providing these opportunities. We're also looking at training 500 new First Nations health workers, 500, and working to eradicate rheumatic heart disease and other diseases of poverty. I'm incredibly passionate about these areas in terms of health, 
For way too long across our country, we travel across and see too many uh, First Nations people on those dialysis machines in renal centres who travel from their communities, from their towns, to go into hospitals and live there three days a week on dialysis. Now, I know this is not a, uh, a disease that impacts First Nations people, but I recognise that with my role as Assistant Minister for Health, I will have to focus on that, and I will do that. Better lives, though, Mr Deputy President, start with better housing. Thousands of First Nations people live in overcrowded and run-down housing with major impacts on health, economic and social outcomes. This issue has been reinforced to me so much across the Northern Territory by those who live this reality every day. It was raised again recently with me during my visit to East Arnhem Land, and we know that we are going to invest $100 million for housing and essential services on those Northern Territory homelands and $200 million from our Housing Australia Future Fund for improvements and upgrades to remote housing across Western Australia, South Australia and Queensland, as well as the NT. All Australians deserve a decent home no matter where they live. Strengthening the First Nations health sector is something I am absolutely passionate about. Aboriginal health services work tirelessly to keep their community start, communities safe, but many do this with limited equipment, facilities and staff. And we all know the impact that COVID has had and continues to have on staffing across the country in our health sector. We are desperately feeling that shortage in the Aboriginal health sector and Torres Strait Islander health sector. So this is an absolute priority for me to be able to have a look at this and see what we can do to assist uh, those organisations, whether they're the Aboriginal community health organisations or whether they're clinicians and doctors and GPs who need to get out there and our hospitals who require that support in assisting uh, First Nations people uh, to get through this time, but also as part of our parliament's push to close the gap. Our government will invest in long overdue capital upgrades in Aboriginal community controlled health services around the country. We are going to invest in training up to 500 First Nations health workers to create jobs, expand local services and, we hope, to save lives. It gives our health workers an opportunity to provide better, tailored care and a chance for them to live and work on country or elsewhere, should they choose. His Excellency noted at the centre of the government's determination to close the gap is the belief that First Nations people, like every other Australian, should be made to feel that they have some sense of empowerment over their lives. We know that all Australians deserve the opportunity to have a job, to make a living and feel a strong sense of purpose. But it's not always an easy feat, Mr Deputy President, to find a job in the bush and certainly across remote communities. I'm always reminded of the desire for people to find meaningful work and to have dignity in work, to have satisfaction, to have dreams and ambition of what they would like to see on their country, in their communities, with their families. We are working to abolish the punitive community development program because it just does not work. And I'm just acknowledging in the gallery very strong voices in terms of a voice to parliament. And I acknowledge Thomas Mayer and Vicky and the team who are here in the parliament this week to ensure that we follow through on our commitment to a voice to parliament. But part of that empowerment, and I will get to the voice, I've still got five more minutes, uh, Senator Ciccone, um, which is good. What I'd firstly like to say is that with the Community Deve Development Program, where we want to go with this is to have a new program that pays real wages 
to ensure people have access to superannuation, to other leave and other conditions, and give more control to communities to determine local projects that support economic development. It will be similar to the old Community Development Employment Program, but I'd like to see what else we can do in that space. A very long time ago, I was actually on the CDEP when I was uh, living in community in Borrolula, and I know that program worked. We were able to establish uh, the first radio station in Borrolula while I was on the Community Development Employment Program. So I've seen what kind of uh, federal policies can work on the ground, and the current CDP program does not do that. So I am looking forward to be able to get into that uh, with Minister Linda Burney and with Special Envoy Pat Dodson to see what we can do about jobs. We are so conscious that our country is screaming for workers and we want to have a look at this program where 40,000 Australians are on this program and no nothing to show for it, really. You know, there is very little to show for it. So we need to have a look at what we can do uh, to, to re-engage, firstly, people back into the workforce and those that do want to have that dignity and work and a future and some ambition for themselves and their families to see what we can do through that. I'm excited about that. I believe we can do it. I think with the Prime Minister's Job Summit in September, uh, there will be an incredibly good opportunity there to see that we can think outside the square, do things differently, dynamically, and something that gives uh, our country as a whole some more hope about what is possible and what we can do and achieve together. One of the other areas that I do have responsibility for as uh, Assistant Minister to the Indigenous Affairs Minister is the food security area and the social and emotional well-being and redress for stolen generation survivors. Uh, th these are also critical areas. At the moment, we're seeing across the country uh, the impact of high food prices for all Australians. Uh, you know, a box of lettuce we're seeing uh, has gone up exponentially. We're seeing fresh fruit and veggies. Uh, so just imagine if we're seeing the rise of those uh, food prices in our capital cities. Just for a moment, have a think of the extra challenges that are being faced. Uh, in regional and remote Australia. Again, this is where our country will have to really dig in and link arms and say this is an absolute uh, essential criteria that all Australians, wherever they live, we are doing what we can to ensure uh, food security. And that will be my responsibility and is my responsibility uh, in terms of uh, First Nations people. In terms of the uh, Stolen generation survivors. Uh, most survivors from the Northern Territory and also Jarvis Bay and areas of the ACT will be coming under this uh, redress scheme. It's a journey that I've followed very closely for a very long time, both on a personal level but also as a, as a parliamentarian and recognised uh, the court cases that have occurred from as far back as uh, in the late 1990s, 2000, where people have fought for justice in the removal of themselves or their parents uh, as children and an, on, under an Australian policy that, uh, thankfully, uh, Prime Minister Kevin Rudd acknowledged with the apology in 2008. But there is still unfinished business there, and I will be working very closely uh, with those survivors and their families to ensure that they receive the appropriate responses that they need to hear and see. And as I said at the outset, this weekend we'll be at Gama, uh, working with the Yolngu people, but with all those who attend. Uh, our government and First Nations caucus is very, very uh, clear on our position of a voice to parliament, and we will work wholeheartedly and inclusively uh, with all parliamentarians and indeed all Australians so that there can be overwhelming support 
in a referendum that we wish to take to the Australian people in this term of, of the parliament, asking for a voice to the parliament for First Nations people. Senator Macdonald. Mr Deputy Speaker, I rise to speak about a topic which is near and dear to the heart of every representative of particularly Northern Australia, members and senators alike. It is on this topic that we rise above the petty politics of uh, uh, party politics and we talk about the future opportunity of this nation. I'm delighted to speak after Senator McCarthy, who is one of those other Northern Australia representatives. And many of the topics she touched on, uh, I think, are critical to us investing in the future of our country. So, after nine years in opposition, on the very first day of parliament, one of the first actions of this new government was to scrap the Northern Australia agenda. They scrapped the Northern Australia Committee, the only committee in this parliament dedicated to exploring the very important cross-portfolio uh, and cross-jurisdiction issues to develop 51 per cent of our land mass. 1.3 million people live in Northern Australia, 16 per cent of those Indigenous, over 200,000 Indigenous people, and we removed the very, very small advantage that Northern Australia had in that place. The wealth that's created from Northern Australia—11 per cent of the nation's GDP, Senator Scar, you'll be impressed to hear from only 3 per cent of the population living in the North. Not only did they ax the Committee on Northern Australia, they axed the Office of Northern Australia. They've melded that into some other part of the department, never to be seen again. They've axed the modern manufacturing initiatives that we are rolling forward. They've frozen the Hell's Gate Dam. It will be death by consultant to that project. They're delivering uncertainty on the future of mining and resources in the north because Northern Australia is being shortchanged short by a short-sighted Labor government. This part of the country has the most opportunity for irrigated agriculture, the critical development for food security both for Australians and for our region. We have the resources, critical minerals and rare earths that allow Australia to take part in the new economy that we've been talking about. And most importantly, Deputy Speaker, the most important thing that they do is that we take advantage and give opportunity to the 1.3 million people speaking in the north uh, living in the north we give opportunity and as senator mccarthy just described meaningful work purposeful work and connection and we can only do that by developing the very part of the country where those people live under the previous government we had developed uh, committed 6.2 billion dollars to the developing the Northern Australia agenda and all 51 measures under the first five years of the 20-year Our North, Our Future white paper on developing the North. I can't go on without acknowledging the work of the member of the other place, Mr Warren Inch, uh, the work that he did on that very bipartisan committee of the Northern Australia Committee as they examined opportunities for the North, for the people, the industries and the resources. We committed $189.6 million to developing Northern Australia. That included 9.3 to pilot the regions of growth. You cannot talk about 51 per cent of the nation without identifying the areas that can best be targeted, that can be divided up and uh, allow us to truly make change to make those investments worthwhile and sticky. $68.5 million for mobiles and digital connectivity. We extended the Northern Australia Infrastructure Fund from $5 billion to $7 billion. And I will be holding this government to account that they do not ax any more of the funding that goes into this critically important part of the country. 
We've developed the priority regional master plans, Mount Isa to Townsville, Beedaloo Basin to Catherine to Darwin, Broome to Kununurra to Darwin, and the next priority region of growth corridor is Cairns to Gladstone. As I went across northern Australia consulting with stakeholders, with the councils, with local community groups, with uh, the RDAs and businesses, it was fascinating the passion and the intention that people had to commit into the north. And yet the first action, day one of this government, to completely abolish the northern Australia agenda. Infrastructure, roads and water. This is a long-term commitment to build roads, to seal roads into northern Australia. Did you know that there are still roads in the north that are not, not just not sealed, that are dirt, but they are cut for five months of the year? That is unacceptable in a part of the country where, if a road goes out for a day, it is a matter of mass inconvenience. And yet that is what northern Australians live with at the same time as delivering 11 per cent of the GDP of the country. We've invested $700 million for 38 projects for beef roads in northern Australia and 31 investment decisions under the NAIF for $3.4 billion in northern infrastructure investments. I could go on with, uh, with the specifics of the projects, but I want to touch on the Outback Way a critical piece of infrastructure that connects Winton to Laverton in Western Australia. Did you know that there is only one sealed road connecting Queensland to the Northern Territory and the Northern Territory to Western Australia? We have been plugging away at that for the last 10 years, and yet yesterday Labor pulled the rug under the from out under the feet of Northern Australians by removing the focus the competition that we need to continue investing in the north, the Savannah Way, which joins up the top end of the country, the Burke Development Road, the Peninsula Development Road, all of these critical pieces of infrastructure. We committed $7.5 billion to the national water grid for northern Australia uh, infrastructure and resource assessment projects. $18.9 million for five Northern Australia water projects through the Water Grid Connections Funding Pathway. What will happen to those now? Uh, last week I was in the, the Bowen region. The tomato crop, most of Australia's tomatoes come from the Bowen region during the winter months. Uh, huge numbers of those tomatoes have been wiped out due to the unseasonable uh, rain events. And so where are we going to grow our crops if not in northern Australia during the winter months? Uh, we had money for the Hell's Gate Dam business case uh, and for the Urana Dam business case and approvals. I've already touched on the, on the Black Spot program and the regional connectivity program, all of these which are now in question. During the, or soon after the election campaign, I, I speculated that we had seen the sun set on the Northern Australia agenda, and I remain completely cons uh, worried that this is the end, the end at an eclipse, Senator Scar. Thank you. I'll take that. We committed $75 million through the CRC for developing Northern Australia. This is thought leadership in the North, into crops, uh, into other projects that are using technology and innovation to do greater food production, to uh, expand the, the uh, cotton development in Western Australia for sugarcane products in, uh, in Queensland. Uh, but uh, most importantly, one of the things I was most proud of was the reappointment of the Indigenous References Group. Now, this group, chaired by Mr Colin Saltmere from Camel Wheel, uh, is a revelation, the sort of practical uh, uh, commitments they have to improving the lot of uh, not just Indigenous Australians but primarily Indigenous Northern Australians with real, purposeful, connected work. This cannot happen if you don't have that kind of prioritisation of agenda and focus. Uh, I'm desperately worried about the one Northern Australia representative on the Infrastructure Australia board. Will that position remain? All that to be scrubbed as some sort of political uh, rhetoric as the, as the Labor government goes through and sacks everybody 
uh, on committees that are in place at the moment. Uh, the Indigenous References Group is a group of uh, two representatives from each of the states and territories in addition to the chair and is talking about really exciting work that I would be devastated not to see that continue. We have had record export earnings from our resources sector. It was, uh, we had smashed all previous records in 2021-2022 to bring in $425 billion in resources. It is those royalties and taxes which grow the Australian economy. It secures our energy, secures our national security. Um, it employs directly around 280,000 people in Australia and, despite COVID, 40,000 new jobs since the start of the pandemic, all of those being paid at double the rate of most average Australian jobs. And this growth trajectory was, continued to, was expected to continue, but of course now we have doubt cast over that by the green tail wagging the Labor dog as we see uh, the agenda being set under this new government. We were committed to securing our gas supply with strategic basins policy, our gas-fired recovery, uh, the Beetaloo strategic basin plan in the Northern Territory, the North Bowen and Galilee basin plan, the Cooper Adavale basin plan, all of these critical resources, not just for energy production, but also for the manufacture of urea, for Ad Blue, critical components for our agriculture and transport industries. Uh, if the thing you have in your hand is not made of steel, it's made in a factory made of steel. And we know that coal is critical in the manufacturing of, of steel. We invested money into carbon capture and storage, modern technology to allow us to achieve our carbon uh, neutral uh, emissions target by 2050. Uh, our critical minerals industry, much of it which is in northern Australia, uh, whether it be the geosciences uh, research plan and uh, an exploration plan, uh, we had in, uh, invested $2 billion into a critical minerals facility. Will this government continue with those works, or will that too be cast under the shadow of a brave new government that talks a lot about rhetoric but forgets the practicality of how it actually makes a difference, of how it actually invests uh, in industry which improves Australians' lives. Whether it be the, the high paid resource salaries, whether it be that, how that spreads across our nation through royalties and taxes, uh, whether it be our world leading agricultural industry that feeds not only Australia but a good part of our regional sector. Uh, Northern Australia is a critical part of ensuring that we secure uh, our food security. We hold much of the phosphate uh, reserves. Potash from Western Australia, these are all minerals that need to be developed for food security to secure agricultural supply chains for Australia and for our near neighbours. With the threat of uh, foot and mouth and lumpy skin disease in Indonesia and Bali, uh, we are looking at a food security problem for those people. Sri Lanka has work, is working its way through uh, 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 a, a catastrophe with the removal of much of the fertilisers in that country. Uh, and Indonesia, uh, they're down to 50 per cent of milk production in East Java. This is our near neighbours who are struggling with food security. They're struggling with disease. Australia and Northern Australia will have to hold our own biosecurity line in that part of the country. And yet what has Labor done? The first action on day one of this parliament to cancel the Northern Australia Committee, to remove the office of Northern Australia. I call out to the government to reinstate those important uh, tools of government, but most importantly, I call out to. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Would you like to speak next? Would you like the call next? Honourable, honourable senators, no. honourable senators, you're not, a, you're not assisting Senator Scar. Ask Senator to train yourself. You have 36 seconds, Senator Macdonald. So it is uh, without the particular focus 
on Northern Australia that we threaten the future prosperity of our country. We threaten the future prosperity of city dwellers who don't have the ability to grow food, to mine for energy and other resources. And without uh, Northern Australia, the resources sector, uh, I, I fear for what our future for ourselves and our young people will look like, and I will be endeavouring to hold uh, this government to account along with my other Northern Australia counterparts. Thank you. Senator Rice, we have 10, 10 seconds. Would you like me to go to Senator's statements? I, thank you. I shall now proceed to Senator's statements. Senator Billick. Thank you. And um, can I just quickly congratulate you on becoming the Deputy President also? Thank you. I rise today to speak about a very dear friend of mine, Deborah Hocking, who passed away recently from throat cancer. Now, Deb is not a household name, but she certainly deserves to be for all that she achieved in life and the challenge she, she overcame to get there. And I think this is the speech over 14 years that I've edited the most. I started off with an hour's worth of speech about Deb, with funny stories, with things to tell about her. And you'll understand as I get into my speech why I did that. But I've got limited time. I know I'm going to miss something out. But 50 years of friendship um, is really hard to get into 10 minutes, let alone the amazing um, achievements Deb managed to achieve. And Deb was never one to trumpet her own successes or take credit for her work. She was quiet, she was a humble achiever, but she did have, and this is probably why we were such good friends, a very colourful vocabulary. Deb believed in forgiveness, but not forgetting, and it was critical to a change in Deb's life and what she went on to do. We've all heard of the stolen generation. And it's to this country's great shame that Aboriginal children were removed from their families as late as the 1960s. Deb was a member of the Stolen Generation, removed from her family at the age of 18 months in 1961. Growing up, she faced incredible adversity. At primary school, she was bullied and referred to as the gutter child, even though she was actually fair-skinned. At home, she was discriminated against and physically and sexually abused by members of her foster family. But at least when she got to high school, which is where I met Deb, she established some valuable lifelong friendships. But it wasn't until we were adults that Deb actually um, opened up to us about her, her life, her former life, and the issues she had gone through. But she did tell us there's a group of us, there's about um, 10 of us that have kept in contact for over 40 years. And she did tell us that school was her safe place. She felt safe at school. And I'm really honoured to have been part of the group that helped Deb to feel, st to feel safe. There is a couple of funny stories I'll tell before I get on to what an amazing person she was. Deb loved music and she could play the guitar. And, and, um, my, my lasting memory of Deb is three songs that will never go out of my head, I don't think. Um, playing the guitar in high school, we'd get to school early, we'd grab the guitars, which were locked up. We'd send Deb, because Deb was only this high and quite petite, we'd send her over the wall. There was a gap like this. We'd send her over the wall and she would unlock the door and we would be able to get the musical instruments. By, by grade 10, the staff had decided we were probably pretty safe with the instruments and gave us the keys, but this is what we'd do. And then Deb would, and, and a, a lot of us would sit around you know, singing or doing whatever, and, and Deb was one of the guitar players. And there's three songs, and that is um, House of the Rising Sun, which of course shows my age, The Lion Sleeps Tonight, and also um, Everything I Own by Bread. And I will never, ever be able to hear those songs without thinking of Deb. And although Deb felt safe at school, she was unable to escape the abuse. The welfare authorities would check on her and she would lie and tell them she was happy because if she didn't, if she reported otherwise, she was physically punished by her foster pa parents. She also accepted a treatment at home as the norm because she didn't have anything else to compare it to. Deb made repeated requests to see her biological family but she was told they didn't want her. And after 15 years in a foster home, Deb ran away and lived on the streets. 
She survived by scavenging for food out of skip bins so she didn't starve. And she told us lots of funny stories about it. I mean, it's quite a serious issue, obviously, but she would tell us lots of funny stories about being, because she was so small, being the one that had to get into the skip and being left there when the police came round and things like this. But Deb eventually decided that wasn't the way to live. And so she walked into one of the banks. This is what we could do back in the, in the 70s. She walked into one of the banks and she asked for a job and she got a job. All through her life, Deb was tenacious about seeking information about a family. And when the authorities refused to give her access to a file, she staged a daily sitting in the department. And eventually, a public servant felt sorry for her and gave her access to her file illegally. She was given half an hour in a room with a file, a notepad and a pen. And amazingly, it turned out that her mother lived not five minutes away from her, and there was letters in that fire with her mother begging to get her back. Her other siblings went back to her mother eventually. Deb never did. Deb's mum was really ill when she found her, and she had a visit with her mother, and they were obviously it was hugely emotional, or you can just imagine what it was like, and didn't get to have a real proper dialogue through all the emotion and tears. And sh just shortly after that visit, Deb received a call from the hospital to say her mum was dying. Her mother died two minutes after Deb arrived to see her. So twice she saw her mother since she was 18 months old. Deb searched out other members of her biological family, but she'd been separated from them for 20 years by then, so it was a hard adjustment for her. And she suffered, she told me that she suffered this kind of identity crisis that a lot of members of the stolen generation experience, that of existing in a space between two worlds but not feeling like you fully belong in anywhere. Despite all of this, you would think it would be very easy for Deb to give up on life, but Deb worked hard. She worked hard to connect with her Aboriginal culture and her ancestors and to reclaim her identity as an Aboriginal woman. Deb's life, expectancy, uh, Deb's life experience motivated her to take a strong interest in Aboriginal affairs. And after the end of her first marriage, after more than about 20 years, she'd been a stay-at-home mum, worked in the family business, um, but predominantly a stay-at-home mum for four beautiful kids. Deb enrolled at university to pursue her interests. She'd left Tasmania. She studied Aboriginal health, which gave her an insight into the disadvantage suffered by Aboriginal people, not just in areas such as health, housing and economic participation, but the loss of their spiritual and cultural identity. Deb's life featured in the 2018 documentary Risking Light, which followed three people from throughout the world as they explored the journey from grief to compassion to forgiveness. And I attended a screening of Risking Light in the Hobart Town Hall a couple of years ago and was deeply moved by all three stories but particularly by Debs, given the friendship I've got with her. And on the 9th of August, that, there's going to be another screening of that um, movie, of that documentary, um, as a memorial to Deb uh, in Hobart. Despite the turmoil of Deb's upbringing, she achieved incredible success in her educational work and life. Shortly before her death, Charles Sturt University offered her an honorary professorship, so she was Professor Hocking. She put extensive energy into helping and representing Aboriginal people and has been a driving force behind progress towards truth-telling and reconciliation in Tasmania. Deb served as the chair of the Stolen Generations Alliance, an organisation which liaises with stolen generation survivors around Australia to advance their issues. And this organisation has also helped to reunite the families that have been torn apart by the removal of Aboriginal children. She led the committee that organises Sorry Day events in Tasmania, and in this role she also travelled around visiting schools to explain to school children the importance and significance of Sorry Day and of saying sorry. Over the years, Deb formed strong, productive relationships with political leaders, including the former Tasmanian Premier Paul Lennon and Prime Minister Kevin Rudd. And in 2006, Mr Lennon delivered an apology in the Tasmanian Parliament to the Stolen Generations and established a redress scheme. Deb was very involved in the discussions with the Premier about the wording of the apologies and details of the redress scheme. 
She also participated in discussions with the Commonwealth around the wording of the national apology delivered by Prime Minister Kevin Rudd in 2008. And earlier this year, when, when Deb was dying, when she was actually in palliative care, I spoke to Kevin and he sent her a personal video um, to thank her for all her hard work. D look, I've got pages of what Deb did. I've ad-libbed, I've missed the plot, I've lost a lot of time on it. I might continue this uh, in adjournment next week, but I do just want to say um, Deb made an in incredible contribution to the task of reconciliation, and I know that she would be ecstatic to see the election of a federal Labor government that's committed to implementing the Uluru Statement from the heart. We still have a long way to go. Deb, I haven't finished with you yet. I miss you. I'll come back and finish another time. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much. Mr Deputy President, I rise to speak about my experience on a recent Australian Regional Leadership Initiative tour hosted by Save the Children uh, and funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, which I undertook to Fiji. These uh, tours are an initiative of Save the Children Australia, um, and the aim is to educate politicians from all parties, uh, or not parties, independents, minor parties, it doesn't matter, um, on where Australian support, regional development funds and Australian aid is going and the benefits that are achieved from that. Uh, I can't speak highly enough about my experience on this tour. It was an absolute eye-opener for me. I mean, obviously, I'm very aware of the money Australia provides to our um, uh, to overseas um, partners and nations to support their development, uh, to support their growth and also to support them in their times of need following crisis and emergency. I've never begrudged that funding. I, I believe that it is important as a global citizen um, to, to be very active in that space. But to actually get to witness firsthand the results of this expenditure was incredibly humbling. Um, and I just want to talk about a few of the experiences we undertook. Uh, one of the first stops we had was to the Secretariat of the Pacific Islands Forum uh, in Suva. And we saw the Pacific Islands Forum the week before, very much front and centre of the news. Um, we got a presentation about the development and the adoption of the 2050 Blue Pacific Strategy, um, which is a strategy that brings together the Pacific Island Forum nations uh, to recognise that the region encompassing the oceans, the land, the landscapes and the environments needs to work together um, to really uh, see continued peace and harmony, harmony, but also to um, recognise opportunities that are faced in the region and work together to maximise those benefits instead of working in silos. Um, it, was a, it was a very good initiative and I look forward to watching how that strategy is implemented. We also got to spend time with the Australia Pacific Training Coalition who are currently, or were currently training, a cohort of aged care workers to come to Australia to work under the Pacific Australian Labor Mobility Scheme. Um, I know from my experience in agriculture, the Pacific Australia Labor Mobility Scheme is widely applauded, widely supported by employers in Australia, and to have this young cohort ready and raring to get into the regions to work in our aged care sector um, was very exciting indeed. These students, and, and there were 30 of them uh, from all over uh, Fiji, uh, undertake 12 weeks of, of theoretical learning there in, in Suva, and then they come to Australia, two jobs already identified, to undertake their 12 weeks of on-the-job training, and then they are a qualified aged care worker. Uh, they, they come out with a Cert 3, 
Uh, but under the Palm scheme, they can stay in Australia for, for three years, earn money. Uh, they, they send some of uh, their, their earnings home. It supports their home communities. It supports their families. It supports them, and they go home with a qualification and a life experience. And they, each and every one of them was so excited about the experience before them. Uh, during the trip, the Australian High Commission also coordinated for uh, the female politicians on this trip, myself, um, member for Indi, Helen Haynes, and uh, fellow Senator, Victorian Senator Jess Walsh, to meet with um, female candidates for the upcoming Fijian election. It has been identified in Fiji that um, they would like to see more women in politics and meeting with these candidates and for these candidates to see a bipartisan approach from the three of us and to hear our experiences in politics uh, and, and how important it is that we strive to attract more incredibly qualified, smart women into that area. I thank the High Commission for coordinating that. It was a really good um, opportunity. My only complaint was that uh, we ran out of time, um, So, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, we, I also met with incredible women in business over there. Um, Kata from KB Farms uh, outside Suva. She is the only female aquaculturalist in Fiji. She, uh, she breeds tilapia um, for commercial markets, but she's also an integrated farmer. So she, she's got her aquaculture with the tilapia. She grows taro, she grows cassava, she grows pumpkins. She's got an outstanding operation on only five hectares, five hectares of land, and she is a fully commercial operator. Um, employing local people and really also empowering other women and training other women to be businesswomen uh, in Fiji. Um, we then travelled up to Vanua Levu um, where we got to meet with some of the victims of Cyclone Yasa and to hear firsthand from them about their experiences. The, I'm going to probably pronounce it wrong, but the Nabavatu settlement which is still a tent village. These people, their village was absolutely flattened um, as a result of Cyclone Yasa uh, a couple of years ago. And they're currently living in uh, tents provided by Australian aid. And they're very grateful for those tents. The sense of community in this village was absolutely beautiful. Uh, the people living the most simplest of lives, out of necessity, because they're in tents. Um, they no longer have a power supply uh, because the generator they were provided was needed for the next emergency that came up. But they are making the most of being together uh, and being uh, in that circumstance. Save the children also established a $300 grant to the victims of Cyclone Yasa. And hearing firsthand from these people, what a difference just $300 made to them. And their excitement at seeing a delegation of Australian politicians who'd gone off the tourist track, who'd gone out of the way into this village to actually meet with them and to shake their hands and, and to break bread with them. Uh, they were absolutely thrilled and they had just three asks, which I, I was totally humbled by. They asked if we could potentially support them get some solar panels so they can get power to the village. Uh, they asked if at all possible they could get a couple of new tarpaulins for some of the tents that were in decline. And they asked for our support to help advocate. Um, they have all the building materials they need. They'd collected from following the cyclone. They have the will and the want 
to rebuild their village. And they've even located a site. And they're just waiting for the final sign off from the Fijian government. And then they will proudly re establish their community. We also met a young boy in Lakutu who was also a recipient of the $300 grant. And instead of, uh, you know, young fellas, if I'd given my children $300, it would probably be spent in, in a matter of days. This kid set up a business. He recognised that the closest barber shop was a two-hour trip away. So he took his $300, he established a very successful business, and now the men of his village can get their hair cut without having to travel days. The work Australia is doing in the Pacific, the work the Save the Children Foundation are doing in the Pacific and other aid agencies is phenomenal. I don't call it aid. I don't call it welfare. I call it partnership. I call it development. And uh, I encourage anyone who gets invited to go on one of these trips to take the offer. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to make some comments in this uh, Senator's statement in relation to the state of Australia's environment. And of course, we know that la last week the Minister for Environment, uh, Tanya Plibersek, uh, finally released uh, the official State of the Environment report, a report which has been hidden from public view uh, since December a report that under the previous government was hidden from Australians on the eve of an election. And why, Madam Acting Deputy President? Well, it's pretty clear when you look at the report just why the former government, the Morrison government, did not want the Australian people to know just what a dire situation Australia's environment is in. It is code red for nature. That is what this report shows an extinction crisis looming so large it is uh, becoming more and more difficult to halt, and a, a crisis that is fuelled by the climate crisis and global warming, compounding the very real impacts of both the extinction, extinction loss, habitat loss and, of course, uh, the climate crisis itself. It is a report that details in page after page after page, a litany of failure of successive governments, successive governments of being under their watch, refusing to do what was needed to protect the environment and to ensure that no more species, no more native animals, no more of Australia's environment is lost unnecessarily. Land clearing, this report shows, is out of control. Native forest logging, is pushing some of our most precious species to the brink of no return. All of these, of course, then compounding the very real and devastating impacts of climate change and global warming. 7.7 .7 million hectares of land cleared and lost in Australia over between the year 2000 and 2017, 93 per cent of which did not even require sign-off by the government of the day. Simply out of our hands, out of sight, out of mind, and now that habitat lost forever. This is putting real stress on our animals, on our wildlife and on our environment at large. And Australians are aware. They can see the fact that our environment is under st such stress, and they want the government of the day to do better and to do more. It's not good enough just to have an environment department or a minister for the environment. We must have a government that protects the environment. We must have politicians who are willing to stand up and say no when an application for a new coal mine or a big housing development is in critical habitat and is going to push our wildlife to the brink of no return. The big looming issue in this report, Madam Acting Deputy President, is the compounding nature of climate change and global warming and the fact that it is making it harder and harder for Australia to reverse the extinction crisis. It shows that our environment laws are not fit for purpose. It is 
nonsensical that in 2022 we have a set of rules in this country where the Environment Minister of the day has an application for a new coal or gas mine on their desk and they're asked to make a decision about whether that mine should go ahead or not, whether it should be given environmental approval, and yet there is no need or information for what impact the climate impact that project is going to have before being given the green light. So when you hear ministers and successive ministers, members in this place and the other say that a particular project is okay because it's been given environmental approval, well, remember, Madam Acting Deputy President, that none of that approval has required a, th a thought about the impact that the climate uh, pollution will have on the environment or the species that call that area home. We need a change to our environment laws drastically. We need laws that are fit for purpose, that are there to protect the environment, not the interests of the big mining corporations, not the interests of big developers, but are there to protect our environment and to stop species loss. We need environment laws that aren't just uh, written to protect the environment, but are enforced. What the State of Environment report shows, what uh, Graham Samuel's report uh, two years ago shows, is that even the weak laws that we have are being undermined every single day, not enforced, overlooked and bargained off. We need to put a halt and a stop to that. We need a watchdog uh, and a cop on the beat to make sure that the rules that are in place to protect nature, to look after our wildlife, are actually being upheld and implemented. An independent environmental watchdog to enforce those rules. We need an immediate halt to any more critical habitat destruction. Australia is being asked by the rest of the world to take the state of our environment seriously, to hear this warning sign of Code Red and act. We're being asked to match what other countries around the world are, are doing, to pledge to stop any further extinction, to protect uh, land and sea, and we need to do it seriously. This report reveals just how many of our precious Australian animals and species are on the brink of extinction. And it is just devastating and a national shame that the koala is on that list. That if we don't change the way we are protecting our environment, that we are going to lose the koala. We are going to lose the great gliders. We're going to lose our masked owls. We're going to lose species after species after species until we stop allowing their homes and their habitat to be destroyed. So we need a moratorium on the destruction of habitat immediately until we have the right rules in place to put the environment first and not the interests of big corporations and developers. There's been a lot of talk over the last few days uh, in this building as the parliament has recommenced about how seriously this new parliament is going to take the climate crisis. Australians voted overwhelmingly across all states, across cities, suburbs and in the regions for climate action. Well, part of taking climate action means we need to stop making things worse. We need to stop making pollution worse. We've got a big job ahead of us to cut and reduce the amount of pollution currently being created. The last thing we should be doing is seeing more projects given the green light, which are going to make pollution levels grow. 
a climate trigger in our environment laws, forcing the minister of the day to look and assess projects on the basis of their climate pollution, how it, climate change is going to impact and damage the environment, is a no-brainer. A no-brainer. And I look forward to working with people on all sides in this new parliament to garner support and momentum and to get that job done. Because if we don't, Madam Acting Deputy President, it's not just a report that warns Code Red. It will be happening. It is happening before our very eyes, and it will be on our watch. We are losing time, and we are losing uh, the battle against extinction and the battle against the environment crisis. We have to act now, and we need to work together to do that. A climate trigger, a moratorium on habitat destruction, and an independent watchdog to make sure there is a cop on the beat looking after our environment and holding those who destroy it to account. Thank you, Senator. Senator Sikorini. Thank you very much, Acting uh, Deputy President. It's good to see you and the other colleagues here again um, in the 47th Parliament. Um, look, today I uh, decided to make a contribution um, in the Senate uh, on, on the topic of the foot and mouth disease, which is obviously a, a very serious issue uh, impacting the agriculture uh, industry, but also our economy nationally. Now, the foot and mouth disease has been getting a lot of attention in the media, and, and for good reason. But there's also been a lot of attention in our political debate, and it presents a very huge and de devastating threat to one of our most significant components of the Australian economy, our ag industry. The estimated initial cost um, of foot and mouth disease outbreak, if it, was, if it was to occur here in Australia, would be around $80 billion, and that's been recent estimates. But not to mention the immense personal cost uh, on individuals in agriculture, particularly our farmers. Australia's Australians are already intensely aware of the supply chain disruptions after the po past two years uh, during COVID. So there is a lot of valid concern out in our community about the foot and mouth disease outbreak uh, that is currently being uh, seen, and, and the Australian government is working very closely with our, our, our friends in Indonesia. But this outbreak does require a very serious but a mature response. And that's why the Albanese Labor government has taken several measures to date to strengthen our biosecurity on our border. And I'll run through just a few uh, for the benefit of the Senate. First, we've increased screening in our airports and mail centres. Second, we've reviewed the import permits for Indonesian products that are at risk of carrying foot and mouth disease. Third, there's been specific advice about biosecurity responsibilities that have played on every plane coming into Australia for, from Indonesia. Fourth, direct support to the Indonesian government to purchase vaccines to control the outbreak. Fifth, additional funding for the Meat and Livestock Australia to coordinate industry's response to the disease. And sixth, the, the deployment of sanitation foot mats. Now, it is these mats that have been delivered to all of our international airports, uh, and they are operational in Melbourne, Perth, Darwin, Sydney, Adelaide, Cairns and Brisbane for passengers entering from Indonesia. And there will be other airports that will soon also receive these mats. In another step uh, in the strongest biosecurity response Australia has ever seen, the Albanese government is also screening every single piece of mail that is arrived from both Indonesia and China. We are serious about combating the biggest risk of foot and mouth disease coming here imported and infected meat products. This has never been done on such a scale by any previous Australian government, despite past outbreaks. It's all part of our strongest biosecurity response in history. But what has been disappointing is how the National Party have played politics with this outbreak, especially the one that's recently broken out in Indonesia. Without talking to industry or experts, the Nationals have seized on the news of foot and mouth disease infections in Indonesia, but with delight and immediately, uh, immediately called for the closure of the border between our two great nations. Now, this is an extraordinary call from the opposition, particularly those in the National Party, that has received no response 
and has received also no support from ex experts from the industry. Industry groups have rightly called for calm and acknowledged that the government's response has been very reasonable, been measured to prevent the disease from entering Australia and has stated that our borders should remain open. And I know there were interjections across the aisle, but I do say, thankfully, the Liberal Party did not join the Nationals in calling for the borders to be closed. Take, for instance, the Meat and Livestock Managing Director, Jason Strong, who recently described the federal government's approach to date as very coordinated and collaborative and added that the cooperation has been outstanding. He further, he characterised that some of the recent commentary by those opposite, particularly the National Party, were unnecessarily alarmist. We also had Ag Force Queensland Deputy President John Baker, who was also reported in the media recently, as advising his members that they should be cautious about the foot, uh, foot and mouth disease, but said that he had faith in Australia's biosecurity measures because they were doing their job. Further, he went on to say that all this hysteria, people saying that we should ban travel to Bali, but we haven't banned travel to any other country where there's been foot and mouth disease in the past. Other farm leaders, like those in the National Farmers Federation, have said that the biosecurity measures to combat the spread of foot and mouth disease in Australia are actually working. The united foot and mouth disease effort by Labor and the industry is crucial to maintaining the confidence in our $80 billion agriculture industry. So seriously has this government taken the issue that the Minister for Agriculture, Senator Murray Watt, travelled to Jakarta recently. He was accompanied by the National Farmers Federation President Fiona Simpson and Australia's Chief Vet for talks with the Indonesian government on how we can help with the foot and mouth disease outbreak. And I want to commend the minister for taking such action. On top of this, the minister has also provided not one, but actually two briefings to the opposition, specifically to the leader of the Nationals, at, the, at his request, by the Ag Department's biosecurity team, so that we, we as in the collective we're in this place, can all work together to protect our ag industry. Indonesia is a key trading partner. And nurturing our trade relationship is incredibly important, particularly for agriculture. But for weeks now, members of the opposition, and again, particularly those in the National Party, have been dramatically calling for the border to be shut, again, with no support from experts or industry. But what we saw on Monday was quite mind-blowing. We saw the extraordinary attack from the Nationals' leader, David Littleproud, on the National Farmers Federation for daring to question his record on biosecurity and his border hysteria. Unlike the opposition, we will work with the industry to keep the foot and mouth disease out, but we don't want to play politics. And we've had multiple occasions have said to the opposition that we want to work with them on this issue. But unfortunately, this is not the first time that Mr Littleproud has attacked farm groups for daring to question him. In March this year, he called such groups, particularly the NFF, ignorant and sidelined critics over the coalition's government's then lacklustre response to the lumpy skin disease. Now, that kind of arrogance and refusal to listen is what's created the cracks in our biosecurity wall that we are now trying to fix. The NFF's president, Fiona Simpson, responded to these attacks recently. Uh, by the Nationals' lead on Monday with a tweet. And for the benefit of my colleagues, I'll read out what she tweeted. Quote, he, that is Mr Littleproud, seemed to think we were representative a couple of months ago, except when we were pushing for the national biosecurity strategy for more dollars for biosecurity, that is. End of quote. So unlike the Nats, uh, Labor has listened to farmers and we've listened to many farming peak bodies. And I've been personally contacted by many in industry who are deeply concerned about the impact of the media storm that the Nationals have been drumming up about the insecurity of our borders. The debate has undermined confidence in Australian consumers and retailers who are starting to feel that maybe we should stay away from Australian beef. Despite the controls that we have in place, the plate, that the controls are working, there's been no human health concern to date. Now, I've heard concerning reports that international consumers are already asking which other countries they can source their beef from. 
because the media debate is undermining confidence in Australia's ability to keep foot and mouth disease out, despite our controls working. The NFF has been very clear that it does not think that the border should be shut. And they've also been very critical of the previous coalition government's ad hoc approach to biosecurity. For almost a decade, biosecurity funding has been inconsistent and patchy, which is the opposite of what you need to keep biological threats out of Australia. So it's completely hypocritical for the Nationals to be talking down the Albanese government's approach and ability to manage biosecurity when they have been criticised for years for their inadequate and inconsistent management. What did Nationals leader David Littleproud say in response to criticism of his party's approach to biosecurity and foot and mouth disease outbreak? Well, he doubled down, claimed the NFF doesn't represent everyday farmers. That's right, they don't represent everyday farmers, apparently. Apparently, farmers shouldn't collaborate and raise their voice on issues that matter to them. They should just sit down and listen to what the Nats tell them to think. Well, this is not the approach of this government. This is not the approach of how an Albanese government will work with our farming community. Thank you, Senator. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Acting President. I rise to highlight a meaningful historic opportunity to pay tribute to the Platinum Jubilee of Her Majesty the Queen. It's an opportunity that is in real danger of being missed unless the new Albanese government acts quickly. But let me begin with a short anecdote that demonstrates powerfully Her Majesty's commitment to the Australian people and her lifelong mantra of service before self. On the eve of the funeral of Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, our Queen telephoned her Australian representative, the Governor-General David Hurley. His Excellency had previously written to Her Majesty to express Australia's sorrow as a nation at the Duke's passing. The Governor-General also arranged for a phone call with Her Majesty, thinking it would take place after the funeral. Little did he expect to hear from the Queen only hours before the service. After the Governor-General had passed on his condolences, the first question the Queen had was for the welfare of the people in the town of Kalbarri in my home state of Western Australia after the shocking destruction of Cyclone Sarosia. Amid, amid Her Majesty's own grief and great personal loss, her first instinct was to ask about the welfare of others. It's a heartwarming tale of an Australian head of state who truly cares for her Australian people. As I mentioned earlier, it's one of countless examples of her keeping her promise of service and duty to us. As the Commonwealth celebrates Her Majesty's 70 remarkable years on the throne, her Platinum Jubilee offers an opportunity not only to recognise her service and duty, but importantly, that of others who have also dedicated their lives to the greater good. In this spirit, a magnificent commemorative medal to mark the 70th anniversary of the Queen's accession has been created in the United Kingdom. The criteria for receiving the medal in the United Kingdom has remained the same as for all Jubilee medals, serving members of the armed forces that have completed five full years of service qualify, volunteer reserve and ex-regular reservists qualify, frontline emergency services personnel qualify, prison services personnel qualify, members of the royal household and with one year of qualifying service also qualify, and living individual recipients of the Victoria and George Crosses also qualify. And to provide some context, recipients in the United Kingdom number into the hundreds of thousands in a wonderful way of sharing this landmark occasion. Some of these recipients were present at the official Jubilee events in London, and those watching would have noticed the beautiful silver medal with its blue, red and white ribbon. The Platinum Jubilee has not gone unnoticed in Australia. There have been some wonderful celebrations with major public buildings illuminated in purple, beacons lit and even an island here in Lake Burley Griffin renamed in our Queen's honour. But sadly, Australia has not taken up the opportunity to award a, award a Queen's Platinum Jubilee Medal. New Zealand's Labor government has made a similar mistake. 2022 is quickly passing us by, and so is the chance to implement this very special initiative. Not doing so would be a shame for the deserving potential recipients across Australia and would represent a break with precedent. 
In the June of 1977, Malcolm Fraser announced nearly 7,000 Australians would receive the Silver Jubilee Medal. In 2002, then Prime Minister John Howard, without delay, announced that Australians would be eligible for Her Majesty's Golden Jubilee Medal. Perhaps in a sign of things to come, the Gillard government was reluctant to implement the Diamond Jubilee Medal in 2012. One headline from the Canberra Times on 14 June 2012 read, Australians shun medals to mark Queen's ascension. In the end, only 10 people received it. Now, it seems to me that Australia may not mark in this meaningful way what is almost certainly the Queen's most important and, unfortunately, perhaps last jubilee. Various Commonwealth nations across the globe have done their part. For example, the Caribbean and Central American members, such as Jamaica, Belize, Antigua and Bermuda, have all awarded their citizens with the Queen's Jubilee Medal. Why should we make this break in Australian history? And why should Australian service people and civilians doing vital work on behalf of our country and community, on behalf of my home state of Western Australia, not similarly be recognised? Many of them, including our ADF personnel and police, swear an oath of allegiance to the Queen. So I note, does the Albanese government's assistant minister for the Republic. But I realise the irony of this arrangement is not lost on many of my colleagues, both here and in the other place. The service of ADF and police force members would, of course, feature highly on a suggested list of criteria for Australian recipients of a, of a Platinum Jubilee Medal. I would propose that criteria might be based on that in the United Kingdom, but tailored to Australian use and include qualifying members who are serving and ex-service members of the Australian Defence Force that have completed four years of service, Australian Defence Force cadet instructors that have completed four years of service, frontline emergency services personnel, both paid and volunteer, members of the police force and correctional service officers that have completed four years of service, national servicemen whose service has been completed, and of course again living individual recipients of the Victoria Cross and the Cross of Valour. The new Albanese government has been blatant in its Republican agenda since gaining office, going so far as to create, as I've highlighted, a portfolio responsible for an achieving an Australian Republic. Nevertheless, I call upon it to put aside its views and policy on what ought to be a non-partisan issue at this time. It must honour the words service and duty by starting the process of awarding Australians with a Platinum Jubilee Medal. And it must award the medal widely enough that it resonates broadly across the Australian community. This is a matter I intend to pursue over coming weeks and months. And I call on my Senate colleagues to be outspoken in their support of this initiative and other initiatives like it that at its core honour the service of Australian men and women across causes. I mean no offence to the Canadian provinces of Manitoba, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island and Satisquatchewan, except to stress a final point. They have all done it and Australia can do it again. Just briefly, Madam Acting Deputy President, I want to talk about another matter that is particularly close to my heart. I'd like to publicly acknowledge the great work and the one-year anniversary of the National Unity Government of Burma here in Australia. The 19th of July marks the date in which, a year ago, they appointed an official representative to our country. It's also a great shame that just in the last few days we have been reminded again of the brutality of the regime in Myanmar. And again I call upon the Australian government to not waste a moment in imposing sanctions against this brutal regime. Yesterday the Governor-General gave a speech. It outlined the government's ambitions. In that speech he said that a feature of our country, and I agree with this point, is the breadth of its multicultural community. That same community wants to see their values, their priorities reflected in Australia's foreign policy. It is shameful, it is shameful that the regime has brutally executed four democracy activists. The time is now for the Australian government to act and to act decisively because Australians like myself 
but Australians of Burmese heritage, the Chin, the Karen and others want this government to stand up and to impose sanctions and not to waste another opportunity. This is a very, very critical issue. You can't live our values abroad unless we stand united in condemning again and again this brutal regime in Burma. May I congratulate the new Australian government on the announcement it made yesterday in condemning the execution of democracy activists. And can I add my own views to their calls for greater international effort in having this regime condemned and driven out. I'm encouraged by the unity that Burmese people of, variety of, of, of a variety of ethnic nationalities have, joined, have shown in joining together in supporting the National Unity Government. I congratulate their work over the last 12 months and I wish them every success in Australia in representing their views to the new government, their views to myself and to other senators, all who have a great passion and care for the restoration of democracy in Burma. Thank you, Senator. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to the remainder of the speakers for Senator's statements today. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerk to set the clock accordingly, and I call Senator Pocock. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. This is not my first speech, but I would like to take this opportunity to talk briefly about the recently released State of the Environment report. At the commencement of this 47th parliament, it is clear that our environment sits on a precipice, which means that our way of life sits on the precipice, as we are part of nature. And if nature goes down, we go down with her. None of what was contained in the report was a surprise, and none of it was the fault of any one government. It is the result of decades of underfunding and mismanagement of our natural environment. We have to do better, and Australians expect us to do better. And we can. As the report highlighted, we have the opportunity to learn from the oldest living cultures in the world. We need First Nations knowledge and wisdom more than ever. Combining this with the latest in science and technology, the brilliant work done by our scientific community, we can solve the challenges we face. But this work must be properly resourced. Declining investment in our natural environment has to be reversed now. I commend Minister Plibersek's commitment to reform our environmental laws next year. As Professor Graham Samuel pointed out in his review of the Act almost two years ago, and I quote, the EPBC Act is ineffective. The Act is not fit for current or future environmental challenges, including climate change. With so many ecosystems and species on the brink, some tough decisions will need to be made before the Act can be updated. Decisions that prioritise the health of eco ecosystems and the diversity of life this incredible continent has sustained for millennia. One of the things the State of the Environment report highlighted was the need for us as a country to take invasive species management more seriously. In Australia, feral cats alone kill some 316 million birds and almost 600 million reptiles every year. Invasive species have cost us almost $400 billion since the 1960s and continue to have a significant impact on our ecosystems and our farmers. Many mammal species have become extinct and others on, are on the brink of extinction due to the impact of feral animals. From so, some of our incredible marsupials such as numbats, betongs, bilbies and dunnarts, many of them now only existing in fully fenced feral free areas dotted across the country. Invasive species management requires funding for existing programs, investment in innovation, as well as working collaboratively with farmers and landholders to control invasive species. This collaboration with farmers must extend beyond invasive species management. Farmers look after more than half of Australia. 
Growing up on a farm gave me a love of the land, and most of the farmers I know love the land that they're on and want to leave it in a better condition for future generations. Farmers can and must be part of the solutions to solving the climate and biodiversity crises we face. We have a number of world-leading farmers in regenerative agriculture here in Australia. Farmers who are producing world-class food and fibre while sequestering carbon and increasing biodiversity on their farms. We have an opportunity to learn from them and build on their knowledge to regenerate land whilst also providing quality food and fibre today and handing our land to future generations in a better condition. I look forward to working with my fellow senators to halt our extinction crisis and leave a legacy for future generations, one that can excite younger generations and one that can excite us as a country as we talk about the kind of future that we want. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, this month I travelled to Fiji as part of a cross-party delegation to better understand our place in the Pacific family. Uh, and from five days of meetings in villages, farms, markets, women's health centres, training schools uh, and boardrooms across Fiji, uh, I want to share just two lessons. First, that Australia's commitment to build our Pacific family matters. And second, that strong women are the heart and soul of successful communities in Fiji. And our Australian aid programs are supporting these women to build a better future. First, building our Pacific family matters. It matters to the Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum, Mr Henry Puna, who so generously gave us his time. And it matters just as much to the local village leaders in remote communities we met as well. Everywhere that we went, Fijians spoke to us as family and they welcomed us with open arms. The communities who had the least gave the most, offering food and friendship, sharing their stories and wishing us well. And whether we were meeting in boardrooms or on hillsides with communities, the message to our parliamentary delegation was the same everywhere, and that was that climate change is the number one issue in Fiji. It's the number one challenge, and that as part of our big Blue Pacific family, Australia must act. One local leader spelled it out loud and clear to us. We were meeting him in his community in Lakutu, an area devastated by Cyclone Yasa uh, just 18 months ago. But the community were still living in tents, in damp and uncomfortable positions with their families, waiting for new homes to be built. A program run by Save the Children Australia under the Australian Humanitarian Partnership had delivered much needed $300 cash payments, emergency payments, to thousands of people. But during a meeting in the camp, this leader told us, we are not cyclone refugees, we are climate refugees. Fiji needs Australia to act on climate, and they welcome the new steps forward of the Australian government to do just that. Second, strong women are the heart and soul of effective communities in Fiji, and Australian aid projects make a real difference to their lives. Projects for women to share and sell traditional crafts, continuing their cultures for future generations while generating income and independence are absolutely critical to women's economic security. In Lambasa, the local market has been transformed into a safe environment for women to not only operate their businesses but to also sleep safely at night. These women transport their goods to market, initially by horse, to main roads where they catch buses into town. Until the Markets for Change program rebuilt their market to include some room for overnight accommodation, they were having to sleep in bus shelters, uncomfortable and unsafe. Now they have the opportunity to thrive, and they are. So too do women in Savu Savu town who have benefited from help to build a great hall, the Ramarama Hall, to come together uh, and share and sell their crafts. Overcoming distance to remote communities uh, is a key feature of Australian aid projects in Fiji. Whether it's supporting nurses who serve village women 
uh, crossing rivers, travelling by horseback and by foot to reach those women in need, um, or medical services specific work supporting women and children who are the victims of sexual violence across Fiji. All of these programs are proudly supported by Australia, by Australians. And our aid programs are changing lives by helping Fiji's women reach their own amazing potential. Uh, I want to extend huge thanks to Save the Children for inviting us to this experience, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, and to my parliamentary colleagues on this delegation, Senator Perrin Davey, Senator David Van, the member for Indi, Helen Haynes, and the member for Gippsland, Darren Chester. Uh, thank you for sharing the journey with uh, genuine interest, great collegiality uh, and a good dose of um, humour as well. Um, it really is parliamentary cross-party delegations like these that can and do show our parliament at its best. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. It's great to be back and great to see you in the chair. And, uh, I want to today take the brief opportunity that I have to speak about the environment. Um, it is something that is centrally important to the future of this nation, to the capacity of many parts of our economy to function, and something we all treasure. Despite some of the rhetoric that we often hear in this place, it is something we all regard uh, at the highest level and with extreme importance. And to that end, I think that it is a chance now that uh, the parliament has returned and uh, each party and individual senator in this place uh, forms their views on the best way forward when it comes to policy to draw breath, examine facts and find a way forward that is actually in the interests of the community we represent. Um, we have a new government and uh, it is time for that government to start telling us what it is it intends to do. We heard from the Minister for the Environment, um, Tanya Plibersek, uh, when she released the State of the Environment report around what the government would do, uh, outlining the new government's plans in the environment portfolio. Now, some of those uh, elements of the announcement were announced during the election campaign, and I'll come to those in a moment, but there are a range that weren't part of the pre-election announcements. And it is just on that I want to touch on the State of the Environment report, and I have had the opportunity to read the 270-page overview. Uh, cover to cover to understand exactly what it is the I think it was about 30 um, contributing authors had to say and there are some very important points in there and I should also indicate it is the first of many speeches I'm going to be giving on this particular report and what it means and how we should respond um, but as I said before what the government does in response to this report or any other report that it receives is where the rubber hits the road and what is important for the Australian community um, reports are something that a government takes by way of advice. The decision-making function is that of government. One of the, uh, uh, well, any decision that the minister and the government makes should be commensurate with the issue they are dealing with. If it's a problem they need to solve or if it is a pathway they need to beat in order to create economic growth or some other opportunity for a part of our community, the decision taken, the policy decision taken and all the supports in around it should be commensurate to the issue they are dealing with. That is an important point uh, when it comes to its response, the Australian government's response to the State of the Environment report, and one I will continue to underscore. Being commensurate, being balanced and being reasonable is central to good outcomes. Uh, we know that the environment is fragile and requires care. We also know that our economy is fragile. The uh, statistics that are at hand, the announcement today around inflation uh, does make that very, very clear that we are in perilous times when it comes to our global economy, things that are well beyond our control, and the decisions that are made here by this government and indeed by overseas governments will have an impact on that. And when it comes to the environment, decisions made in the sphere of environmental policy have far reaching impacts. And that is something. The government needs to consider, the minister needs to consider as she brings forward policies for consideration. And I was uh, listening to the tail end of Senator Pocock's uh, contribution before, and he uh, paid tribute and acknowledged, I think quite rightly, to some of our best land managers, farmers, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the role they play as custodians of the land that they live and work on, and uh, the fact that they actually want to treat the land 
as if it is going to well because they rely on it and so on that basis it is important to remember when a government makes decisions around land management and environmental policy land users don't seek to trash the land they know they rely on it into the future be they farmers foresters or any other land user uh, we need to make sure that we take into account these people realize that they are reliant on this resource and it is on that point farming there is a range of questions I have around uh, the new government's policies in the environment space. One that was uh, uh, foreshadowed or um, uh, flagged at the State of the Environment uh, report release address that the minister gave last week, and that is around this national estate, uh, the 30 per cent of land and sea that will be uh, set aside as a national estate. Now, I do wonder how, as a country, we will be able to in a sense, lock up 30 per cent of our land mass without impacting on our farmers. And so it's those sorts of questions, that sort of certainty we need to work with those custodians of our land, not to uh, attack them and make life harder. They're good custodians. You, we Senator should respect Dunning, them. Your time has expired. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, we've heard a lot about the so-called climate wars recently. We've heard it from the Prime Minister, we've heard it from the Minister for Climate Change, and we've certainly heard it from many in the press gallery. And you know what? There actually is a climate war going on right now, but it's not the one that those people like to talk about. It's not between Labor and the Greens, as Labor would like people to believe, and so many journalists love to uncritically parrot. The real climate war is between, on one side, the big corporate emitters, their shills in this place, and most of the media, and on the other side are those who are fighting for a safe climate and for the ecosystem that supports our lives. That's the real climate war, and I'll tell you now, it's barely got started. In the future, it's going to get a lot more bloody and a lot more desperate, because the people who run the big emitting corporations are murdering psychopaths. And their agents in this parliament on both sides are too weak and too beholden to stand up to them. Governments are already trying to arrest their way out of the real climate war, but they will soon understand that the prisons just aren't big enough. The real climate wars will not end until either we have public policy that will ensure a livable planet, and we're a long, long way from that in this country or until the climate has broken down so irreparably that it simply doesn't matter anymore and people are only concerned with scrounging enough food to feed themselves for another day. And while the real climate wars are going on, I will be fighting them in this place, on the streets, online, in the forests or locked on to the fossil fuel infrastructure because this is a crisis. It is an emergency, and fighting for a livable future is what the situation demands. The crisis also deserves honesty. So here's some facts. We know that Labor's climate policy is nowhere near compatible with a livable climate. A livable climate demands that coal, oil, and gas be left in the ground, and it demands an end to logging native forests, because you cannot negotiate with the laws of thermodynamics. And here we are in 2022 with all that has come before us, all the information we know, we are being held to ransom by the psychopathic cabal of the fossil fuel sector and their puppets in the major parties in this place. And instead of shining a light on the toxicity and highlighting the damage that is being done to climate and planet and demanding that Labor go further, we're getting appeasement from many in the, in the media gallery. With Labor so desperately trying to sell us short, so many in the gallery are focused on trying to rewrite history and push for a negotiation with people who are profiting so obscenely by cooking the planet. There are plenty in the press gallery who are just as culpable in the climate debate as those who profit from cooking the planet those nature-destroying corporations. The blind zombie stenography of Labor talking points 
from the incrementalists and the centrists in the press gallery is just as damaging to the chance of real climate action as the mantra from the climate denialists at News Corp. You cannot negotiate climate policy with the psychopaths that run the corporations who are responsible for driving climate change, and nor can you accept their donations and expect to be taken seriously. Unlike Labor, the Greens will not break bread with the people who are lining their pockets by cooking the planet. To the Labor politicians who say we've seen a decade of climate inaction, I say you are either ignorant or you are lying. And to the press gallery folks that credulously report that rubbish and so frantically greenwash Labor's climate policies, I say this. Please imagine the contribution you could make to the real climate wars by pushing Labor to go further and faster on climate rather than trying to push the Greens to accept Labor's mediocrity. If you did that, you'd be on the right side of the real climate wars, not on the wrong side of history. Senator Polly. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. This week, the 47th Parliament commenced in the work of the Albanese Labor government to create a better future started. After almost a decade in opposition, my home state of Tasmania will again have a seat at the table. We will actually receive a fair deal from the government of the day. And I look forward to delivering on all the Albanese Labor government's election commitments made in our home state, Madam Acting Deputy President of Tasmania. Commitments to create secure local jobs, a commitment for better health outcomes and to have access to palliative care, cheaper childcare, better access to TAFE and training, better and essential quality aged care and care for those with disabilities and to create jobs in hydrogen and the renewable energy sectors. From day one, the Albanese Labor government has started the job of renewal and reform. The work of improving our country began on election night. This is in stark contrast to the former government, which instead adopted a 10 years of drift and policy paralysis. Labor will reform our country for the better and create opportunity for all Australians. As you have witnessed after May 21st, the Prime Minister has not wasted one day. The Albanese Labor government secured the Fair Works decision to raise the minimum wage by $40 per week. And this government is committed to keeping unemployment low boosting productivity and ensuring we bring down the cost of living. This is why the Albanese Labor government has organised a Jobs and Skills Summit for the 1st and 2nd of September this year. It will focus on delivering secure, well-paid jobs and strong, sustainable wage growth, expanding employment opportunities for all Australians, including the disadvantaged addressing skills shortages and getting our skill mix right for the long term, improving migration settings to support higher productivity and wages, ensuring women have equal opportunities and equal pay. And we will legislate to establish Jobs and Skills Australia. These are essential and very important uh, policies which we will deliver on. We have delivered dis uh, disaster relief payments to people affected by the New South Wales floods, and we have ensured that the COVID payments for casual workers will continue in the short term as we continue to battle the health and economic factors presented to us by COVID-19 recovery. Before the election and during the election, Labor committed to end the climate wars. Unlike the former senator and his waving, outrageous contribution to this place, the Greens still have learnt nothing about working together in the interest of addressing climate change and that we will lead this. As the Prime Minister and the Minister for Energy and Climate Change, Chris Bowen, have signed an emission reduction target of 43 per cent by 2030. We will get on with the job. 
That is what we took to the election as a formal commitment to the people of Australia, and they endorsed that commitment. Labor has a mandate, and we are committed to it. I urge those in this place and in the other place to listen to the many voices of the Australian people. Australia looks different at home and abroad. We are repairing the important historical and strategic relationships that have kept Australia in good stead for decades. Our relationship with European countries and our Pacific neighbours. The Albanese Labor government has committed more military assistance for Ukraine. We have ramped up biosecurity measures to protect Australia's $70 billion agriculture sector from foot and mouth disease. We are committed and we will take action in relation to aged care, which has been left adrift and deserted by the previous Liberal governments over the last decade. We will continue to encourage Australians to have their fourth dose of COVID vaccine. But we do have to work together, and that's why the contribution by Senator McKim just demonstrated how far out of touch the Greens are in this country. They have to learn to work with the government and the opposition of the day to bring about real changes. We will do that whether we're talking about the, Ul the Uluru Statement of the Order. Heart, whether we talk about ending domestic one. violence. Order. We will do Resume this and we will seat. show— The time being 1.30, we'll remove to two-minute statements. I'll call Senator Van. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, after only a short time in government, the Labor Party is certainly showing its true colours. And my good friend Senator Polly is, is right about one thing. They, they do have a mandate. But that mandate seems to be to backflip on every promise that they've made, to make decisions purely for their donors, to look after the, 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 the thuggish CFMEU, to look after their, their donors in the industry super funds. That's the mandate that they've seemed to have taken on board. That's the mandate that's letting Australians down already. On only the second day of parliament, we're seeing backflips going on more and more. Despite arguing for more spending while in opposition on, on COVID and for free rapid antigen tests, they've now backed away from that. It took us days to, to get them to, uh, and, and all the um, uh, responsible bodies to get them to agree to, the, to reinstate the COVID payment. The Labor Party have shown that their main concern is just to look after their donors. Watering down the ABCC's powers and the Your Future, Your Legislation, Your Super Legislation will only serve to purpose of disempowering Australians and empowering their donors. Non-stop over the last three years we've heard Labor Party, when they're on this side, carry on about accountability and transparency. They have just done two things that have destroyed accountability and transparency. It is time that the Labor Party wake up, take responsibility, realise that they are now the ones in government, put in place proper protections against FMD, look after people who in aged care with COVID and do more to look after Australians. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. It's welcome news that in the first week of sittings, the Albanese Labor government, government is introducing legislation to provide universal paid leave for family and domestic violence. It's just one of the many things we can do as a government to provide the leadership and the investment to help end family, domestic and sexual violence. This change will give workers, overwhelmingly women, the means to escape violent situations without risking their jobs or their financial security. I bring to the attention of the Senate the deep sense of sadness across Central Australia following yet another act of family and domestic violence. People are in sorry business and dealing with the terrible tragedy that a mother and her baby are no longer here. It's a tragic story that we hear repeated far too often uh, in this country. Violence has no place, Mr Acting Deputy President, in any community, and tackling this scourge is everyone's business. 
As is often the case in many communities, the responsibility to tackle domestic violence often falls on the shoulders of the women themselves, the victims and the communities who are at the centre of it. I just want to take this opportunity to reach out to those families, not only in Central Australia but obviously as well across the top end where there has also been recent deaths, and across Australia really, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, that we do hear and see what's going on. And as a government, this is one area that we know, not just as a government, that we need to tackle, but as a parliament. We were able to do it in terms of safety in the workplace right here in Parliament House. And we know we must do it responsibly right across Australia so that no person, wherever they live, should feel unsafe or be a victim of such tragic events. Senator Rice. President, people voted for change this election. So understandably, people on income support are devastated and angry that the new, supposedly progressive <laughs> Labor government is rolling out the Liberal previous government's broken and punitive employment services system, Workforce Australia. Under this new system, people on income support have to complete enough activities to accrue 100 points a month or have their payments cut off. They also have to navigate a new, confusing, inaccessible online platform that has already had technical difficulty after technical difficulty. And despite calls from welfare advocates and, wel and uh, uh, recipients, the government rushed the implementation of Workforce Australia, and it's been causing harm since day one. Users of the new platform have said things like, this whole experience is very stressful for an old person. It is damaging my mental health more. And I am frankly terrified that this will lead to myself and others being penalised for not participating correctly in a system that we know literally nothing about. Community groups, advocates, welfare recipients and the Greens have been calling for a minimum three-month pause to payment cut-offs while people attempt to navigate this new, confusing system. But later this week, the government's measly 30-day suspension ends and people risk losing their payments while food costs are massively up, millions of people on JobSeeker, DSP, Youth Allowance and the Age Pension are struggling to stretch a dollar far enough to survive. This week, I will proudly present to the Senate a petition of more than 31,450 people who are calling on the government to prevent another robo-debt-like disaster by suspending Workforce Australia payment cutoffs for three months. I urge the government to listen to these voices and take immediate action to ensure that no one loses their income support payments during this cost of living crisis. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, it says an awful lot about this new government that on a day when inflation has now risen to 6.1 per cent, the highest in decades, their priority is to legislate an emissions reduction target. They are more focused on handing power to bureaucrats, on creating a lawyer's picnic to put in legislation something that will tie the hand behind the back of Australia to compete on the international stage, to push up power prices. On a day that inflation rises to its highest level in decades, at a time when Australian families are feeling the pinch every which way they turn, this government is focused on fundamentally a virtue signal that will put, punish everyday Australians, that will punish Australian businesses. Because to reach this emissions target, we will need to shut down every coal-fired power station in this country. At a time when globally nations across the world, in light of the war in UK, they are, the German Greens are leading the way in Germany in identifying the fact to ensure that they have affordable and reliable power dispatchable power, Order. they are turning back to coal-fired power generation. Now, we have some of the best coal in the world here. We can create jobs. We can get into, increase our mining sector. We can help bolster our coal-fired power generation. And we, and we can actually help everyday Australians Order. and Senator make sure Hughes. they can turn their dishwasher Senator on after Hughes. 6 p.m. We Resume your seat. 
interjections disorderly. The Albanese government said this is going to be a new parliament with a new approach. I'd encourage you to follow that advice and all senators to follow that advice. We have rules here so people of different views can be heard in a respectful environment. Senator Hughes. Thank you. Well, I know Senator Chisholm would miss me too much if I wasn't in the Senate, so I promise for you I'll stay. But we want Australians to be able to pay the bills, put petrol in their car, put food on their table and make sure they can keep the lights on. Order. Your time has expired. Senator Mariel Smith. Thank you, Deputy President. In my first speech to this chamber in 2019, I stood here and declared that I had come here to stand up for the children of my state, to fight every day to ensure we saw a fundamental redraw of the way we fund and deliver early childhood education and care in this country. Now, as a proud member of the Albanese Labor government and with the Malinowskis Labor government leading in South Australia, we are finally on this path. The Albanese government has already committed to significant reforms for early education, including the implementation of an early year strategy, reducing the costs of childcare and supporting the re-establishment of playgroups. And at home, our state Labor government has just this week announced a change in preschool enrolment to allow for mid-year intakes. This means that children turning four between May and October can enrol in the second half of a school year and will no longer have to wait an additional six months to begin preschool, this vital start to school education in our state. Of course, this builds upon our state government's bold commitment towards three-year-old preschool, a vital step in extending the benefits of early learning to all children in our state at the point in time where it will make such a great impact. These sorts of policies change lives they change outcomes and they change our nation fundamentally for the better. And these sorts of policies, these reforms, only ever happen under Labor governments. That's why I am Labor. I've said it before, I'll say it again, I'll keep saying it till you all get sick of it. The first thousand days of a child's life form the building blocks for their future. Every child in Australia deserves access to a fantastic education in their early years regardless of their family lives, which postcode they're in, how much they earn. As long as I have a seat in this chamber, I will never stop fighting for our children's rights to a quality education and for the incredible early learning educators who deliver it. Senator Hanson. Much. This afternoon, the Labor Party will be moving a notice motion to fly the Aboriginal and the Torres Strait flag Islander flag in this chamber. Let me tell you a few facts. A competition was held in 1901 to design the Australian flag announced by Prime Minister Edmund Barton after a request from the British government for a flag to distinguish Australia. Almost 33,000 entries were received, and the panel of five judges actually approved that uh, which winning entry it was. The national anthem was first composed in 1878 by Peter McCormack. That was pr a prominent in the competition for a national anthem initiated by Prime Minister Gough Whitlam in 1973. The Whitlam government polled 60,000 Australians, more than half of which selected Advance Australia Fair. A plebiscite on the anthem was conducted along with the 1977 referendum with four choices. Advance Australia Fair received 43.29 per cent of the vote, far more than any other alternatives. Now the Aboriginal flag this was designed by one individual, Harold Thomas, in 1971. No Australian or government-appointed panel had any chance to comment on the design, and no Australian has ever had the opportunity to vote to approve the Australian flag, the <laughs> Aboriginal flag, I should say, as what happened with our other national flag and anthem. The people should have a choice in this, not this parliament. This is the people's house. It is Order. not the senators to, to decide this, whether the, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flag Order. are flown in this chamber. When you actually put it to voice to the people, I suggest that people leave this chamber. If you have, have got the guts to actually allow the people of Australia to vote whether they want those flags flown, I'm warning people this is divisive. Order. We are one nation, one people, one flag. We are your masters. Time has we are represent Resume your seat. Senator Canavan, you have the call. Uh, thank you. I must give it to the newly elected Labor government. They are already smashing records. Yesterday they broke a major election promise in just their first day at work here in Parliament. That must be some kind of record. 
At the election, the Labor Party promised to cut, and I'm quoting from their own policy, to cut power bills for families and businesses by $275 a year for homes by 2025 compared to today. Yesterday, in the Governor General's address, there was not a mention of the $275 saving at all. Instead, instead there was just a vague commitment to help save families hundreds of dollars on their electricity bills. Where's the 275 gone now? Australians are asking the newly Labor elected, elected, elected Labor government, where is our $275 that you promised? This is a massive broken promise that will hurt Australian families already struggling with crushing increases in the cost of living. Since the election, wholesale power prices have increased by more than four times. Soon, every time you go get a snack at them in the fridge, you'll be shocked by how big that bill is stuck to the fridge with a magnet. Our electricity bills are going up because we have invested too much in unreliable renewable energy. Australia leads the world in investment in renewable energy. Just the other week, our energy regulator, the Australian energy market operator, revealed that Australia has built four to five times more solar and wind energy per person than Europe, the US, Japan or China. The Labor Party's response is to do, let's do more. Let's ignore the higher cons the consequences of this record of shame. They want to increase our renewable energy from just 25 per cent today to 82 per cent in just eight years' time. How is that going to work when the sun, sun sets? We're in a world where the renewable energy investments must continue until morale improves. We're a country blessed with energy resources, with coal, gas and uranium. It is a national disgrace and embarrassment that we export our resources to other nations while our old go cold in winter. It is time to put Australians first. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And, uh, I want to uh, dedicate this first two-minute statement to my new seat partner, a fantastic Indigenous woman, Jana Stewart. And I want to make a contribution about the importance of the Uluru Statement, the statement from the heart, and why now, more than ever, we need to implement it in full and in this term of parliament. Voice, treaty, truth. Reconciliation with our First Nation brothers and sisters is a top priority for this, the Australian Labor-led uh, government by, Minister, by Prime Minister Albanese. And it is rightly so that we focus on this. The statement's a roadmap to equality, to celebration of the First Nations culture to tell the truth about our history, our shared history, to ensure that voices are enabled at the highest levels of government. Closing the gap we talked about for a long time, but it comes only with genuine empowerment and authentic recognition. Without real, meaningful change, we risk condemning generations of Indigenous youths to a future of hopeless uh, of, of, uh, sorry, we, uh, um, to a future without recognition and without hope. We should not try to tinker with this profound statement, as some in this place have recklessly proposed. We should not ignore the statement either, as has been the political decision of others in this place. The sacred links to this land between our First Nations people have not disappeared in so short a span as that which has taken place since British settlement. I sat beside Senator Nova Peris. I signed the book in this place immediately after her, and I sit proudly here with Senator Dodson, Senator Malindiri Order. McCarthy and Senator Jana Stewart. Resume your seat. Senator Steele John, you have the call. Thank you. Abortion is essential health care, and access to these procedures is a fundamental human right. But since the US Supreme Court overturning of the Roe v Wade ruling last month, we have seen in Australia how quickly these rights can be snatched away. Yes, the situation in Australia is different. Abortion is legal, but access to it is far from universal, nor is it guaranteed. In my home state of WA, we have the most restrictive abortion laws in the country. If you want to get an abortion, you first need to seek the approval of two doctors. If you are 20 weeks pregnant, you then have to face a panel of six ethicist doctors who will decide on your behalf 
if the procedure can go ahead. If you are under 16, your parents must be legally informed and must participate in mandatory counselling alongside you. Let us be clear. The, only, the reason for accessing an abortion is no one's business but the person who is seeking it. In WA, abortion is still regulated under the criminal code. What is patently a matter of health care is literally codified as a criminal issue. This is an outrageous state of affairs, as is the lethargy which, which the state government has moved uh, to update the archaic legislation. So our community has taken matters into its own hands, and on Friday an informal coalition will be presenting a petition to Parliament to get abortion out of the Criminal Code and into Order. the Your Public time has Health expired. Act. Senator Scar, you have the call. Uh, Deputy President, on 18 June 2022, I was honoured to attend an event hosted by our wonderful Burmese diaspora in Queensland. The event was held for two reasons. First, to celebrate the 77th birthday on 19 June 2022 of Myanmar State Councillor and Nobel Peace Prize winner Do Aung San Suu Kyi. Second, to call for an end, an end to the violence and a return to democracy in Myanmar. I made a commitment that day to the community that at my first opportunity in this place I would make sure their voice was heard, and I deliver on that commitment today. And I do so in the context of the outrageous execution of four democracy activists in the last week in Myanmar. And I place their names formally on the Hansard record of this place of democracy. The four democratic activists, one who was a legislator, uh, were as follows. P. U. Zaya Tor, Chor Min Yu, La Mi Yu Ang, Ang Thu Ya Zor. Each and every one of them executed by the military junta in Myanmar for simply seeking democracy in their home country. I call for the imposition of additional sanctions by the Australian government commensurate with this outrage. I call for the imposition of Magnitsky sanctions against Myanmar's military junta members and against those individuals associated with this outrageous human rights atrocity. I call in this place for all of us, for each and every one of us, to stand shoulder to shoulder with our Myanmar diaspora to call for an end to the violence, a release of the political prisoners in Myanmar and a return of democracy in Myanmar. Senator Cox, you have the call. The climate crisis if we are still opening up new coal and gas projects. There are currently 114 new coal and gas projects in the investment pipeline, and many of these approvals will be coming across the government's desk soon. The Greens were incredibly disappointed to hear Prime Minister Albanese say that Labor will not be supporting a moratorium on new coal and gas. And now is not the time to be recycling lines from the coalition. Now is the time to be taking urgent action for a safer future for our children. If we open up new coal and gas projects, we will blow our domestic targets and could possibly put at risk the global task of combating climate change beyond reach. Because you actually can't put the fire out if you keep pouring petrol on it. The science is extremely clear. If you don't have a plan to phase out coal and gas, you don't have a plan for the climate emergency. Our communities delivered a resounding mandate on climate action at the last election, and our communities do not want empty promises and platitudes when it comes to the climate. They want coal and gas to stay in the ground. As the Green spokesperson on resources, I promise to fight tooth and nail for a moratorium on new coal and gas across this country. From the Beedaloo Basin in the Northern Territory to Narrabri in New South Wales to Scarborough in my home state of Western Australia, these projects must be stopped. Thank you. Senator Rennick. 
you, Acting Mr Deputy President. Today we had a very high inflation rate, uh, and I, won't, I didn't even bother reading what the number was because it doesn't matter. Ultimately, inflation is, is a product of either too much demand or not enough supply. In this case, we don't have enough supply in this country, and it's a function of about 30 or 40 years of underinvestment in infrastructure. Now, what the RBA is proposing to do to tackle inflation is to rapidly increase interest rates. That is incredibly negligent. Now, anyone that has followed the actions of the RBA over the last couple of decades would know that they have always taken the easy way out and lowered interest rates to zero. That was a very foolish thing to do because it was always going to create the bubble. But what, what's worse is, is now that they have created the bubble, they are going to jack up interest rates way too fast and risk threatening the economy and risk threatening uh, many mortgagees, many young families with mortgages going broke. And we can't have that happen. So how do we deal with inflation? There's two ways to deal with it. The way that the RBA is trying to deal with it is by basically increasing austerity to reduce demand. It is the wrong thing to do. What we need to do is increase productivity by building more infrastructure. And if we build more infrastructure and supply more water, supply more energy, supply all those things that all the families need to live, uh, all our businesses need to, to basically run and operate, that will make us not only more productive, but it will make us more competitive on the international markets. Now, I'm calling on the RBA to look at, in conjunction with Treasury, to look at basically a quantitative easing program designed at building this nation. For too long, paper shufflers have been fiddling around with interest rates, and it's the only policy that we've applied to monetary policy in the last 30 years. The only people that helps are basically speculators and paper shufflers, and it's got to stop. For too long, the paper shufflers have been getting rich in this country at the expense of the hard-working people of Australia. Thank you. Senator Dodson. King Deputy President, I rise today to honour the life and legacy of a great Australian, the late Sir Gerald Brennan. <clears throat> he was the High Court Justice who wrote the lead judgment in Mabo, which led to the Native Title Act of 1993. I was honoured to be asked by, the, by his family to say a few words at his funeral in Sydney in June. I met Jed Brennan many, many years ago, uh, soon after his work with Justice Woodward, uh, which led to the Northern Territory Land Rights Act. Uh, someone said of Jed Brennan that he wrestled with the tension between law and justice. Well do I remember a Sunday uh, afternoon in Melbourne at the home of the late Sir Ronna and Nully Caston, where among others was Sir Ronald Wilson a former High Court Justice himself, and we were discussing the long and torturous pathway of Mabo through the courts. And Sir Ron summed up in his, with his opinion that ultimately Sir Gerald Brennan and his colleagues had listened with their hearts to the truth of the law and justice was the outcome. Injustice and Ill illegality are the foundation pillars of our nationhood on that day were discarded to the wastebasket of history. Gone was the legal fiction that had for centuries justified the legal dispossession of First Nations peoples with all its disastrous effects. The court bequeathed both a gift and a challenge to our nation, and today we are presented with a new gift, the Uluru Statement from the Heart. I know that Sir Jed Brennan would join with me in urging all Australians to accept the generous invitation which the Uluru Statement conveys. Vale, Sir Jed Brennan. Senator Raskin. Mr Acting Deputy President, I wish to, to draw the attention to the, of the Chamber to a significant event held each year in Tasmania at Quercus Park in Carrick, known as AgFest. Proud, passionate and hard-working rural youth volunteers have been organising this event for nearly 40 years. The first AgFest event was held in 1983, attracting 111 exhibitors and 9,000 patrons, but now, recognised as one of the top three agricultural field days held in Australia, AgFest now hosts more than 700 exhibitors and 60,000 attendees each year. This event is run by a volunteer committee of 50 rural youth members and former members with an average age of just 24. The skills they develop by participating in rural youth and as part of the AgFest committee are incredible. It reflects through the long, strong leadership, organisational and stakeholder engagement skills shown on site each year. 
Exhibitors from the agricultural sector and support sectors travel from across Tasmania and mainland Australia to display their products and services at AgFest, and they are well supported by Tasmanians who flock to the site. Usually held at the Carrick site across four days in May each year, the AgFest committee pivoted during the COVID-19 pandemic and introduced an AgFest in the cloud version of the event. That initiative was well supported with one, over 1 million page views in 2020 and 110,000 in 2021. Earlier this year, the 2022 event was deferred from its May date due to COVID restrictions. AgFest in the paddock for 2022 will now be held from the 24th to the 27th of August with an additional week of AgFest in the cloud from the 27th of August. Rural youth volunteers are already planning their event for 2023, which will return again to the early May schedule. I encourage any senators who have an interest in agricultural shows to make their way to Tasmania during AgFest and experience AgFest for yourselves. Thank you. It being uh, 2 p.m., we'll now move to um a few seconds left. Does anyone want to jump? We have 19 seconds. <laughs> Senator Sheldon. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Um, I just want to just recently met with uh, the National Tertiary Education Union and the National Union of Students, and they went through some of the crisis of casual. Thank you, employment. Senator Sheldon. It now being two o'clock, we shall move to question time, and I call Senator Birmingham. Thank you. Uh, thank you, President. It's been a while since I had the opportunity to ask a question. <laughs> President, my, uh, my question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Watt. I refer to the Minister's 15 July announcement of additional technical expertise and support to Indonesia, Timor-Leste and Papua New Guinea. I ask the Minister, have biosecurity officers, departmental officials and non-departmental veterinarians been deployed to Indonesia, and if so, in which provinces? Have vaccines now been provided to Indonesia? Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Watt. Thank you, President. And I thank uh, the Leader of the Opposition for granting me the great honour of receiving the first question on behalf of the incoming <laughs> Albanese government. Uh, and, and I thank him for asking this question because it is a very serious issue. Uh, as, as I have repeatedly stated, uh, both publicly, in the media and in the briefing that I just provided to all MPs, including opposition MPs, about this very serious threat, this is something that the Albanese government is taking seriously. It's worth noting that this outbreak reached Indonesia prior to the election when the former government uh, was in government. Uh, and we, of course, have now become responsible for supporting our friends in Indonesia to manage their outbreak, especially since that outbreak reached Bali. Now, uh, Senator Birmingham has referred to announcements that I have made on behalf of the government as to assistance that we are providing our friends in Indonesia. Uh, that assistance includes one million vaccines for foot and mouth disease, uh, along with a range of technical assistance, such as uh, assistance in rolling out the vaccines, in improving laboratory testing capacity and a range of other measures uh, that the Indonesian government has advised us would be of assistance to them. Uh, we, as I have previously made public, uh, we expect the vaccines to be delivered to Indonesia in August. Uh, they have been ordered. Uh, we expect them to arrive in August uh, as previously announced. Uh, the offer has, as I say, been made to provide technical assistance. I am aware uh, that one of our biosecurity experts has already been liaising with Indonesian authorities, uh, and that assistance will continue to be rolled out in partnership with the Indonesian government. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Birmingham, first supplementary. Thanks, uh, thanks President. Uh, I note the minister has confirmed the government's intention to provide one million vaccinations to Indonesia, uh, but has indicated they will not be provided until August. I ask the minister again have biosecurity officers, departmental officials and non-departmental veterinarians been deployed to Indonesia, and if so, in which provinces? Senator Watt. Thank you, President. Uh, I am aware that not only any veterinarian but our country's chief veterinary officer, Dr Mark Shipp, uh, has personally been in Indonesia cooperating with the Indonesian government 
and their veterinary authorities uh, to offer assistance. Uh, and that is ahead of the deployment of additional expertise. Uh, as some members opposite might know, when in government, when liaising with other governments, it's probably a good idea to do that in partnership with those governments uh, and to work with them in a manner uh, that works on the ground. Uh, so the chief vet was with me during my recent trip to Indonesia, where I met with the Indonesian Minister for Agriculture, along with the head of the Disaster Management Authority. And I expect that the ex extra assistance that we have offered will be deployed as quickly as it possibly can in partnership with Indonesia. Senator Birmingham, second supplementary. Thanks, President. So, President, I, I note that none of the promised vaccinations have been provided to Indonesia yet. Uh, and none of the promised veterinarians or other support officials have been deployed to Indonesia yet. I asked the minister in relation to the aspect of his announcement for additional frontline biosecurity and industry preparedness measures in Australia how many of the 18 new biosecurity officers are currently operational and at which airports. Thank you. Senator Watt. Uh, thanks, President. Before I directly answer uh, Senator Birmingham's question, I want to pick up this point that he keeps making about vaccines. Uh, as, may, as you may be aware, when the Prime Minister visited Indonesia shortly after the election, he made an offer of vaccines to the Indonesian government. At that point in time, they decided, decided as is their sovereign right, uh, that they would obtain those vaccines elsewhere for the time being and would begin a domestic production uh, program around vaccines. We have, of course, since uh, offered a million vaccines that have been accepted, they have been ordered, uh, they will be provided in Indone to Indonesia in August. Uh, and uh, in terms of biosecurity officers, I'll get you the exact number, but my advice is that they have begun being rolled out uh, into airports and mail centres now. While I've got 10 seconds left, I do want to make the point that those biosecurity officers will not only be deployed into airports, they will be deployed into mail centres as well. Uh, because the mail centres are the highest risk we have. Thank you. And uh, order, 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 order. And Senator Watt, Senator Watt, I am clarifying that you've taken a portion of Senator Birmingham's question on notice. Senator McKenz, uh, Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. In May, the Australian people voted for a Labor government with real plans to build a better future. Can the minister update the Senate on how the government is working towards that goal? Senator Wong. Thank, thank you very much, um, uh, uh, President, and thank you to Senator Walsh for the question. Uh, rare to get an interjection on a Dixa, but I know you know it's early days in the process of dealing with the change of government on that side. Um, I, 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 I would say this: um, as we start this new term, uh, you know, I hope all of us in this chamber recognise the privilege that we, with which we have been entrusted in whichever roles we have, uh, and that is no less the opportunity, no less than the opportunity to change people's lives for the better. Uh, and those of us on this side of the chamber understand that good government can do this. Good government can keep us safe. Good government can provide help to those who need it, support when times get tough. And importantly, good government can open the doors of opportunity. Uh, and if you listen to the remarkable first speeches that we've been hearing in the House from such a diverse, fantastic group of uh, new Labor MPs and look forward to, to our new senators as well. Uh, you hear the stories of the extent to which uh, Labor governments have changed people's lives for the better, have enabled opportunities to be opened uh, to people uh, for, 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 for their betterment. You see, good government can enable aspiration. It can enable people to achieve their dreams. So nine weeks ago, Australians did vote for good government. They voted for a better future. Labor's come to office at a time of great uncertainty. And we've got some you know, inheritance from the other side. They might not like to hear it, but it includes a trillion dollars of debt right. from a government that wasted 10 years. It includes rising cost of living. It includes low wages growth, low wages growth. It includes climate change and its develop, develop, de devastating impact. It's devastating impact. 
uh, which they're still having a fight about. Thank you, Senator Wong. Your time has expired. Senator Walsh, first supplementary. How is the Albanese government planning for the future? Senator Wong. Well, thank you, uh, President. Well, Labor's not wasted a day in securing a better future. Uh, we've all for, and one of the reasons, one of the, one of the things that is critical to a better future is, of course, to, to deal with climate change. And I know those opposite are still whirling around in their division on this issue, despite losing so many seats. So many seats. No, no, they're not. They're, well, you lost seats to the Teals. Uh, you know, you lost seats to the Teals. You, you lost, you lost seats to the Teals because the centre of a, mainstream Australia, mainstream Australia, Order. mainstream Australia want action Order. on climate change. Now we have already updated, formally updated, Australia's nationally determined contribution under the Paris Agreement, a 43% reduction in emissions, and we're introducing legislation to make it law. And I'd say this to the opposition and to it, it's not just the right thing to do for our climate, it's an economic opportunity, and Australians understand that. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Walsh, your second supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. How is the Albanese government making sure that nobody is held back and nobody is left behind? Senator Wong. Thank you. Uh, Labor wants, la the Labor Albanese Labor government wants to make sure Australians get the opportunities they deserve. We want to make sure Australians get the opportunities that they deserve. We want to bring people together. We want to unite Australia. Order. Uh, we've announced the Jobs and Skills Summit, and today we're introducing a bill to create Jobs and Skills Australia because we want to make sure Australians can get the skills employers want. And good governments can also make sure that the most vulnerable Australians are not left behind. We know that those in aged care. We know that those in aged care and those officers that really should hang their heads in shame about how this was dealt with. COVID took a devastating toll on Australians in aged care and their families. And we know that aged care was in crisis well before the pandemic struck. I'm unsurprised that the interjections have stopped, because it was a decade of neglect under those opposite. We are beginning Thank you, the Senator work Wong, of fixing your time aged has care. Expired. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries, Forestry, Senator Watt. How many passengers have passed through Australian international airports from Indonesia since the foot and mouth outbreak was reported in Bali on the 5th of July 2022? Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Again, I'm very happy to provide the exact number uh, to the minister. The, um, Order. 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 Wow. Senator Watt, Senator Watt, resume your seat, please. Order. Thank you, Senator Watt. Please continue. I know it hurts. I know it hurts being over there, and I know it's going to hurt for a long time. What? What hurts? You know? No, no. Senator Watt, resume your seat. Order. Please allow the, Senate, the minister to answer the question. Senator Watt. What, what hurts our agriculture industry more, President, uh, is the hysteria that we continue to see on display from the opposition in relation to this uh, very Senator important Watt. issue. Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, thanks, President. There was only one question asked. That was how many passengers have passed through Australian international airports since Indonesia's, in, from Indonesia since the foot and mouth outbreak was reported in Bali. Senator Watt has uh, taken that on notice already. Uh, President, uh, there, uh, it appears now he is moving simply to make political points. He's addressed the question uh, by taking it on notice, and there's nothing further to add, clearly. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Uh, order, I believe. Order. Senator Wong. Uh, well, uh, on that point of order, but I, I, would, I, would, I would observe. I would order. observe. Order. Order. I'm, I have called Senator Wong on a point of order. I'm asking senators to be silent. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, President. Um, I think uh, there is precedent, but obviously you can 
uh, you will take advice from the clerk uh, in the previous parliament, where even if, even if uh, a minister has taken on notice, responding to some of the, the substance of what was put subsequently, he, he's entitled to do that. And that was the practice under the previous government and the previous minister, uh, president. Uh, thank you, Senators Birmingham and Wong. I will remind Senator Watt to uh, address his remarks to the question. He's taken some of it on notice, but he may be able to. He may be able to <coughs> order. Order. Senator Watt, do you wish to raise a point of order, Senator McKenzie? Okay, Senator Watt, please continue. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to check this number to make sure I was getting accurate information to the chamber, and the number is 23,600 air travellers. Senator Watt, 23,600 numbers. Senator Watt, please resume your seat. I would ask all senators, if I am directing a senator or senators to do something in particular, to please do that. I was trying to get Senator Watt to sit down so I could listen to Senator McKenzie's uh, reason for standing up, but I wasn't able to do that because there was too much noise. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, I wanted to raise a point of order, and uh, if it isn't a technical point of order, uh, I'd ask you to rule on this. Mm -hmm. Senator Watt answered the question by taking it on notice. He therefore ended his answer. I would like a ruling from you on this. Uh, Senator Watt, please resume your seat. And when there's silence, I will answer that response. The question was asked about a specific number, which, as you're correct, Senator Watt took on notice, but he's now been supplied with that, and in the same way that other ministers would have, he's now informing the Senate of that number. Senator Watt, please continue. Thank you, President. Uh, as I say, the number of passengers arriving by air from Indonesia last week was 23,600. Of those, 21,948 air travellers were returning from Bali, so about 90 odd per cent. Uh, I think one of the pleasing aspects of this is that the efforts of our biosecurity officers over the weekend. It's a disappointing uh, that the Watt, minute that Senator McKenzie doesn't seat. want. Senator McKenzie? Uh, I'm, I'm just seeking clarification, Chair, sure. Madam President. He gave us last week's Bali numbers. I asked for the passengers from the 5th of July, once the outbreak in Bali was actually uh, notified to Australia. So is he going to take on notice the parts he couldn't answer, or Senator is that McKenzie, his answer? Um, Senator Watt was, I think, answering the question. I don't think he got to the end of it, but I'll entertain. Uh, so let's get him to the end of it and see where we end up. Senator McGrath. I would ask the minister to table the document that he's clearly reading from. Will you table it? And could he table his phone also, please? Thank you. Senator McGrath. Senator Watt, please continue. Well, it's disappointing that senators up want to ridicule such a serious matter. The, 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 the number of passengers. Order. Senator Watt, please. I'm trying to help. Senator I'm trying to give you information. Senator McGrath. I am asking for the minister to table the document. And the minister has agreed to table the, the document. Has the minister agreed to table the document? I didn't hear the minister say. Uh, senators, Have you tabled the document? Senators, order. Senator McGrath, Senator McGrath, please resume your seat. Senator McGrath, I've asked you to sit down. Thank you. I understood, and I will clarify, Senator Watt has agreed to table the document. Senator Watt, please. Uh, resume answering the question. I'll take that request on notice. Uh, but turning to the so to if, if if Senator McKenzie would like the information that she's asked for, I'm happy to provide it. Uh, the week commencing the fourth of July this year, twenty four thousand sorry, twenty thousand four hundred and four passengers returned or entered Australia from Indonesia, ninety two point seven of which a percent of which were from Bali. 23,600 the following week, the week commencing the 11th of July, and the most updated figures that I have uh, are the ones that I've already given. Uh, the pleasing thing about the, the numbers, when you dig into them further, is that we are seeing an increased level of compliance from passengers, which shows that they are listening to the accurate 
non-alarmist information that is being put out by this government, as opposed to the alarmist rhetoric coming from the opposition, which is rejected roundly by industry. Thank you, Senator Watt. Uh, Senator McKenzie, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Of how many of these passengers that have passed through Australian international airports from Indonesia have been treated with disinfected foot mats on arrival? Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Senator Watt. Well, as I, if, if I assume that Senator McKenzie has been following this, and if she has, she would know that the sanitised foot mats started being installed in, in international airports on Monday this week, and that was completed yesterday. I might point out, by the way, uh, that this is the first time in our history that we have seen sanitised foot mats. Uh, put across every international airport in the country. We never saw the former government do this in any airports when there were outbreaks in Vietnam, in China, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, in uh, South Senator Africa White, and every other country. Your seat. Senator McKenzie. Uh, my point of order is on relevance. I was very clear in my question. Uh, now that he's found the numbers of how many passengers from the 5th of July, and I'd also like to thank his staff for that, how many have actually of those Tens of thousands of passengers returning from Bali have actually been treated to not if the mats are rolled out or not. How Thank many you, passengers McKenzie. have actually gone through appropriate biosecurity measures on our borders? Thank you, Senator McKenzie. I'll allow uh, Senator Watt to continue to answer your question. Thanks, President. Uh, it is unfortunate that Senator McKenzie didn't stay for the entire briefing that I just provided to all MPs. If she had done that, she would have heard one of our biosecurity <laughs> officials say that the answer was 100 per cent. 100 per cent of passengers have been walking through sanitised foot mats. The, 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 well. Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Senator McKenzie. I, I thought the questions were very clear, simple, one se sentence apiece. Uh, the question relevance, yes, Madam uh, and President. I've answered that. Senator McKenzie, please resume your seat. Senator Wong. Well, I have... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Senator Wong, please, Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Mackenzie, I've, I understood that you took a point of order on relevance. Thank you. We will allow. No, I've taken your point of order. Please resume your seat. Senator Mackenzie, Senator Mackenzie, I've asked you to resume your seat. Senator Watt, uh, the. The um, question was how many passengers, if you could continue. Well, Thank you. I've answered the question. 100 per cent have done so. Uh, and I might point out, when this outbreak got to Indonesia, the former government put down no sanitised foot mats and had no passengers Senator walking Watt. across them. Absolutely. Senator Watt. Senator Watt. Thank you. Uh, Senators, before I call Senator McKenzie, order. Or Senator McGrath, I will point out that the level of interjection is disorderly, and I would ask you to respect the person answering, asking the question and answering. Senator McKenzie, your second supplementary. Thank you, uh, Madam President. In the 48 hours following the establishment of the biosecurity response zones on, the, on 12 midnight Friday the 22nd of July, how many foot mats were actually operational in Australian international airports for passengers inbound from Indonesia? Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Senator Watt. Well, I've, as I answered in my previous answer, the foot mats were rolled out and installed in every international airport in Australia on Monday and Tuesday this week. Again, I point out that that, is, that compares to zero sanitised foot mats that were Senator ever White. rolled out by the former Senator government White. when there were outbreaks in every Senator number of countries. Senator Watt, I don't want to have to call you five times before you respond. Senator McKenzie is on her feet on a point of order. I expect you to sit down. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Madam President. My point of order is on relevance. I was going to when the biosecurity response zones were actually established at 12 midnight on Friday, the 22nd of July. How many foot mats were actually operational? 
Thank you, uh, Senator McKenzie. I will draw Senator Watt back to the question. And I now have Senator Wong on the point of order. Sorry. Right. Order. Order. Senator Watt, did you wish to pursue? As I understand that, uh, Senator McGrath. Yeah, that's no, that's fair I enough. Will ask you on the on the silent. point of order, uh, and I just on no, on the point of order. As I understand, Senator Mackenzie made a point of order. I'd make this point: a point of order is not a debating point. Senator Mackenzie is at the moment. Yeah, well, you know, that's life. That's life. Uh, we, we, we have our roles in this democracy, don't we? <laughs> we all understand them. Senator McKenzie. Order. Would you like to take a point of order? Then maybe I can have mine. Thank you. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Um, uh, Senator McKenzie is engaging in debating points. Now she's entitled to those points. There's an opportunity for her after the, this to do so, but it is not. It is, not it is not a point of order on relevance to tell the minister that because he's given a different date to the one she's identified in response to the answer that that somehow is not relevant. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Watt, you have 40 seconds remaining. Thank you, Thank you President. Uh, I don't know if I can be any more clear as to when the mats were put down, uh, but I thank, the, I thank Senator McKenzie for bringing to the attention of the chamber one of the, other, one of the f other pioneering measures put in place by this government, which has never been done by any other government in this country, including the former government, and that is the establishment of biosecurity response zones in our international airports. I have repeatedly said that the response of this government has been the strongest biosecurity response we've ever Senator seen. Watt, please resume your seat. Senator McKenzie. The biosecurity response zone Senator was established. McKenzie. How Senator many McKenzie, mats were in order. place? Resume it's your seat. Resume your seat. If you are calling a point of order, you need to be immediate, immediately relevant to that point, not to debate it. So is there a point of order? Thank you, Senator Watt. So as I say, uh, this government is doing more than any government has ever done about any foot and mouth bake outbreak across the country. Sanitised foot mats, biosecurity response bones, more biosecurity officers. You Senator did nothing. Watt, We're the picking time up the slack. Has expired. Thank you. Order. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the Leader of the Government representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. The International Energy Agency has said that not one new coal or gas project can be opened up if we are to stabilise temperatures at one and a half degrees, or even if we are to reach the government's target of net zero by 2050. Will the government continue the Morrison government's policy of subsidising new coal and gas projects with public money? Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Wong. I apologise. I'm a little slow on um, getting the document to the table. Um, uh, can I start? No, it's my arm and a broken shoulder, mate. All right. So how about the joke? Um, uh, can I be clear? I, I do understand that in relation to coal, there is a difference between the Greens political party and others in this chamber, um, uh, and there is a diff difference between a difference between uh, the position the Greens articulate and the position that is adopted by the international community under the UNFCCC, uh, where the contribution of nations uh, to the the the, the, the objective of reducing emissions is predicated on reducing one's domestic emissions. Uh, now, it is the case that under the, the government that we've seen over the last 10 years, we saw 20, I think it was 22 energy policies, none were adopted because obviously there is a strong view within their party room uh, as to um, you know, contesting the issue of climate, which we still say, we still, which we still see. Um, but the, the reality is that the Labor government was elected with a very clear commitment to reduce uh, emissions for Australia 
by 43 per cent by 2030. That is the position we are taking. Um, I know you have raised this issue of moratorium publicly. Uh, it's been your political position for some time. Uh, uh, as I've said publicly, Oh, yes, uh, and yeah, it is a it is a position that the Greens political party have been putting for some time. I understand that is your position. The position of the government is that we will take uh, are taking a far more. Oh, really? Order. <laughs> Order. I love many things, but you know. <laughs> um, uh, Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Waters. Order. Senator Waters. President, um, just a point of order on relevance. The question went to whether or not public funding of new coal and gas mines will continue under this government. Uh, there was also a preamble, so I think um, Senator Wong is being broadly relevant. Senator Wong. As I said, the government's position on, on coal mines is that they will be assessed in accordance with the, with the existing law. Senator Waters, first supplementary. Thanks, President. The burning and extracting of coal and gas is the biggest cause of the climate crisis, which threatens all Australians. Given the first responsibility of government is to keep its citizens safe, why is the government supporting opening 114 new coal and gas projects, which will turbocharge floods and bushfires? Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Wong. The government is being uh, consistent with the commitments it, it took to the election and the commitments uh, that the Australian people were well aware of when they voted uh, in the election, uh, which led to the result um, uh, of a, an Albanese Labor government. We will reduce Australia's emissions by 43 per cent uh, by 2030. It is an ambitious target. It has a range of very positive consequences, uh, including I think it's in excess of 80 per cent, around 82 per cent of our uh, electricity grid will be powered by renewables by the same time. Uh, in relation to uh, those projects, they will be assessed in accordance with uh, the existing environmental, well, with the relevant environmental approval frameworks. And that is also the position the Labor government, the Labor Party took to the last election. I understand this is a political campaigning issue for the, for the Greens. I, I saw that. No, it is. Uh, 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 but, but, and it is not the position of the international community in terms Senator of how Wong, we your operate time has in the UNFCCC. Senator Waters, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Will the government continue the Morrison government's policy of subsidising new coal and gas projects with public money? Senator Wong. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, well, uh, I, I'm unclear as to which, sub to which subsidies um, Senator Waters is. Well, order. Well, uh, I, I'm really tempted to take that in interje interjection, but I, I will not. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure which of the, the sort of the sort of. <laughs> I'm not sure which uh, um, uh, rebate. Uh, arrangement or, or other tax arrangement, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Dep leader, Senate leader of the Greens. Sorry, yes, yeah, that's right. Leader of the Greens in the Senate is, is order, order, no, I'm just order. Senator Wong, please continue. Uh, thank you, President. Um, I'm not sure to which um, the uh, Greens leader is referring to, uh, and if she wants to. Uh, indicate to me uh, you know, a particular rebate that she, she's asking whether the government has a view about. Uh, I, I, I will certainly refer that to the Treasurer. Thank you, I would Wong. anticipate that the expired. answer is unlikely. Senator Sheldon. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister update the Senate on the latest inflation data that was released today? Sorry, Senator Gallagher. Thank you, President. Uh, thanks, Senator Sheldon, uh, for the question. Um, today's ABS release of the Consumer Price Index for the June quarter 2022 has um, shown that inflation has increased by 6.1 per cent over the past year, 1.8 per cent in the June quarter, and it reinforces the difficult cost of living challenge for Australian <coughs> households. Today's news will be very confronting to many, many households around the country who are already uh, feeling the pinch of finding extra dollars for the increasing costs of living. 
Now, we've been up front uh, with Australians since moving into government. Uh, we inherited a very challenging set of economic circumstances, uh, rising inflation, rising interest rates, low wage growth and nine years of uh, failed policy agenda, in, in, particularly in the area of energy, but we <coughs> no doubt through the course of question time we'll be able to list uh, many more of those failures. But this is the major economic challenge uh, facing the new government. It will be challenging for households and in the months ahead, but we are determined, working hard every day, to look at ways to ease pressure on households, rise, uh, ensure that household in, uh, income, incomes can keep up with some of those rising costs. Today's data shows that the most significant rises were in new dwelling purchases by owner-occupiers, 5.6 per cent, and in fuel, 4.2 per cent, and furniture at 7 per cent. Annual trimmed mean inflation increased to 4.9 per cent. Australians know inflation is high and getting higher. They feel it every day and they don't need the OBS uh, data set to tell them that. They see it when they are in the supermarket, when they're filling the car up or when they're paying their bills. The difficult reality is inflation is uh, predicted to get worse before Thank it you, gets Senator better. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Your time has expired. Senator Sheldon, first supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, what are some of the factors contributing to higher inflation in recent months and what can be done to tackle inflationary pre uh, pressures? Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President, and I thank Senator Sheldon for the supplementary. There are a number of factors contributing to higher prices and increasing inflation. Obviously, some of these are international, such as Russia's invasion of Ukraine hitting uh, grain and oil prices and China's COVID suppression strategy hitting supply chains, which any of us who have engaged with business or indeed uh, tried to engage business um, in the last um, year or so understand the impact that those um, effects of, on the supply chains are having. Uh, there are domestic pressures, though, as well, so natural disasters like floods and the new COVID waves here in Australia. All of this is having an impact. And, and those are really unavoidable to a certain degree. But there are other areas, I think, where nine years of policy failure from the previous government has left us exposed. Has left us exposed. I'll give you three before I sit down. Energy, energy, skills, and suppressing wages. Thank None you, of Senator that's Gallagher. Senator Sheldon, second supplementary. Thank you. Can the minister? Can the minister outline what the government is doing to help ease the cost of living pressures for Australians? Senator Gallagher. Thank you. Thank you. I know, I know you're all going to listen in absolute silence. <laughs> Australians know that high and rising inflation has been made worse by the decade of wasted opportunity and bad government from those sitting over there. The Albanese government's economic plan is a direct response to the economic problems left to us. Order. High and rising inflation, flatlining productivity. I can get louder seat. and louder if they get louder and louder. Thank I have, you. Resume to. Your I have seat. to. Resume your seat. I would ask that senators listen in a much quieter manner. There is a fair amount of disorderly noise in the chamber. Senator Gallagher. Thank you. Um, thank you, President, for that protection. Our plan includes cost of living relief in the form of cheaper childcare, cheaper medicines, our plan on cleaner and cheaper energy to put downward pressure on power prices. This really is the most symbolic policy failure, I think, of this government was 22 failed energy policies, an energy crisis at the point that the, uh, the government was changed because of your failure, and households have paid for that. They have paid for that with rising costs, and we want to put downward pressure on all of those costs and be honest with households. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Your time has expired. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam President. Before my time starts, I'd like to seek leave to obtain your clarification on a matter. Uh, is leave granted? I, I believe leave is granted, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam President. The behaviour we've seen this afternoon in question time shows complete disrespect for the people of Australia. I've been told by both sides of parliament that it's about theatrics. We're here as representatives of the people, not as entertainers. Could you please clarify, Madam President, your expectations as president and your powers to do something about this, or do we simply rely on the senator's respect for the people? 
Thank you, Senator Roberts. Order. Order. Senators gave Senator Roberts an opportunity to seek leave to ask a clarification. Please listen for the answer. As many other presidents before me have uh, you know, expressed the desire for senators to listen in an orderly fashion and to not be too rowdy in their responses, I will continue to do the same and I will do my utmost to keep the chamber fairly orderly during question time. Thank you, Senator Roberts. And your question is? My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Senator Watt. Thank you for your briefing this, this afternoon, Senator Watt, on foot and mouth disease. Minister, if foot and mouth disease does enter Australia, the short-term response would be to start vaccination. Now, Food and Safety Australia and New Zealand says vaccines are safe for human consumption. So having said that, Australia owns foot and mouth disease vaccines located in the United Kingdom. How many vaccines does Australia own in the United Kingdom? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, Senator Roberts, and I'm pleased you were able to come along to that briefing. The feedback I had was that it was very informative for the members who attended. Um, the, and we are, we are approaching this in a bipartisan manner, and we would welcome the opposition joining us in that, as I know you are, Senator Roberts. Um, just to pick you up on one point, the if order, order. Senator Watt. Thank you, President. Uh, just to pick you up on one point, uh, if, God forbid, foot and mouth disease were to enter Australia, despite the measures that we are putting in place, um, we have a well-developed plan known as the Ausvet Plan, which is prepared between the federal government, states and territories about how we respond to biosecurity outbreaks. Biosecurity outbreaks are managed and led by state governments with the support of federal governments. Uh, and we've seen that occur in relation to the varroa mite uh, outbreak recently where we've been supporting the New South Wales government. Uh, the point about vaccines is that the biosecurity advice that I have received is that we would not immediately vaccinate uh, all livestock or even a large segment of livestock immediately in Australia. And that's because, and that's because Order. if you vaccinate your, your livestock, it's unfortunate that the opposition don't want to understand and listen to the measures of preparing for the outbreak. The reason you don't Order. vaccinate Senator Roberts is that you are then deemed by the rest of the world as having foot and mouth disease, and that is what then prevents the export of our product overseas. It's effectively the same as having the outbreak here when you vaccinate. The idea would be that you, in the first instance uh, you would uh, impose a 72-hour livestock standstill. Uh, to measure, to, to limit the movement of animals, and only if the outbreak uh, got further would you consider vaccines. My advice, and I'll get this checked, is that we have approximately one million vaccines available to us on a stockpile, and they are available within one week's notice. Thank you, Senator Watt. Uh, Senator Roberts, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Minister, we have 25 million cattle and 2.5 million pigs. How is one million enough? Senator Watt. Thank you, President. Well, as I say, uh, Senator Roberts, the first move, should we have an outbreak here, is not to just run out and vaccinate every head of cattle, every head of sheep, uh, pigs or goats across the country, or buffaloes for that matter. Uh, what we would actually do is to control, try to control the outbreak in the localised area that it is so that it didn't spread further afield. If it did spread further afield, that's when we would look to vaccinations as an alternative. Uh, it is not the only alternative that we would have, but it is certainly one. And we would be able to access other vaccines at very short notice. What we are actually prioritising in relation to the supply of vaccines at the moment is providing them to Indonesia. And the reason we're doing that is because if we can bring that outbreak under control in Indonesia, that is not only in their national interest, it is in our national interest. Uh, we have continued to have very productive discussions with the Indonesian government about what other vaccines and other assistance that we can provide. Uh, but my priority right now is keeping the, vac is the, keeping the disease out, and that's why we want to support the vaccine rollout in Thank Indonesia. Thank you, Senator Watts. Uh, Senator Roberts, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Why are these vaccines not already in Australia? We're one of the largest cattle and related product producers in the world. Speed of response is critical to protecting our biosecurity. Why are these not being brought to Australia now as a precaution? Senator Watt. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Uh, as I say, uh, vaccination is not the first measure that you would undertake if there was an outbreak, but there are a couple of other reasons for why we haven't got those vaccines here now. 
the first of which there are sometimes issues about the bringing in of live virus into a country, and the responsible members of the opposition understand this. Uh, in, uh, in addition, though, we don't necessarily know what strain of the disease we would have in Australia, and we want to make sure that the vaccines that we obtain will actually be effective for the strain of the, of the virus that we would get if we were to get it. Uh, in, in fact, some of the technical support that we have uh, started providing to Indonesia it was actually to help them diagnose the strain of virus that they had so that we could then go out and procure the vaccines that would deal with that particular strain. There's no point sending vaccines to people if they don't work for a particular strain of the virus, and we would need a little bit of time to diagnose the strain that we have here in Australia so that we could then very quickly obtain the correct uh, uh, vaccines to deal with the version of the virus that we got. Thank you, Senator Watt. Uh, Senator, Senator Cash. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Watt. At a press conference on the 5th of June this year, the Prime Minister declared, this is a government that I lead that will be consultative, that will work with business. There's a new show in town. What consultation did the minister have with the construction industry and or the Australian Building and Construction Commission prior to and in relation to the SNAP announcement on Sunday, the 24th of July 2022, that the ABCC in its powers will be pulled back to the bare legal minimum as of yesterday. Thank you, Senator Cash. Senator what? Thank you, uh, President. Now, I did a fair amount of preparation for question time, and I anticipated the kind of questions that I might receive from the opposition. But never in my wildest dreams did I hope that I would get a question from Senator Cash about lawlessness and the rule of law when it comes to industrial relations. But there you go. There you go. We've had it. Now, it is well understood that this government consulted prior to the election about its, uh, its, uh, its policy in relation to the ABCC. What is also well understood about the ABCC is, is that it has been an utterly ineffective uh, organisation. Please uh, resume your seat. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I rise on a point of order in relation to direct relevance. The question was quite specific. It was not in relation to the abolition of the ABCC. It was in relation to the announcement on insiders on Sunday, the 24th right, of Cash, July. Senator Cash, the practice is not to repeat the question. I've, it is I've, a very concise yep. question, Thank you Madam very much. President, and the minister uh, Cash, is in no way you. being Please directly your relevant. Seat. You used the words in your uh, initial part of your question as consultative uh, with business, and then you went specifically to the ABCC. And Senator Watt is, I think, presently describing the consultative piece, so I think he is being broadly relevant, but I shall continue to listen carefully. Thank you, Senator Watt. Thank you, uh, President. As I say, I don't think that it could have come to any surprise of anyone in the building industry or anyone in the opposition that this government's agenda was to abolish the ABCC. And why is that? That is because we have seen a gross waste of taxpayers' funds prosecuting workers for stickers on their helmets and flags on their work site. This organisation has spent nearly $500,000 pursuing Lend-Lease over Order. the display of Eureka Senator flags. Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And again, in relation to direct relevance, it is very clear that the minister is not going anywhere near the actual question. The question, as I stated, was yes, in I relation to question, a Senator specific Cash. announcement on a specific day that came into effect yesterday. Thank you, in Senator relation Cash. to your previous ruling, if that is to stand, I would ask you to review it tonight and report back to the uh, chamber Senator tomorrow. Senator Cash, please resume your seat. I can't um, direct the minister to answer your questions. I can ensure that the minister is relevant to the points that you've outlined in your question. And I believe that uh, Senator Watt is being relevant. I am listening carefully, and if he's not being relevant, I will draw him back to the broad basis of your question, which went to consultation, business, the construction industry, and the ABCC. Senator Watt. 
Thank you, President. As I said at the outset of my answer, uh, there was wide consultation across the industry before the election about the, about the policy. And I understand, I understand it may Order. come as a shock to Senator people in Watt. Australia to have a government that delivers on its election promises because of sort of Senator Watt, cash. Please resume your seat. Order. Order. You, order. You are being disorderly. Please allow the minister to continue to answer the question. Senator Watt. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, President. As I say, it may come as a shock to the people of Australia to have a government that delivers its election promises, because of course that stands in great contrast to the former government, one of whose leaders was Senator Cash, who promised an independent corruption commission and never got around to doing it. Uh, Unlike Watt, that, we are delivering on our Senator promises. Watt. Senator Brockman. President, on direct relevance. There have been repeated rulings of this place, which you know very well, which say that the minister should not use the opportunity to attack those opposite. That is exactly, uh, that is ex exactly you, what the minister is doing. And I, thank Senator Wong, order. Uh, Senator Brockman, <laughs> please resume your seat. Thank you. Please resume your seat. Senator White, I would remind you to come back to the, broad, uh, to the question that uh, Senator Cash asked. Mm. Thank you, Senator Walt. Thank you, President. As I say, we, we have widely consulted about our policy. We went to the election saying that we would do, do the policy. We are now delivering our policy. And as I say, I for one am shocked that Senator Cash, of all people, would come in here, Order. ask questions about workplace Order. laws and workplace lawlessness, when she— Please resume your seat. Senator McGrath, sorry, Senator Cash, please resume your seat. I'll come back to you. Senator McGrath, you are constantly interjecting in a very loud manner to the point that I have to keep sitting the minister down. I would ask you to refrain from doing that. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, Madam President. And again, in relation to a point of order on direct relevance, again, I did not ask a question about the Labor Party's decision to abolish the ABCC. I asked a very specific question in relation to a very specific decision that came into force yesterday. And again, uh, in relation you, Cash, you are to now your previous to your ruling, question. Uh, thank you, Madam President. In relation to your previous rulings, I would ask you to reconsider them and report back to the Senate tomorrow. Thank you, Senator Cash. I don't intend at this point to review my rulings. I have asked Senator Watt to be direct. Your question um, contained the words consult and business, and that is what uh, Senator Watt was just outlining when I had to sit him down because of the disorderly nature of the Senate, and then I entertained your point of order. So Senator Watt was being directly relevant about the consultation. Senator Watt. Thank you, President. Now, as I say, uh, I'm, I'm heartened that all of a sudden Senator Cash thinks that consultation is important or giving pe people a heads up is important. I don't remember her or her office giving the AWU a heads up before they leaked the, media ra the, the police raid on their offices. Senator, I don't remember Senator them giving Watt. the AFP a heads up Senator before Watt. they leaked their raid to the media and put Senator those police Watt. officers in danger. Just a moment, Senator Brockman, please resume your seat. Senator McGrath, I have specifically called you out for being disorderly, and you've completely ignored me and continued to be disorderly. I would ask you to respect my ruling when I ask you to just tone it down a slight de decibel or two. Senator Brockman. Point of order on direct relevance. Senator Minister Watt is clearly ignoring your instruction to return to the question. Senator Brockman, he is not. He is being directly relevant. Thank you. Senator Watt, please resume. Your five seconds. Thank you. Uh, I am advised that since the election there has been further consultation uh, with the National Workplace Relations Consultative uh, thank Council. Thank you, Senator Watt. Your time has expired. Senator Cash, first Thank you, uh, Madam President. A supplementary question. In relation to the announcement on Sunday, what consultation did the minister have with the CFMMEU, the ACTU and or any other union prior to and in relation to that announcement. Thank you, Senator Cash. Senator Watt. Uh, well, of course, I will have to take the specific question on notice, not being, well, not being, the, not being the minister. Well, it's not my portfolio. I've been a little busy on foot and mouth disease. No, no, no. Order. What I do know, what I do know, 
is that since the election, since the election, there has been further consultation about our policy to abolish the ABCC with the National Workplace Relations Consultative Council, Order. which not only includes unions but includes business representatives. It includes the Small Business Council and Master Builders, among other uh, organisations, the Australian Industry uh, Group as well. Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Cash. Again, on a, po a point of order in relation to relevance, the minister has taken the question on notice. He has advised the chamber. He is not the relevant minister and, as such, needs to consult with the relevant minister. In relation to Your any further commentary, is it is not relevant. in relation— I said that up front. All right, thank and you. Please will resume your seat. That. Thank you. Senator Wong. Thank you, President. Well, on the point of order, I make the same point of order that I made earlier, mm -hmm. that the point of order that the deputy leader of the opposition has made is erroneous. Uh, it is not correct that when a minister uh, takes part or some of a question on notice that that minister cannot then address substance of the question. Uh, and that has been consistent. And maybe Senator Brockman might wish to stand up and confirm that that is the case if he wishes to engage in a point of order's the case. Um, but uh, uh, the, the point of order is, is misconceived. Thank you, Senator Watt. Uh, just a moment, Senator Cash, please resume your seat. Uh, the substance of the question, as has been referred to by the Leader of the Government, is actually in relation to the specific announcement on Sunday. It is not a wide-ranging um, substance. Cash, uh, it is the announcement Senator on Cash, Sunday. If you, have, um, if you have a point, uh, Senator Wong, if you have a point of order, please make it to me and not to Senator Wong, but I'm assuming you are talking about relevance. My understanding thank you. Um, I understand that uh, Senator Wong uh, Senator Watt can continue to be directly relevant to the question you've asked. He's taken uh, some of it on notice and explained well, he's taken the substantive nature of it on notice and explained that he is not the, the actual minister. Senator Watt, if you wish to continue. Thank you, uh, President. Now, I know the concept of consulting unions, again, is something that is foreign to the opposition, something that they never did in government. But um, unlike, Senator Watt, unlike, please, unlike the, the opposition, this government consults both business and industry groups and unions. We see that there is a place for both in the workplace relations system. And that's why, as I say, my, the advice I've received is that we have continued to consult the National Workplace Thank Relations you, Council Watt, since the election. Senator time has expired. Senator Cash, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Does the minister believe that the courts were wrong when they found the CFMMEU were in breach of industrial laws on the 80 occasions the ABCC brought an action against the union and were successful? Is he questioning the independence of our judiciary? Senator Watt. Um, thank you, President. Well, unlike Senator Cash, I never question the independence of our judiciary, and I don't grossly politicise judicial-type bodies like Senator Cash did among her colleagues with the AAT, for instance. We do believe in an independent judiciary, and I have no reason to disagree with any decision of any court. Uh, I, but, but what I do know, again, is that I am absolutely gobsmacked that Senator Cash, of all people, would come into this chamber and talk about lawlessness, the rule of law and compliance with the law, when her office infamously leaked a police raid uh, on the Senator AWU Watt. and was Senator caught. Watt. Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Birmingham. Pre Pre President, a point of order on a matter of relevance. Understanding orders are very clear about the need for direct relevance. Senator Watt, on this occasion, is straying well beyond any relevance to the question that was posed. I'll remind He's the senator. clearly reflecting Thank upon you. another senator in this place and reflecting upon actions of a previous government not being right. relevant. Thank to you, this Senator question. Birmingham. I'll remind uh, Senator Watt to be directly relevant to the question, which was about the judicial system and the CFMEU. I'll, I'll leave it for you to rule, uh, President, but I, I think that I was directly relevant to the initial question. Uh, and, and as I say, all I can say is that. Of every single person over on that side, and I know there's not as many as there used to be, there is no one less qualified to talk about the independence of the judiciary, about the rule of law or about lawlessness than Senator Cash. She became notorious across this country for ignoring the rule of law, Senator for, for her office leaking police information Senator to the media. Watt. Senator Birmingham. Again, President, 
Thank Senator you. Watt is reflecting uh, on another senator in this place. Uh, Senator Watt uh, is not being relevant to the question which relates to the actions of the ABCC on 80 occasions successfully uh, bringing proceedings and it's not to court. Appropriate, he is making Senator general Birmingham reflections. To repeat the question. I wasn't repeating I, the whole question. I understand President. your point is on relevance about the answer that, se that Senator Watt is giving, and that's what I'll consider. Thank you. Senator Wong. Uh, on the point of order, if the assertion uh, is that there have been reflections on a senator, uh, Senator Cash has an uh, opportunity under the standing orders to remedy that, and if she wishes to you know, take that, uh, we'll be very happy to facilitate that discussion. Thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, no, thank Sit down, please, Senator, Senator McGrath. Senator McGrath, please resume your seat. Please resume your seat. Please resume your seat. Senator McGrath, please resume your seat. Thank you. Rich. So I'm going to go to the point raised by Senator Birmingham on the issue of direct relevance. And um, if Senator Watt was straying, and I think he was, he does need to be directly relevant. Senator McGrath, if your point of order, and I would appreciate it in future when I ask you to sit, to sit. I made no uh, decision back to you whether I would entertain your point of order or not. If your point of order is different to that, I would ask you to raise that now. I would like Senator Watt, on the point of order, to withdraw the comment that he made about Senator Cash. Thank you, Senator McGrath. That is not, um, he made no assertion directly about the Senate. Senator Watt. Well, may I seek clarification? Order. Is the, is the item that you would like me to withdraw that there is no one less qualified uh, on your Watt, side to talk Senator about lawlessness? Watt. Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Senator McGrath. Order, order, Senator Wong. Um, I, I am unclear because uh, of what is being sought, and if Senator Cash is asking for a withdrawal, uh, I appreciate Senator McGrath's point. He doesn't want the position, um, the words of, to which he's reacted, repeated. But I, I don't actually know which allegation, which point you want withdrawn. The general approach I would like us to take is if people wish something to be withdrawn, uh, unless there are very compelling reasons not to, that, that as a matter of courtesy in this chamber we should do so. So, but I, I'm genuinely unclear as to which. You know, there's a lot of no, there's a lot of there's a lot of Order. political argy bargy. Some things have been said by the senator behind you which I have ignored. So Thank if, you, if, if, Wong, if the Senator Cash ask... wishes something withdrawn uh, as a matter of courtesy, I'll ask the minister to do so. But I... Thank you, Senator Wong. And I will ask Senator Watt, uh, one, not to repeat comments you made, but if you believe that you made comments um, directly related to Senator Cash, then I would ask you to consider to withdraw those. I withdraw. Thank you. And you have 11 seconds remaining. Thank you, uh, President. The as I say, this government makes no apologies for consulting both unions and business about important workplace relations reforms. The former government did it, didn't do it. They don't understand the need yeah, to do thank so. Thank you, Senator White. Your time has expired. Senator Wong. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Thank you. I would ask honourable senators to please leave the chamber if they are not attending to business. I wish to give the call to Senator Brockman. Just... Yeah. Yeah. 
Are there any notices? Sorry, are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Brockman. Yes, I move to take note of answers by Senator Watt. Surprise, surprise. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy President. Congratulations on the new role. Well, government hasn't been in power long. Obviously, the minister hasn't been in power very long, and they face a huge challenge to the agricultural sector. Probably one of the most significant challenges, threats to the agricultural sector that we have seen in this country for a very, very long time. And the response so far has been wanting. It's been confused, it's been weak, it's been untimely. We have seen a government that has not reacted in the way that the agricultural sector of Australia, and particularly the agricultural sector of my home state of Western Australia, would have want a government to react. And we've heard some comments in Western Australia recently from the state Labor Agriculture Minister. And here were her comments in the West Australian from just a few days ago. I know this isn't the line that the newspapers want to hear, but we've got to keep this in perspective. The most serious threat to Australian agriculture in probably my lifetime, and we have to keep it in perspective. We're not going to see our cattle industry decimated. This is from a state Labor agriculture minister. We are not going to see our cattle industry decimated. We'll still have a domestic industry, she said. We'll still have a domestic industry. M meat, meat and milk might actually become cheaper. This is what the state Labor minister said. And it's not going to, she said, it's not going to stop milk or meat being available to us. Some people might actually argue it makes it cheaper because there'll be more of it available domestically. This is what a state Labor minister said. And this is someone that this minister, Minister Watt, is relying upon to work with. In fact, he stated today, he stated today that it was the states who have the principal responsibility in this area. The states have the principal responsibility. He's washing his hands of responsibility. He's, he's giving the responsibility to the states. And what have we heard from the state Labor minister in Western Australia? That it's not going to decimate the cattle industry. In fact, it might actually make milk, milk and meat cheaper. Now, she's repudiated these words, as she should have. As she should have. She's been repudiated by her state premier, as she should have as she should have been repudiated, as she should be repudiated by all, including all in this place. And I stand right beside my good friend, the member for O'Connor in the other place, Rick Wilson, who called for her resignation, and she should absolutely resign. Walking away from these statements from an agriculture minister is not enough. It is not enough to say that foot and mouth disease won't decimate uh, our industry and then just to apologise and carry on. This is a industry that is so fundamental to the agricultural sector of my home state of Western Australia. It's so fundamental to the agricultural sector of the entire Australia. It's, it's fundamental to our economy. Foot and mouth has been estimated as costing our economy $80 billion over 10 years. $80 billion. It would decimate our trade if it was found in this country, decimate our trade uh, across the globe. Uh, it would severely damage our major export industries. The dairy industry of Victoria, uh, obviously the north, the north of Australia, exports so much uh, uh, meat, particularly in Queensland. Uh, it would decimate our sheep industry. And yet we have Labor ministers, Labor ministers of the Crown, saying that, oh, it's not to be worried about. It might make meat and milk cheaper. I mean, this is an absolute disgrace. No idea. The, the, the Labor Minister in Western Australia should resign. She should resign immediately. And we need ministers who will actually stand up for agriculture. We need ministers who will stand up for agriculture in this place. And sadly, in the effort we've seen today from the current minister, we do not have that. We have a weak, ineffectual minister who is reacting and reacting slowly to an existential crisis for our livestock industries. I, oh, order, raff, order, Senator Cohn. Should I go, 
Senator McKenzie. Left. Senator McKenzie, please restrain yourself. Senator Sakane, please restrain yourself. Senator Brockman. Those obvious, those obvious are clearly going to defend this insipid response, and they will come to regret that. Uh, Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy President, and congratulations on your elevation. <laughs> that was such. An, that was an extraordinary re uh, response in uh, from a senator who stood up and and characterised the response by this government, a Labor government. I'll just say that again because I really like the, to hear it. A Labor government. Um, uh, uh, characterised uh, the response by uh, a Labor government as lacking. When there's a response by the minister, a very capable minister. In fact, it's been a long time. It's been a long time that since we've had a capable agricultural minister. A response that's coordinated, a quick response, coordinated response, and a comprehensive response. And not only that, but we had Minister Watt in here today responding to questions directly. And quite frankly, they were uh, questions that were asked from senators that didn't take the issue seriously. They weren't taking the issue seriously. This is a serious issue. It's an issue that uh, the Albanese Labor government takes um, seriously, and that's why we introduced some of the toughest biosecurity measures ever used in Australia. The minister, the minister, the Senator McKenzie, someone, Senator McKenzie, a please. senator that keeps interdicting, that talks, as far as I can see, is the. Um, What's been put in the media that she's talking about going down to, and washing feet? I'm not sure what she, why uh, that she thinks that that's some so, sort of uh, good response. But the, the the minister outlined quite clearly what has been happening, and 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 for the benefit of the the minister, the senator's opposite, I will go through. Um, some of the responses that have been put in place, but it is a coordinated uh, and comprehensive response. In fact, as the minister has said, um, the responses and the, um, uh, the initiatives that have been put in place are the most comprehensive uh, ever seen in Australia. And that's because the Albanese Labor government take the issue of foot and mouth disease very seriously, and to be honest, I, it is a, a, it's a sad, sad day when the very first question time by the new opposition um, comes with questions that showed their lack of real interest, only uh, interested in political point scoring, when th the issues around foot and mouth disease pose real and serious risks to Australia. So with the Labor government has introduced the toughest biosecurity measures ever used in Australia. And we, the minister has um, been very effective in, his, um, in the rollout of measures to combat um, um, foot and mouth disease, but also in his discussions um, with the in Indonesian um, government. So, the, so, as the minister has talked about, we are um, providing uh, at least one million doses to Indonesia um, for their foot and mouth vaccination program. We have uh, put together a $14 million biosecurity package to, um, for Australia's freight line defence and providing more technical support for countries currently battling foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease. And as the minister also indicated in, in his response, there are over foot and mouth disease are currently uh, are in over 70 countries. So you, what, we, what, the, um, what the opposition should be doing is they should be joining. In fact, they should be um, supporting it, they should be supporting the minister in, in his work because what the minister has actually done is put together a very comprehensive um, 
a set of measures that have been rolled, rolled, rolled out throughout since the. Um, and of course, the foot and mouth disease did reach uh, um, Indonesia prior to the, uh, the election being held. But you couldn't get a better response than what has been put together and rolled out by the minister on behalf of the Albanese Labor government. Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy President. Uh, well, as a senator proudly uh, uh, um, ensconced in Rockhampton, the nation's beef capital, this is a, an extremely uh, important issue uh, to talk about. Uh, because uh, uh, if there were to be an outbreak of foot and mouth disease, let's very much hope that does not happen. But if there were to be, there probably would not be a town in Australia more affected than my home town of Rockhampton. And, and I must say, talking to the graziers in uh, the Fitzroy Basin, there's a lot of concern that this government does not have uh, the proper focus on this issue. Uh, they are very concerned about the knee-jerk and haphazard response over the past uh, few weeks, where at one point uh, foot mats uh, were, were, were ineffective and no ne not needed, and then just days later they were going to be rolled out everywhere, and we're still waiting for them. And it's not just those anecdotes or my political points here uh, that, are, that, are, that are confirming this lack of confidence. It's the market itself, the market has no confidence uh, in this minister, no confidence in this new government. Indeed, in the first week, uh, the week that the barley outbreak was uh, exposed, the first week of July, the, the price for the Eastern Young Cattle Indicator, that's a, basically a benchmark price for cattle prices across Australia, it sat, it sat at $11.18 per kilogram, a very good price, a very, very good price, mind you. But in just the two weeks since then, it is now down below $9 at 8.92 a kilogram, a 20% drop in two weeks, a confirming uh, a vote of no confidence in this minister. And it's not just the drop to 8.92. Look, 8.92 is still a very, very good price, a very fantastic price. All cattle producers pretty much will be making money at $8.92, but, but. It's on a vertical drop right now, that price, and we need that to be halted. We need that curve. That we need to bend that curve back, uh, and so we don't get prices back down to the levels we saw 10 years or so ago during the drought and, dare I say, the live export ban. And for that, we need this government to wake up and deliver on their promises to show the Australian people and the Australian cattle industry that they are, they have got this, that they have got their eyes focused on this. The Prime Minister hasn't been, hasn't been across this. He's been overseas and has not been across domestic issues. He's refused calls for him to take charge of this issue, given the consequences for this country and regional areas in particular that would be hurt, and he is not helping out. Now, today's contribution from Minister Watt uh, does not help this lack of confidence. It does not help at all, unfortunately. Hopefully it'll be better tomorrow. It was his first day today. I suppose we all get a bit of slack on our first day, uh, but he, he couldn't even answer basic questions on basic numbers put by my colleague Senator McKenzie, who asked how many passengers have come through uh, from Indonesia in the last few weeks. You'd think, if you were concerned and focused on this issue, you'd have that number at the top of your head. And indeed, I do remember the colleagues other, uh, on the other side being very critical of ministers who did not, did not have significant numbers at the top of their head. But he didn't know that. He didn't know that. He took it on notice. It was one of uh, many questions he took on notice. Indeed, later on in question time, he took the, he took the not my job excuse. Uh, it's not my job. I don't have these answers. So not my job, Murray, is not across his brief and is not giving confidence to the Australian cattle industry, to the Australian people, that they are responding appropriately to this issue. And look, I do appreciate the briefing that was put on earlier today by Minister Watt and the government. There was a lot of good information there. The takeaway I, I had, though, is that I, what I'm concerned is that this minister and this government is putting too much faith in the advice they're given, giving and not providing appropriate scrutiny of that. Again, it's their first day. It's uh, Murray's first go here as a sorry, Senator Watt, as his first go as a minister, and and I don't think he understands that your job is not just uh, to to. Uh, enact the advice you're given from your departments and agencies. They're well-meaning, they're good people, but they often have to protect their own advice, their own history. They're not necessarily going to give you a 100 per cent account of what's going on the ground. Because what I hear quite often from the government right now is that, well, we're told that there's mats everywhere. We're told that everybody's being checked. Uh, at, the, at the briefing uh, at the, today, you're saying 100 per cent of people, I'm told 100 per cent of people are fine, and yet we continue to get stories from actual people who come in from Indonesia, coming in from overseas, and there's nothing at the airports, there's nothing there. 
Now, something's wrong. Either these people contacting us are lying, or maybe, just maybe, the advice that's being pushed up through the public service is not quite 100 per cent accurate uh, and truth tested to what's going on on the ground. So I'd hope, one thing I would hope after this searing experience for the new minister, uh, Watt, that he goes away and tries to ground check uh, exactly what is going on in airports. Would this is nice? so, so serious for our country. Uh, we cannot just sit back. Uh, and take every piece of advice we get. We have to have scrutiny. We have to hold them to account here in this place. That is our job. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. And I uh, thank the opposition for their questions uh, to Senator Walsh on uh, the very serious uh, foot and mouth uh, outbreak uh, in Indonesia. Uh, and the Albanese government is taking this threat uh, extremely seriously, very seriously, uh, just as Australian travellers are as well. Uh, what we are doing uh, is we are taking the very best advice on managing uh, this risk uh, and the very best advice on protecting Australia, uh, Australia's trade as well. Uh, and we're very grateful uh, to those travellers who are understanding the seriousness uh, of the disease and complying with the measures that we're putting in place. Uh, we're very grateful to Australians for understanding the seriousness of this disease, which seems to be more than we can say about uh, than those on the opposition benches. Uh, those on the opposition benches have demonstrated today that they seem to have been uh, infected with something themselves, uh, and that is a dose of absolute hysteria on this issue. They have been infected with a dose of confected hysteria on this issue. Let's talk about, let's talk about the opposition's response to this issue. We've had the opposition leader, Mr Dutton, calling for the borders to shut. Uh, we've had the leader of the Nationals, Mr Littleproud, immediately uh, back away from that call. Uh, we've had the former Nationals leader, remember him, Mr Joyce, uh, calling for the borders to be closed. Uh, and of course, uh, we've had Senator McKenzie wanting to wash people's feet uh, and making that offer again today. Senator McKenzie, uh, and while the government, Senator McKenzie, restrain yourself. While the government really does appreciate your newfound Jesus complex, Senator McKenzie, your Senator newfound McKenzie. Jesus complex is much appreciated. But the opposition cannot even decide what you are even calling for. What you are Senator even McKenzie. calling for. Senator McKenzie, I'm not enjoying your commentary. Senator, Senator Walsh. These hysterical calls, these confused calls to shut the borders, open the borders, wash people's feet, they are the things that are damaging our response to this crisis right now. Calls to shut the border are damaging Australia's agricultural rep, uh, reputation. Um, the unnecess unnecessary hysteria that you are fermenting uh, on the opposition benches will do nothing but damage the international trade that you are saying that you want to protect. Uh, as it stands in Australia today, we have no evidence at all that the virus is out in Australia. But what your response does is affect our international trade if people think that we do have this disease. So your hysteria is helping no one. What we do know is that the disease is evident across many countries and the opposition is not calling for borders to be shut to them. So once again, what you are doing is playing politics rather than listening to the experts. Now, I also thank the opposition for their questions on our policy to abolish the ABCC, the absolutely discredited ABCC, and their questions about our consultations with business uh, and with uh, unions Senator, on Senator, this Senator decision. Walsh, uh, Senator Birmingham. Uh, the question before the chair is purely to take note of the answers to Senator Watt in relation to foot and mouth disease. Yes, uh, Senator Walsh, the, the motion before us didn't involve that answer, that question, and that answer. So, okay. it somewhat restrains you. Uh, thank you very much. What I heard Senator Scar say, uh, Senator. <laughs> The motion to take note didn't include yep. that question and answer. Okay, I thought it just included um, questions to Senator Watt. That no, is what I no, heard. No, it was specific to the particular ones 
in, as I understand it, in relation to the foot It is mouth. disappointing not to be able to talk uh, about the discredited uh, organisation that is the ABCC, <laughs> but what this does uh, give me an opportunity to do, of course, is talk a little bit more about uh, the incredibly impressive and powerful response uh, that the Australian government, with the leadership of the minister, Senator Watt, have put in place to deal with this outbreak in Indonesia. Uh, and of course, we are taking this outbreak very seriously. We are managing the risk of foot and mouth disease uh, across our shores. Uh, and we are doing that with the biggest biosecurity package that has ever been introduced in this country. We are installing sanitation foot mats in international and domestic airports. We're monitoring travellers from high-risk areas, and there are thousands of passengers being assessed in Melbourne uh, and in other major cities every day. We are delivering vaccines, and as Minister uh, Watt explained, uh, those vaccines are expected to arrive in August. Uh, we are increasing screening to monitor uh, undeclared meat products. This is a, a serious uh, biosecurity issue for Australia. It's one that we are taking seriously, uh, and the response is not helped by those on the opposition benches. Senator Davey. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy President. And, um, I, I congratulate Senator Watt on her admiral, uh, Senator <laughs> Walsh on her admiral def defence of uh, Minister Watt in this issue. I, I just want to say, however, uh, the, the first point I want to raise is this claim by the government that this is the largest investment in biosecurity in Australia's history. Thanks be to the coalition government. Thanks to the coalition when in government, who made sure we had 1.1 billion extra investment in strengthening Australia's biosecurity in the budget. That funding has enabled Minister Watt to be able to resource ATA in extra biosecurity officers, even though they're not yet on the ground. He shouldn't need to have waited for so long, for eight weeks, because the funding was already there, That's thanks right. be to the coalition government. And I also just want to address the, the timeline issue, the, the claims that we are fear-mongering. Now, like Senator Canavan, I also I live on Australia's oldest single bloodline sheep stud. If FMD comes into this country, that sheep stud will be devastated. Just like Senator Canavan's cattle industry, just like our dairy industry, our goat industry, we cannot actually underestimate the impact that this disease will have on our trade. Mm. You claim that we're impacting negatively our trade markets. Well, it would be far more serious if this disease That's actually right. encroaches our borders and comes into our country, which will decimate our trade. I also just want to address Senator Watt in, in his response to multiple questions, his inability to actually answer anything properly. <laughs> what we've seen is a lot of rhetoric. I mean, we saw Senator Watt on return from Indonesia tweet a photo of himself disinfecting his oh, shoes. He's not afraid to wash saying, shoes. saying that shoe disinfection Does he have a Jesus was being implemented. Now it must only be being implemented for Minister Watt and his touring party, <laughs> because no one else has had to disinfect That's their right. shoes That's on arriving a very back. Good point, Senator Davey. So, you know, we'd like to see it. It took from us calling for foot baths or sanitation mats or whatever you want to define it as, but for us calling for that on the 5th of July, when the first cases of foot and mouth were detected in Bali. It took until the 22nd of July for the minister to actually announce it was happening. Mm. It took until the 25th of July, a full 20 days after we called for it, for even the first foot mat to be rolled out. A passenger in Perth, arriving at Perth Airport over the weekend, asked up. about foot mats because they'd read about it. They said, where's the foot mat? They were told that the Aquis people who were in charge of implementing the foot mats didn't work on weekends. That is why the de delay 
from the announcement on the 22nd to the actual implementation on the 25th, because they didn't work on weekends. Well, imagine. Tell that to the farmers who work each and every weekend, who work seven days a week, that their livelihoods need to be put on hold because our bureaucrats don't work on weekends. We have now heard even though he couldn't answer the question when first asked about how many passengers had come since the 5th of July. What we did here was a breakdown of week-by-week -week numbers, but on average around 23,000 passengers are returning from Indonesia and Bali every week, and yet 20 days mm. delay for foot mats. We've also been calling for establishing 3D X-ray screening programs, which again have been funded under our Strengthening Australia's Biosecurity. Where are they? But where are they? Where are they? Where are they? And we also want to understand what the risk level is and at what point, predicated on science, we're not calling for any voodoo stuff, but predicated on science, at what point we need stronger. I'm going to put the question, border. Senator Davey. I put the question. Those for the question say aye, against no. The ayes have it. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Deputy President. And I rise to take note of the answer given uh, by Senator Wong to the question that I asked her. Um, and I want to state at the outset that the Greens are in good and productive negotiations with the government around the Climate Targets Bill. But I did take the opportunity today to ask the government about their position on new coal and gas. And my first question uh, to Senator Wong was whether or not they will continue the Morrison government's policy of using public money to subsidise opening new coal and gas mines. Now, obviously, we can have a debate about whether they should be open, and we don't think they should. But I would hope that no one thinks it's a good use of public money to be opening new coal and gas mines when we are in the middle of a climate crisis and when this government says we're too poor to do great things like lift the rate of income support, for example. So I put that to, uh, to Senator Wong, and I noted that the International Energy Agency has made it perfectly clear that if we are to stick to one and a half degrees of warming, we can't open any new coal or gas projects. Um, and likewise, if we are even to meet the government's 2030 net zero target, which is too little too late, we still can't open any new coal and gas mines. Um, now, Senator Wong, much to my dissatisfaction and dismay, seemed to be making the argument that climate change isn't really Australia's problem because those emissions from that exported coal and gas under an international accounting agreement are not on our books. Well, I'm afraid the climate doesn't care whose books they're on, and it's a bit of a nonsense argument to say um, that we can open up new coal and gas mines and have no impact on the climate simply because we're exporting that coal and gas. So I don't, that argument didn't wash with me, and frankly, I don't think it would wash um, with anyone either. Now, I tried to then um, get an answer to the question of whether or not this government will keep giving public money to open new coal and gas mines, and Senator Wong didn't answer at that point, so I, I pursued it again later. But I also asked about, given that the first duty of government is to keep its people safe, what government in its right mind would support opening 114 new coal and gas projects that are currently in the pipeline and awaiting approval? Um, now, the response I got on that one was that those projects would be assessed under our existing environmental laws. Now, I am an environmental lawyer, so I know what our environmental laws say. And they don't have a climate trigger in them. They don't require the impacts of a new coal mine, um, uh, the climate impacts, to be considered when the minister is deciding whether or not to approve that coal mine. They are John Howard's environmental laws, which tells you all you need to know about how strong they are. Um, so I'm afraid I'm not at all satisfied with the response that these new coal and gas projects will have to go through our environmental laws, because I know how weak they are and I know how few refusals have been issued in the 23 years of those environmental laws being in existence. Um, in my final supplementary, I took the opportunity to ask Senator Wong again, will this government keep giving public money to open new coal and gas mines, because she hadn't answered it the first time. Um, and we then had a very uh, excruciating minute 
of Senator Wong making the ironically true point that there are so many different subsidies for coal and gas that she didn't know which one I was asking about and therefore she couldn't answer my question. Well, how ironic indeed. That is true. There are so many different grants, different direct grants and different subsidies to coal and gas that it is hard to keep track of them. But our bean counters have done that. And in fact, there are more than $11 billion in public money every year that is given to fossil fuel companies in subsidies, in things like accelerated depreciation for capital equipment, in things like cheap diesel fuel, $11 billion of public money a year. And yet, and yet we're, we're in such a crisis that we're going to have an austerity budget and we can't afford to raise the rate of income support, can't afford to give free childcare, can't afford to build enough affordable housing to help people, can't afford to fully fund schools and hospitals, and yet can't afford to dish out $11 billion of public money every year in freebies to coal and gas companies who are making the climate crisis worse and who are contributing to the cost of climate change. The CSIRO today issued a figure saying that by 2050 we will spend $39 billion every year in mopping up from extreme weather events. You want to make an economic argument about the climate crisis? stop the fossil fuel subsidies and save the money in cleaning up after those devastating fires and floods that wreak so much financial but emotional havoc on our communities and on nature. So I'm afraid we've got a long way to go, and it seems that the fossil fuel companies are still in charge of the two big parties, thanks to the very generous political donations that they continue to make to both big parties. Thank you, Senator Waters. Your time has expired. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Um, Senator Askew. That's the general business notice of motion number three in the name of Senator Mackenzie for an order for the production of documents be taken as a formal motion. Are there any objections to? Oh, sorry, Senator Askew, we're not there. This is notices for another day. So, yeah. Senator Gallagher, are you seeking the call? No. I'm... Senator McKim, are you seeking the call? Okay. So I'm assuming <laughs> there there are no notices. Uh, of motion to be given for another day. Okay, so I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Uh, is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? No. I remind. Uh, oh, so I think we're now moving to the condolence motion. I think uh, I start first, Senator Wong. <laughs> Thank you. It is with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on the 30th of March 2022 of the Honourable Robert James in brackets, Bob Brown AM, a former minister and a member of the House of Representatives for the divisions of Hunter and Charlton, New South Wales, from 1980 to 1998. I call the Leader of the Government in the Senate, Senator Wong. Thank you, President. Uh, and I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of former minister and member of the House of Representatives, the Honourable, Honourable Robert James, Bob Brown, AM. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I thank the Senate. And I move that the Senate records its sorrow at the death on 30th March 2022 of the Honourable Robert James Brown, AM, former minister for land transport and shipping support and former member for Hunter and Charlton, and places on record its appreciation of his service to the parliament and the nation and tenders its sympathy to his family in their bereavement. Uh, President, uh, fellow senators, I, I rise to express condolences on behalf of the Labor government following the passing of a Labor comrade, the Honourable Robert James Brown AM, better known as Bob Brown, former minister and member of the House of Representatives at the age of 88, and I wish to convey at the outset our collective deepest sympathies to his family and his friends. Bob Brown was an economics teacher who would go on to be part of a government that is, that is defined by the reforms it made to the Australian economy. A true Labor man from the Hunter, he served in all three levels of government. At its pinnacle, his career took him into ministerial service under two prime ministers. Bob Brown grew up in the Hunter. It was where he would spend most of his life, and it was the area and community he would go on to represent. His is a quintessential Labor background. 
mother from a mining family, his dad drove a coal truck. And he took up a teaching position at Curry Curry in 1966 and served in local government from 1968 to 1980 in the great city of Greater Cessnock as mayor and alderman. And for a time he concurrently served as the local state member of the parliament in the New South Wales Legislative Assembly. But the call to Canberra would come just two years later. Until the election of Mr Dan Repicholi just a few months ago, Bob Brown was the last person to represent the federal electorate of Hunter, who was not a Fitzgibbon. He won in 1980, was returned in 1983, and boundary changes meant he was transferred to the seat of Charlton and was elected seven times before retiring at the 1998 election. He would, in fact, be succeeded by his daughter in that seat. Bob Brown was a powerful voice for a key constituency that was at the coalface, quite literally, of economic change. For anyone who thinks commentary about changing economic circumstances and voting habits in the Hunter is only a recent turn of events, it pays to look at this history. Bob Brown had the task of representing an electorate that was grappling then with changes in the economy that saw communities facing higher than average unemployment as coal mines closed and other industries were under threat. He had to grapple with the impact of change and attempt to explain its economic imperative in the face of political disenfranchisement and disenchantment. He described it as, and I quote, resentment, frustration, alienation, disillusion, a mix of everything. People don't comprehend really what's happening. I draw upon these comments to illustrate the challenges and responsibilities that fall to local parliamentarians in those communities in electorates where heavy industry has dominated and where structural economic change is changing people's opportunities. It is easy for politicians who don't represent such electorates to be blithe about change, but we all have a role in helping Australians across this country dealing with shifting economic conditions. Bob Brown's vo voice rose to a more senior level in 1988 when he was appointed a minister for the first time with responsibility for land transport and shipping. At the time, key participants in the transport economy, such as the Australian National Line, or ANL, in shipping, and Australian National in rail, were, were still wholly government owned, and gave, that which gave the minister a much more direct involvement than that which we see today. His contribution was recognised with the leader of the EL class of locomotive built for Australian National in 1990 being named after him. These portfolios gave him a role in furthering the government's microeconomic reform agenda. This included initiatives to codify uniform road transport regulations across the country, bringing states and territories together to streamline technical requirements that relieve the trucking industry of the burden of different standards in different parts of the country. Initiatives in this space included measures that we all now take for granted, such as the 0 0.05 blood alcohol limits and, the comp and compulsory bicycle helmet wearing. Following the 1993 election, Bob Brown advised that he would step aside from the ministry in order to provide for renewal. However, after the change of government in 1996, he assailed the Howard government's anti-worker and anti-union agenda, so, much, so often the hallmark of the federal coalition. After, after politics, Bob Brown continued to be active in his local community, with involvement including the local lines and rugby league clubs, as well as a community museum. He published a three-volume series about the first 100 years of Australia's federal parliament in 2007, called Governing Australia. And that year, he was also made a member of the Order of Australia. Bob Brown gave a lifetime of service to the advancement of Labor's cause and to the cause of democracy. He ensured that the working people of the Hunter had a voice in the halls of power, and he did not waver from his cause. As his son Brad was quoted in the eulogy his, he delivered for his father, he always related to the working class, identified with it and defended it, and the trade union, union movement. To have represented coal miners and their families at three levels of government was a source of great satisfaction to him. So I close by saying, on behalf of the government, we I again express our condolences following the passing of the Honourable Bob Brown, and we again convey our sympathies to his family and friends.
Thank you, Minister. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, and thank you, President. And I rise on behalf of the opposition to uh, support the condolence motion moved by Senator Wong and uh, to associate ourselves with the sentiments of Senator Wong in relation to this motion. Robert or Bob Brown was clearly devoted to the service of his community. Uh, Bob served the people of his hometown of Palamain, just a few kilometres outside of Curry Curry, not only as a member of the federal parliament, but as Senator Wong has acknowledged, also in the New South Wales parliament and in local government. Much of Bob's service through local government was concurrent with his service in the New South Wales State Parliament, including terms as the Mayor of Cessnock. Beginning his professional life as a teacher, having won a scholarship to the University of Sydney where he completed a Bachelor of Economics and Diploma of Education, he first took up a teaching post in Broken Hill. It was there in Broken Hill that Bob met his wife Joy, whom he married in 1960 and who predeceased him by just under a year in May of last year. For Bob's family, the loss of Bob on 30 March this year, so soon after the loss of Joy, is no doubt deeply felt. In 1966, after other teaching roles, Bob returned to his hometown to take up a teaching position at Curry Curry High School, later becoming deputy principal. It was here that Bob focused his passion for history. He founded a memorial museum at the school in order to preserve the region's heritage. Only last year, the museum relocated and a room was named in his honour. Bob was there to receive that honour. History was certainly an important part of Bob's life. In 2007, into his 70s, he published Governing Australia, a three-volume series about the first 100 years of Australia's parliament. He also wrote a number of economics textbooks, including some co-authored with Joy. It was soon after returning home to Curry Curry that the determination to serve his community came to the fore although it's clear it had always been a burning passion. In 1961, he unsuccessfully ran for the then safe federal Liberal seat of Paterson. Although he didn't win up against a sitting member and Menzies government minister, he did secure a significant 6.5% swing. Bob then won election to Cessnock Council in 1968, where he served as mayor for his first two years on the council, and again between 1974 and 1980. This was concurrent with his period as the state member for Cessnock, a seat he held in the New South Wales Legis Legislative Assembly for two years. Bob's drive to represent his local community in the federal parliament saw him win the seat of Hunter in 1980, later the newly formed seat of Charlton, a seat he held until his retirement at the 1998 election. So Bob Brown had a very long career of public service and a long and significant parliamentary career in this, play, in this parliament which included serving as a minister, primarily in the Hawke government, as Minister for Land Transport between 1988 and 1993. His passion for his community was reflected in his dedication to his role as a minister, where he championed and indeed achieved important steps in achieving uniform road transport regulations of Australia's trucking industry. As Senator Wong has mentioned, he was also a champion of random breath testing, encouraging states that were slow to finally introduce this important road safety initiative. That RBTs have saved so many lives cannot be doubted, and Bob Brown can take some credit for that important outcome. But it was certainly the passion for his hometown and local area that was Bob's driving force. The support for his local communities, the industries and jobs of his local communities, and his understanding, as Senator Wong referenced, of the impacts of economic transformation on those industries and jobs. He also engaged very significantly at a local level. He was president of the Curry Curry Lions Club and the Curry Curry Rugby League Club. In 2007, he was, so his service was recognised when he was named a member of the Order of Australia in the Queen's Birthday Honours. The citation for this honour notes his service to the Australian Parliament, particularly in the area of transport policy, to the community of the Hunter region through local government, heritage and sporting organisations, and to economics and education. It is a broad citation reflecting his broad endeavours. And of course, it should be noted that Mr Brown's passion for community service was reflected in his family, his daughter, Kelly, having succeeded him as the member for Charlton in 1998 until 2007, and Kelly would be known to a number across this parliament. On behalf of the opposition uh, and in concurrence with the government the Senate, to Bob's loved ones, including Kelly, her brother Brad, and Bob and Joy's five grandchildren and two great-grandchildren, 
I extend our gratitude for his service to our thankful nation and our sincerest condolences. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. I ask senators to join in a moment of silence to signify their assent to the motion. The motion is carried. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Are there any formal motions? As Senator McCarthy. Madam Deputy President, uh, I inform the Senate that uh, Senators Cox and Thorpe have also added their names to the motion that I put forward. I ask that government business notice of motion number one standing in my name and the names of Senators Dodson, Stewart, Cox and Thorpe for today relating to the display of the Aboriginal flag and the Torres Strait Islander flag in the Senate chamber be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator McCarthy. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McCarthy, standing in the names of Senator Dodson, Stewart, uh, Cox and Thorpe, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Uh, Minister. This is for Gallagher. Um, no, motion number two? Yes, thank you. Thank you. I ask that government business notice of motion number two be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator I call Minister Gallagher. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend legislation relating to family law, social security and veterans' entitlements and for related purposes. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Minister. Thank you. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. For an act to amend legislation relating to family law, social security and veterans' entitlements and for related purposes. Minister. I table the explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. In accordance with standing order 111 in bracket 6, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to the 5th of September 2022. Um, Government business number three, Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. I ask that government business notice of motion number three relating to the allocation of departments and agencies to committees be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that being taken as formal? There being none, I call the minister. I move the motion. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank four. you, Speaker. Um, I ask that this for government. I ask that government business notice of motion number four relating to days of meeting for the remainder of the 2022 year be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Gallagher. Right. I move the motion. So the question is: the motion is moved by the by uh, Minister Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Government business number five, Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Speaker. I move that government business notice of motion number five relating to the 2022-23 budget estimates hearings be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that notice being taken as formal? There being none, I call Minister Gallagher. Thank you, Speaker. I move the motion. So the question is the motion as Senator Rustin. Make a short statement. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Russell. Uh, thank you, Madam President, and can I congratulate you on your appointment to thank the you. role? Um, the coalition will not stand in the way of these estimate states put forward by the government. However, we do note that the amount of time allocated is manifestly inadequate to properly scrutinise a budget. We also note the importance of the estimates process for the accountability and transparency 
of government spending of taxpayers' money. We will expect the government to return to the normal time allocated to budget estimates in 2023 to afford adequate time for this important parliamentary process. The Australian people expect us to hold the government to account, and we deserve adequate time to do so. Thank you, Senator Rustin. So the question is that the motion is moved by Minister Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Government Business Number Six, Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. I ask that Government Business Notice of Motions Number Six relating to the scheduling of first speeches be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Gallagher. Thank you. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Minister Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Government business number seven, Minister Gallagher. Thank you. I ask that government business notice of motion number seven relating to consideration of legislation be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Minister Gallagher. Thank you. I move the motion. Uh, were you wanting to? What I'd like to do, do you is want ask to seek leave, Senator seek Lambie? Seek leave, sorry, um, Madam President. So Senator Lambie is seeking leave to make a short statement. Um, one minute. Yeah, Senator, I, sorry, Senator Lambie. I don't think it's a short statement. Long form. I'm actually asking if you'll split the aged care and the social security if we can take a vote on each. So the quest. So I think Senator Lambie is asking for those two bills to be for aged care and. Social services to be split. Yes, I believe that I believe that can be accommodated, Senator Lambie. So the qu question is that the um, those bills, um, with the addition of Senator Lambie's wish for them to be split. So, so the question is that. Uh, the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher that the aged care bill be exempt from the cutoff. Be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Aga uh, Senator Lambie. Madam President, I have been just informed apparently that is not coming up next week, the social, social security one. If that's not coming up next week, I do apologise. I've been misinformed. I will draw that. I do apologise. Sorry. Okay, so just so we're clear, so it's now my intention to go back to the motion as originally put by Senator Gallagher to move those bills that are related to the exemption. So I'll move that. So the question is that the minister, as moved by the minister, Senator Gallagher, that the bill that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. And thank you for that clarification, Senator Lambie. I think we are now at general business. Um, so I shall now proceed to general business and I'll call Senator Roberts. I ask that general business notice of motion number one relating to the restoration of the Fair Work Amendment Equal Pay for Equal Work Bill 2022 to the notice paper be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Roberts. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Roberts be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We'll now move to general business notice of motion number two, standing in the name of Senator Waters. Thanks, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number two, relating to restoration of bills to the notice paper, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Waters. Thank you. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We we'll now move to general business notice of motion number three, standing in the name of Senator McKenzie, and you're speaking to it, Senator Askew. Thank you, Madam President. On behalf of Senator McKenzie, I ask that general business notice of motion number three for an order for the production of documents be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this uh, being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator, uh, Senator Askew on behalf of Senator McKenzie be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator McKenzie, I ask that general business notice of motion number four for an order for the production of documents be taken as a formal motion. 
Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Askew, standing in the name of Senator Mackenzie, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Uh, formal motions number five, Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Cash, I ask that general business notice of motion number five for an order for the production of documents be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Askew, standing in the name of Senator Cash, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe that's carried. Uh, we're now up to number six. Thank you. Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Cash, I ask that general business notice of motion number six for an order for the production of documents be taken as a formal motion. So the question is, uh, the motion is moved. Uh, is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Askew, standing in the name of Senator Cash, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Move to the matter of public importance. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 26 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Waters. Dear Mr President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The biggest cause of climate change is the extraction and burning of coal and gas. To prevent the climate crisis getting worse, no new coal and gas projects can be developed in Australia. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussions. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly, and I call Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you. Oh, beg your pardon. Uh, sorry, I just need to check. Is that supported? I was way too quick. Thank you. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, President. If Australians want to read some shocking numbers in relation to this debate today, um, I suggest they go and Google Renew Economy. Um, Katan Joshi has tweeted a thread on this today because he wrote an article today on just how many tonnes, millions of tonnes of emissions of coming from approvals of new fossil fuel projects are going to dwarf this government's 43 per cent emissions reduction commitment. Uh, according to numbers that he, uh, he published today—this uh, is based on an Australian Institute report from last year—the uh, government's uh, emissions reduction pledge, based on their 43 per cent uh, ambition, uh, they were going to avoid 366 million tonnes of CO2 between 2023 and 2030. So that's if we sign up and agree to reducing emissions by 43 per cent. That's how much carbon uh, will be avoided under this scheme. But if all new coal and gas mines are approved and start running, they'll cause domestically over a million and thirty million tonnes, so uh, nearly three times the amount that we're going to reduce through fugitive emissions and, of course, all the uh, CO2 burnt uh, mining and extracting this. That's domestically, but overseas, if these are exported and burned, um, 11,176 million tonnes of CO2 will be burnt into the atmosphere. So, in other words, hundreds of times more CO2 is going to be emitted than reduced under Labor's targets if, in this government, they continue to approve fossil fuel projects. Now, um, Adam Bant, the leader of the Greens, said you don't, uh, you don't tackle a climate crisis by pouring more fuel onto the fire. This is exactly what the Greens 
have campaigned on going to this election that there's no point in having these climate targets for 2030 or 2050 if you're going to continue to approve new fossil fuel projects. Now we got just a, a short and brief insight today from Senator Wong at question time as to how Labor is going to spin this. And we are deep in an era of greenwashing, and we're going to see a lot more of it. So it's really important that people understand this. Senator Wong basically said, this is not Australia's problem. These are scope one emissions. Uh, we're talking about reducing domestic emissions on our targets. But if other countries buy Australia's coal and buy our gas and burn them, well, that's not our problem. That's their problem. And of course, uh, Mr Albanese, our new Prime Minister, has also uh, repeated the lines that Susan Lay and previous environment ministers and previous prime ministers have repeated that somehow our coal is cleaner and better and beneficial to these countries than other sources. The old drug dealer's defence, and you heard it here in the Senate today, that's what it is. Um, if you don't buy, if you don't buy my drugs, these people down the road are going to get drugs from someone else that's going to be worse off for them. What a ridiculous argument. If we commit to climate action, we commit to protecting future generations, we commit to protecting our natural environment, we commit to protecting our farming sector, we commit to protecting our communities from extreme weather events like floods and fires, if we commit to ending species extinction, then we must commit to no new fossil fuel projects in this country. And this is not just the Greens saying this. Our 75 per cent target is based on the Paris Agreement and the science. And it is the United Nations and all the experts that are saying we must end the era of fossil fuels by absolutely 100 per cent stamping out new fossil fuel projects. That's it. That's what the science tells us is necessary. And we're still talking here uh, at a 43 per cent emissions reduction target by Labor of a two degree warming all the impacts we've seen uh, in our climate emergency have come from one degree of warming. Even the Paris target of 1.5 degree warming still assumes a 50 per cent increase in the latent heat on this planet, based on what we've already seen, which is still potentially catastrophic. But we are going to be debating like doubling the amount of heat on this planet and getting to net zero by 2050. What's the point of getting net zero by 2050 if there's no barrier reef left and we've irrevocably changed the way we live on this planet? We need to act now, and the only way we can act is to end all new fossil fuel projects, full stop, period. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be um, addressing the Senate today. Um, not only is my role as a senator for Queensland and not only as um, someone who has long argued for climate action, uh, but also in my new position as the Special Envoy for the Great Barrier Reef. Um, as someone who lives in Cairns, I understand more than most people how important it is for us to protect the Great Barrier Reef and to make sure that we have not only um, this asset to enjoy for many generations to come, but to protect the jobs that the reef relies on. And we want to make sure that in um, um, taking up this role as a special reef envoy, there are a number of issues that I am keen to address and a number of uh, issues that I am keen to talk to many stakeholders about. Um, since being appointed to the role, I've had the opportunity to speak to conservation groups, tourism operators, um, I've had a chance to speak to agricultural leaders um, and also, of course, traditional owners who in this space are doing fantastic work. Um, uh, Australians made a clear choice on the 21st of May and they are ready for action on climate change and they're ready for a Labor government to deliver it. And in all of the conversations that I've had with people around the Great Barrier Reef, in this role as the Special Reef Envoy, it has been um, clear to me that people are incredibly hopeful for the future now that there has been a change of government. They are incredibly hopeful about the plans that Labor has put in place and the things that we have said that we will do to take action on climate change and to protect the Great Barrier Reef. Today, our government has taken one of those very important steps, and we've introduced legislation to take action on climate change to make sure that this bill does what the previous government failed to do 
over a decade in power. So I'm very proud to be here today as part of this government and as the Special Envoy for the Great Barrier Reef as we send a very clear message that the time for action on climate change is now. And the stability and certainty that is going to come from legislating this target is clear for all Australians to see, and it is important for Australians and their future. Because our government will not waste the opportunities that have come with climate action. We know that, as uh, Senator Wong said today in question time, this is not only a matter of protecting our environment but also an economic question and the jobs that can come from investing in renewable energy. We know that the previous government was so opposed to taking action on climate change that they vetoed renewable energy projects because it was against their own policy. Um, uh, they um, you know, tried to take the R out of arena, and they actively are still standing up against climate change. Our government will not be one of inaction and waste when it comes to this important issue, and that's why we will deliver on our mandate of a 43 per cent target. Um, today, the Albanese Labor government introduced a climate change bill enshrining 43 per cent emissions reductions into law. This puts on track it puts us on track to reach net zero by 2050 and restores our international reputation as a responsible global citizen. This legislation brings much needed certainty to workers, businesses, communities and our energy needs change. We prepare for, to reap the benefits of a renewable energy future. Today, Labor restored accountability and certainty in Australia's climate approach. The Climate Change and Energy Minister will now be required to report our progress to the parliament and making sure that we are being transparent and ambitious when we strive to reach net zero. This legislation represents a hard-fought consensus on climate change amongst Australians. It has the support of businesses, associations, unions, environmental groups and community organisations. And as the Minister for Climate Change has said, this is a critical first step and the experts will continue to inform our approach to targets moving forward. This is the first step, a step that Australians have waited so long to see taken, and we are taking this step as a government now. The legislation will enshrine nationally determined contribution of 43 per cent emissions. It will task, as I said, the Climate Change Authority to provide advice to Australians progressing against these targets. It will require the minister to report annually to parliament on the progress, and it will finally, um, uh, in other legislation, reinsert the renewables component to, are to ARENA. This is on top of Labor's plan to power Australia. It complements our plan to create jobs, cut power bills and reduce emissions through our Powering Australia plan. Labor's plan will upgrade the electricity grid, make electric vehicles cheaper and invest in green manufacturing. The Powering Australia plan will deliver over 600,000 jobs across the country, with five out of six of those jobs created in regional Australia. It will cut power bills for families and businesses as we take advantage of Australia's vast natural resources. Our Powering Australia plan is another example of Labor's ambitious and resourceful approach when we are talking, taking on the challenge of climate change. We won't bury our heads in the sand. We know that this is complex. We know that there are issues that we need to see through. We won't see them through a singular lens. Labor takes up the challenge and finds a way to solve this issue and deliver real social and economic returns for Australia, the Australian people. This is in direct contrast with the last decade of denial and delay. It is clear that under the former government, um, Australians had lost hope. They had lost hope. Um, after a decade of chaos on renewable energy, Labor's climate change bill will finally give certainty so desperately needed for businesses, industry, energy, investors and the wider community. In my community of regional Queensland, we have seen hundreds of jobs evaporate as a result of the disunity among the previous government on climate change. And I note this disunity continues in the opposition. Um, they are obviously given an opportunity to join the government to vote for our legislation. They've indicated that they will not be doing that, although I know that the disunity continues within the opposition. Uh, it really 
begs the question about who and what the, the opposition has been listening to, and clearly they didn't hear the message from the Australian people at the last election. There are real and serious consequences from the previous government's actions that Labor is just now having the opportunity to start cleaning up. And we will work with people across this chamber to achieve outcomes for all Australians. We will work with people who want to see climate action put into reality. We will be constructive. But the Australian people know that what, what Labor took to the last election, they understand that plan that we have, the Powering Australia plan. They understand that we have a commitment to 43 per cent target. They understand that that was not a target or a number plucked out of thin air, but something that we put together by understanding through independent modelling what levers the government could pull, what emissions reductions we could achieve if we pulled those levers. This is something that we have taken to the Australian people, and now as a government we are planning to legislate these targets. It is uh, an opportunity, I think, for this parliament to rise above the divisive politics of the climate wars in the, under the previous government, under um, uh, the, former, the former government, where we saw climate wars um, uh, deliver nothing but political debate in this space. And we know there are people in this chamber who need to understand that we are here to deliver on our election commitments. We are here to listen and we will be constructive, and I think we have been constructive when it comes to the negotiations on the legislation. But we have a very clear mandate, we have a very clear agenda, and we are delivering on that agenda. And when it comes to climate change, every time I'm on my feet in this place, I continue to remind the chamber that there are people in our country, in Queensland right now, who are feeling the effects of climate change. Uh, we visited, uh, along with the Minister for Climate Change and the Assistant Minister for Climate Change, Senator McAllister, had the opportunity to um, go to the Torres Strait a few weeks ago. And we sat down with those community members, and it was a real honour to listen to them directly, to see the changes that are happening, the coastal erosion. And it really begs the question that if anyone, any person from that side of the chamber can hear those personal stories, can see that coastal erosion occurring and still choose to think that this is not a place where we need to get down and get the work done on climate change, then I don't understand what they are here for. What we've got from the opposition so far is more denials, more diversion, more debate and delay. But this government, a Labor government, is getting on with the job. And that is why we have put this legislation to the parliament. And we'll give the parliament an opportunity to discuss that legislation, to talk about the value of acting on climate change. But it, we will get this done. And if the parliament does not legislate the target, we will still set about achieving the things that we promised the Australian people, because the time is now. Senator Dunian. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I have to commend Senator Green for getting through 10 minutes on a motion, or sorry, an MPI put forward by the Greens around banning coal and gas without mentioning either of those particular fossil fuels. I was uh, enlightened uh, by your um, contribution there about the uh, Labor Party, now government's uh, policies to legislate, but I'm still at a loss to understand, based on that contribution, where you stand on this MPI, but I'm sure other government speakers will enlighten us on exactly where they stand. But I'll put on record my views and the views of the opposition here, which have been made clear time and time again. Sometimes, though, I do think some in this place live in a par parallel uh, universe, and I think we could be forgiven for thinking that because today we saw inflation numbers released—6.1 per cent. And that's a figure that I don't think we should just brush off and forget about and not pay attention to the impact that's going to have on Australian households and businesses, job-creating entities. Uh, these sorts of things are an important context to uh, set as a backdrop for the debate that the Greens have so generously put down for us. Uh, the motion, which I'll read again. Um, uh, as put forward by Senator Waters, the biggest causes of climate change is the extraction and burning of coal and gas. And to prevent the climate crisis from getting worse, no new coal and gas projects can be developed in Australia. 
Now, that is a standalone statement they have spoken to today, but the impacts of doing that, I think, on the economy. And I mentioned earlier on today that there are two fragile things that we need to take into account here. One, the environment, and two, the economy. Environmental decisions have an impact on the economy, on people's jobs, on their ability to pay power bills, keep food on the table, keep their businesses running. And to make a decision over here with absolutely no regard for what impact it has over here is a ridiculous approach to public policy, and that is exactly what we're seeing here. I can see why Senator Green refused to even go near it, because it is difficult for the Labor Party to uh, reconcile their rhetoric around fossil fuels and the problems they're going to have when it comes to the Australian Greens and trying to legislate in this place and deal with their demands when it comes to things like this. I've already mentioned inflation hitting 6.1% a many decades record being hit, which is, as I say, going to have an impact. We know that power prices, similarly, are going sky high. And from June 2021, that prices have gone up in the national electricity market by two to three hundred per cent. That's a huge amount. We know that Labor won't be able to fulfil their promise to the Australian people from just nine weeks ago that uh, uh, power bills will go down by two hundred and seventy-five dollars. Uh, bank interest rates are going up. Fuel, cost of fuel to put in your car is going up, and Australian households are hurting. They're doing it tough. And so, when on the first substantive day of sitting in this parliament, in the Australian Senate, we're here debating this issue with absolutely no regard for the impact that it has on households and businesses, I think it's something Australians need to wake up and listen to and see what these sorts of policies, this sort of direction has on the impact of households that are doing it tough. Australians that work hard. It is something, frankly, that uh, I think the Greens should probably reflect upon, uh, given this demonstrates how out of touch they are with Australians who just want to get on and live their lives and want the government to bring in policies that help them live their lives, make a better future for themselves and their children, have a go, get rewarded, you know, those great Australian ideals. But, as I say, this, this uh, MPI has been written with zero regard for the impact such a call would have on the ability for honest, hard-working Australians to make a go of things. Um, look, we already know the facts around how much uh, these resources specified in this MPI contribute to energy generation in this country. The great bulk of energy generated in this country is from these resources. Now, we know there are plans to, and of course the government have outlined their plan to transition to renewables, but the idea that you can just shut down exploration and expansion of existing resources, which are going to be needed, any expert will tell you that, without forcing businesses and households, hospitals, schools to turn the lights off, the heaters off, uh, you know, it is a short-sighted, cynical stunt which will have bad impacts on Australians. And we don't know when the existing resource, let's say this thing, this uh, MPI, and what the Greens would love to do to Australia, let's, let's say in some dystopian world this became reality. Um, when would the lights switch off? In five years, ten years? When would we be able to, well, not be able to keep the lights on in schools or uh, store in appropriate refrigeration units vital medicines in hospitals? When would we stop being able to do that? When would you be sitting in the dark at home eating your dinner? When would the factories stop being able to do what they do best, manufacture something we want to do more of here with our resources rather than outsourcing it to countries that do burn fossil fuels, something you guys seem to forget about? The jobs are lost, the businesses are shut down, and the cycle goes on and on. And this is something that these trite statements, these motions that we see from time to time, never, ever take uh, account of and never have any regard for. Those people that work in those industries, those people impacted, they don't matter, apparently. And we only have to come down to Tasmania, uh, where, of course, we do have businesses that do rely on coal to be able to do what they do. The Railton cement factory, for one, something, I don't know, we've got this shortage of material to go into the housing and construction sector, but you know, let's say the Fingal Colliery runs out of coal and needs to expand. I presume if the Greens had their way, we'd no longer be able to source coal. We wouldn't be able to produce concrete to be able to feed that plant and, of course, the housing and construction sector. But that doesn't matter. How about the Norske Skog, uh, Skog um, paper mill in the Derwent Valley? 
It doesn't matter. They use coal to fire their boilers. They're looking for alternatives, of course. I'm sure they're ones that we'd want to stand in the way of. But as it stands, under your motion, we'd be standing in the way of that, and the five, six hundred jobs in the Derwent Valley, who cares? Don't worry. That community does not matter. And this is the thing. No regard for these people and no consideration at all for the flow-on effects that this would have for the economy and, indeed, also for the environment. And I'm waiting to see what the alternatives are, because I look at a bit of recent history around what we could be doing. Because if we're shutting down fossil fuel use and no more new gas or coal uh, operations and projects across this country, then where are we sourcing this energy that we need to be a competitive economy from? This fragile economy I talked about before, the one that's facing the economic headwinds that the government have already been talking about, that the international community is bracing for. Where do we get this alternative energy from? Because we know, and I heard Senator Wish Wilson refer to Renew Economy uh, a little earlier on, and I was having a look at that website, and there was a, a link on there talking about how the Greens uh, opposed Marinus, the Marinus link a vital piece of infrastructure which is there to generate investment in renewable energy, in the battery of the nation, expanding our hydro generation. Oh, but no, we can't have that. So, OK, we can't have hydro, and we all know the Greens were given birth to out of the Franklin Dam dispute, so they're definitely against hydro. They also oppose the Robbins Island wind farm, one example of renewables they're opposed to. So we've got hydro, we've got wind, no go. So where are we getting this energy from? They want to be a part of the solution here, but they don't provide solutions. They just tell us what we shouldn't be doing. They have no regard for honest, hard-working men and women that will be impacted by this. But I'm not surprised by this, and I doubt a great many Australians would be either, to be honest, to be honest with you. And, you know, we in Tasmania know exactly what we're dealing with here when it comes to this sort of thing and the party behind the movement of such MPIs and motions. When you have the Greens near the levers of power, bad things happen. We warned Australians about this, and here we are, the first substantive day of sitting in the Senate, and this is the first thing they chuck down. So can I tell you, this is what we need to expect, and it is a word of warning to the Australian Labor Party, the government. We all know you have two pathways to legislate in this place, and one of them is in fact with the Australian Greens. And we've just been given a sneak preview of the kinds of things, I dare say probably the stuff that they've been laying on the table in your negotiations over your legislated 43 per cent reduction in emissions bill. This is what the world is in for in Australia. At a time when people can't pay their mortgages, can't pay their power bills, can't put fuel in the car, this is what the Australian Greens are proposing. It is a dim, dark future, not just because we can't keep the lights on, but because the policies this crew put forward are bad for Australia, are bad for businesses, households, and will mean economic destruction and the removal of our ability to compete in the international economy. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. This is not my first, first speech. I rise today to speak about the call from people in the ACT and millions of Australians around the country for policy decisions in the 47th Parliament to be guided by science. For the past few years, faced with unprecedented challenges, a global public health emergency, science has guided health policy. Scientists have been celebrated for their quick, their quick work developing vaccines. We have valued and respected their research. We need to extend that value and respect to all of our scientists. We need to depoliticise critical debates and start to genuinely listen to our scientists. We have rightly heard calls for a science-based response to the potentially devastating threat that foot and mouth disease poses to Australia. We need the same when it comes to the science around climate and environment. The evidence is significant and requires an urgent response. The latest IPCC report, the result of the best scientific minds examining hard evidence, states that greenhouse gas emissions must peak by 2025 if we are to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. The IPCC's advice could not be clear, clearer. We cannot afford new fossil fuel projects in Australia. 
Rather than opening new fossil fuel facilities, focus should be given to the incredible opportunities offered by a transition to clean energy and a focus on ensuring regional Australia benefits from this clean energy transition. Australia's renewable energy reserves are 75 per cent greater than our combined reserves of coal, oil, gas and uranium. Clean energy exports could be worth almost triple the value of Australia's existing fossil fuel exports. In addition to benefits for regional communities, transition to clean energy will improve the lives of those in suburban Australia. Rooftop solar is a great Australian success story. Started under the Howard government, we now have some of the cheapest rooftop solar in the world. With the right policy, we can do the same for battery, heat pumps and electric vehicles. In the ACT, electrification of households would save households on average $5,000 per year. At a time when cost of living pressures are hurting so many in our community, these savings are more important than ever. In order to make this transition, we must move away from coal and gas and focus on the renewable technologies of the future. The 47th Parliament has the opportunity to get on with this. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Grogan. Thank you. Um, it was only a few months ago that I stood in this chamber and spoke about the clear message being sent from South Australia about what they wanted to see in a government. I highlighted then that they wanted real action on climate change, more jobs and cheaper power. The election result made it clear, made it very clear just how true that was. In every state and territory, Australians were very clear on their desire for change. And many of us believe that a lot of that was driven by the desire for action on climate change. They voted for a government that will respect ambitious reduction targets. They voted for a government that will work alongside community, industry and, importantly, the scientists. And now, as a government, we have the opportunity to change, and we value the importance of this place, and we value and respect the diversity of views that are held within this chamber and the other place. Those views deserve to be heard. They deserve to be considered, and ultimately, they deserve to consider compromise to get the best outcome for the Australian people. I understand that the Greens have a particular view about new coal and gas projects, and that is their right, and I acknowledge that that was their publicly stated policy position prior to the election. It's what they campaigned on, and they were very clear with the Australian people. Our policy differs, and that was also very clear in the lead-up to the election. We have been very clear that any new coal and gas project needs to stack up. And the simple reality is that the renewable investment in this country is booming and that Labor, the Labor government has significant plans to boost development in renewable energy, to improve our electricity system and to head towards net zero in 2050. In that scenario, many coal and glass projects just simply don't add up. A company having an idea or having a proposal for a new coal or gas project does not necessarily mean it's going to occur, does not necessarily mean that it will make it through their board approval processes, does not necessarily mean they are going to get the investment and the finance that they need for that project. If they do manage to get that far, then we do have our environmental standards, noting uh, Senator Waters' concern about the strength of those standards, um, but they are processes nonetheless to ensure that projects have what is seen to be a reasonable um, pathway. So, subject to a project passing all of those hurdles, we do then have a very clear safeguard mechanism, which we will bring in. And that will apply to any project, any new project, emitting over 100,000 tonnes. 
This safeguard mechanism is designed to ensure that we reach our goal, a goal that we are deeply committed to, of net zero by 2050. Providing those emitting facilities with certainty as to their emissions trajectory and providing certainty for anyone wishing to invest in such projects makes it clear about the future for that project. And under that scenario, many of those projects may not stack up. What we won't be doing is making empty promises for new projects that possibly won't come to fruition, like so often happened after the last decade under the previous government. This was our very clear policy that we brought to the election, the very clear policy that the Australian people knew we had when they gave us the honour of being their government. Prior to coming to this chamber, I have had the great pleasure of being the executive director of the Wentworth Group of Concerned Scientists, which gave me the opportunity to work extensively with the scientific community and with industry on the urgent need for climate action. We spent a very long time banging our heads against the wall with a lack of action from the government of the day. But the scientific community, working alongside the business community, reflecting on the industries of the future, as well as the good of the planet, you can make a positive pathway through that. And that is where Labor sees the answer. Over many years, I've had the great opportunity to work with environmental advocates, including some from the agricultural sector, and to hear for them how clear, concise, transparent climate action is for their work. It is vital. There is a pathway here. There is a pathway we intend to take. The one consistent theme that we have seen for well over a decade is that everyone is sick and tired of the uncertainty around climate policy in this country. We became an international laughing stock under the previous government. We have already, as the new Labor government, made strong inroads to change that. And that is not just about looking good on the international stage. That is about investment in Australia. That is about the opportunity for our businesses to grab the opportunity to amend their business, to work towards low emissions, to zero emissions, and to reap the benefits of the fact that the international community is looking down that pathway, is moving down that pathway. Climate change is an opportunity for our businesses to get on board. One consistent theme, as I've said, is this issue around the uncertainty, the division and the political game playing. This is an area that has been plagued by political opportunism, policy immaturity, obfuscation, and we welcome the constructive discussions that have been occurring between the government and the crossbench, particularly the Australian Greens. They've come to the table in good faith. They've come to the table with ideas and we welcome that and thank them for that effort. Unfortunately, the other side of the chamber is quite a different situation, and we have seen the Leader of the Opposition refuse to engage in this conversation, to try to continue the divisive, destructive approach to climate change. Thankfully, they were voted out. Hopefully, in this next term, they might learn something about bringing the country together rather than dividing it. We do not need to divide our country again over climate policy. We have a strong pathway that is very clear, that gives industry and communities certainty and that opens and enhances numerous opportunities in new and emerging sectors, including hydrogen something I'm very passionate about, and we've seen some excellent opportunities in the Upper Spencer Gulf um, that is exciting the whole community, from a development perspective, from a jobs perspective, and also from a reducing emissions and addressing climate change perspective. In our bill that has been introduced into the House of Representatives, 
We honour all of those commitments that we made during the election. It contains 43 per cent reduction target by 2030. It has an independent climate change authority to provide advice on our progress and help ensure our commitment to the obligations we've made under the Paris Agreement. Our policy has covered accountability, transparency and the contrast between the past government and the current government. We sincerely hope that this bill will pass. We sincerely hope that the level of engagement consultation that has occurred with all of the relevant stakeholders, including environmentalists, business, industry. This is a policy, this is a bill that actually addresses critical issues in an agreed, consulted and transparent manner. We know that we are going to find objection from the Liberal opposition. We know we're going to find objection from the Nationals Party. We know that this is not what the Australian public want. This is a chance to come together. This is a chance to make a difference for the future of Australia. This is a crisis and we need to address it. Senator McDonald. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. There's a great saying I heard when attending the Queensland Mining and Engineering Expo in Mackay earlier this month. If it's not made of steel, it's made in a factory made of steel. Yeah, yeah. Now, not one federal Labor or Green politician attended the expo, a fact that was noted with concern and surprise by the sector's heavyweights gathered there, given not only the economic but also the environmental contribution of this industry. Any public display of support by Labor for mining companies would jeopardise their attempts to gain green support for our second most important sector, and they have shown their hand. Labor's reliance on the Greens continues to threaten Australia's coal and gas industries, which are key pillars of our economy that continue to provide affordable and secure electricity, jobs and funds vital services, because it is only prosperous economies that can afford to be good environmental managers. This is why we must pr protect the economy. The Australian resources industry is creating jobs, business opportunities and investment, especially in regional Australia. In 2020-21, the resources and energy sector accounted for around 10 per cent of Australia's GDP. The sector's exports made up around two-thirds of Australia's total export earnings. The Greens continue to make up numbers about the sector while ignoring the fact that it is ensuring our energy security. The lessons of the past few months is that energy security equals national security for all Australians. And if you live in a mining sector and you voted for Labor or have a Labor representative, this is what you're getting. Dirty deals with people who want to cut the artery to Australia's economic heart and to regional Australia. Our food, our homes, our cars, yes, even the electric ones, devices and clothes all exist thanks to mining or machines made by mining. Even the rapidly growing rare earths mining sector, a key plank in battery production for renewable energy, needs heavy steel machinery to function. And the most efficient way to make steel is using coal in blast furnaces. The Greens and their supporters reveal a lack of understanding when they make outlandish claims about coal mining. Coal is an ingredient in, solar, in silicon solar panels. Wind turbines are made predominantly of steel and concrete, which are made using coal. And on most days, coal-fired power makes up 54 per cent of, an, of our national energy generation, and gas makes up 20 per cent of our generation. We simply cannot afford to cut new coal and gas developments. Now, the Greens like to think they're smarter than everyone else. So what's the plan to replace that 70 per cent of baseload power generation? More renewables? We just don't yet have the battery technology to ensure that the lights stay on and the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. And South Australia is held up as the gold standard for renewables, but multiple times at the start of June, that state was drawing more than 80 per cent of its power from gas and diesel as windless days arrived. The South Australians are also installing a battery on Torrens Island the size of Adelaide Oval at a cost of $180 million. That's
that will one, have one entire hour of storage. Most people support the idea of renewable energy, but we must ensure that the transition is timed to coincide with replacement baseload energy generation coming online. Not only that, we need to build new transmission lines, conservatively costed at $14 billion, from the new sources of power to the grid. AEMO is mapping transmission lines, but how many reach the regions where the renewable energy uh, places are, are situated? It's why Copper String is a critical transmission line to connect the Minerals Province of the northwest in Queensland through to Townsville to access not only the renewable energy projects but also to take energy to those mining projects. The transition needs to be gradual, but the Greens demand we switch off coal virtually overnight. Meanwhile, other countries are restarting coal-fired power stations or building new ones. Not only does that negate any of the meagre emission savings we make here, those countries need coal and it should be high-quality Australian coal. By 2025, Germany will have spent more than half a trillion euros on renewables and is still only drawing 34 per cent of its energy needs from renewables. Less than a month ago, due to disruption to Russian gas supplies, the German parliament was forced to pass emergency legislation to restart previously mothballed coal-fired power plants just to keep the lights on. The media reports authorities will also bulldoze a historic church to get at coal reserves underneath. And just remember, it's still summer there. So what can they expect in the bitterly cold European winter? And that's right, it will be coal to the rescue. The German experience proves that energy security equals national security for all Australians. But while other countries recognise this, the Greens missed the memo. In 2021 alone, the world added 1.45 million megawatts of new coal-fired power. I got that from the Global Coal Plant Tracker. 80 per cent of that is in China and India, two countries not bound by international emissions reductions agreements. And we can see in Victoria the emerging issue of energy supply, security and affordability. Coal-fired power makes up 54 per cent of our national energy generation and gas makes up 20 per cent of our generation. We simply cannot afford to cut new coal and gas developments. Coal prices are at a historic high, and this is due only to one thing—demand, demand that is tipped to grow to record levels this coming financial year. The world needs coal and gas, and customers will get it from elsewhere if they don't get it from Australia. Australia's resources industry pumped $39 billion into Australian and state government coffers in 2020-21 in royalties and taxes and contributed a record $301 billion to the economy. The mining sector directly employs more than 270,000 people and the number of workers employed in the sector has doubled over the last 15 years. We simply do not have a replacement for that income stream or employment sector. Employment in the sector grew by 11 per cent in the year to February 2022, creating over 25,000 new jobs. The resources sector provides jobs and opportunities in many rural and regional areas that have been doing it tough. The renewable projects will not bring those same number and well-paid jobs. And in my short time as Shadow Minister, I've met with dozens of mining executives and seen the extraordinary measures being implemented to protect the environment. In fact, more environmental scientists are employed by mining companies than anywhere else. The Queensland Resources Council states that about a quarter of Queensland mines use renewable energies. Two thirds of the state's resource companies plan to invest in lowering their emissions in the next 12 months and 40 per cent of them are already actively investing in low emissions technology. The International Energy Agency World Energy Outlook projects that total coal, oil and gas demand will grow. The IEA confirms that coal and gas will remain an important part of the world's energy mix for decades into the future, with coal remaining, remaining the single largest source of electricity in 2040, which means that gas and coal will continue to play a vital role in Australia's energy mix for the foreseeable future. 
The Greens base their demands on a desire to prevent tree clearing and reducing emissions. But this is the same party that, while it dem demands governments build one million new homes, but at the same time oppose any new residential development that requires even minor tree clearing. They don't seem to protest about the trees cleared for wind and solar projects, showing a selective outrage that destroys credibility. The mining industry would employ more environmental scientists, invest more into environmental uh, uh, surveys uh, and research and operate under some of the world's strictest environmental laws. We should be encouraging these experienced, mature players to ramp up operations, employ more people on double the average wage and provide, provide the royalties and taxes that pay for infrastructure. If we follow the Greens' leads, we would sacrifice the thousands of mum and dad businesses that mining supports and support scores of regional towns. Gas is still in huge demand in Australia and around the world, not just for energy production but also for urea production, a critical part of agricultural fertilisers, and AdBlue, a component for the agricultural uh, industry and transport industry. Australia can have a plan to utilise more renewables, but good planning takes time. This fanciful notion from the Greens should not be supported. It is the green tail wagging the Labor dog. Senator Shoebridge. Acting Deputy President, this is not my first speech. They're calling this the climate parliament because it has to be. The future of people and nature across the country, across the globe, depends on the action that this parliament will take. It's because a third of the people in this country voted for someone other than the major parties, many of them electing Greens and independents. It's the climate parliament because the next three years are going to determine if we can use political power for good to work together and deliver climate action, and we must do so. Let's be clear, we are running out of time on this, and failure comes at an impossibly high cost. If we keep pumping carbon into the atmosphere, we will destroy ecosystems and threaten the lives of billions of people. The thing to do now is simple. It's to stop digging up coal and gas. You can't put out the fire while pouring petrol on it. We need to plan for and then deliver the end of coal and gas. Pretending we can continue with business as usual while the planet is taking it in turns to burn and then drown is delusional. We know because every credible climate scientist has told us this, that emissions from burning coal and gas are driving the climate crisis. And we need to plan for a future for coal-dependent communities in places like the Hunter in New South Wales. Mm -hmm. Pretending we can continue business as usual with these industries as they chaotically shut down while cooking the planet also betrays those coal-dependent communities. It's not fair to them who deserve a safe and prosperous post-coal future, which will not be delivered by a government with its head in a mine. We need to stand with First Nations people in this fight for country. It's their country, and that means joining with traditional owners, such as the Wanara Plains people in the beautiful Hunter Valley who are fighting for country after so much of their land, their culture and their connection has been stolen by multi-billion dollar mining corporations. And in New South Wales, we've seen the Ravensworth Homestead, site of appalling frontier conflict, violence and murder of First Nations people, being threatened with the expansion of an open-cut coal mine from the global bottom-feeding bottom corporation that is Glencore, a climate catastrophe and an act of cultural devastation all in one proposal. But Glencore did not account for the powerful First Nations resistance of the Wanara Plains people. They've fought this proposal. They've rallied and they've lobbied and they're still fighting. And we stand with them and we stand together to fight for our collective future. And the decision on protecting their land and their water, their connection to country, now lies with the new Labor Environment Minister. And if land, culture, country and the future mean anything, there is only one decision she can make and that better make Glencore bloody unhappy. This week, a record 12 Green senators in this place and 16 MPs across the parliament are ready to deliver on that clear mandate for change. And while the threats are real and the destruction is brutal, the good news is that dealing with climate change is an almost impossibly big opportunity for Australia. 
while other countries need to end coal and import energy. We can end coal and become a green energy superpower. Australia has the highest wind and solar capacity of any developed nation and a wealth of critical green energy materials. That gives us an extraordinary leg up in the post-cold world we need to start building. And that is why, as Greens, we will keep pushing Labor further and faster to make Australia a world leader in clean energy. This is essential for the planet. It is essential for nature, and it's bloody amazing for Australia. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As an engineer, I respect and consult scientists because lives have depended on it and still do. As an engineer educated in atmospheric gases and as a business manager, I was responsible for hundreds of people's lives based on my knowledge of atmospheric gases. I listen to scientists, I cross-examine scientists and I debate the science. I have never found anyone with the logical scientific uh, logical scientific points based on empirical scientific evidence that shows we have anything to worry about at all. And the basics are this. When you burn a hydrocarbon fuel, you burn molecules containing carbon and hydrogen. With oxygen, they form CO2, carbon dioxide, and H2O, water vapour. That's it. Carbon dioxide is essential for all life. But let's go beyond the science and have a look at natural experiment. We've had two natural experiments, global experiments, in the last 14 years. The first was in 2009, when the use of hydrocarbon fuels in the recession that followed the global financial crisis reduced. There was less carbon dioxide produced from, from human use of hydrocarbons. And what, did that, what happened to the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? It kept increasing. And what happened in 2020, when we had a, a major recession, almost a depression around the world as, as a result of COVID restrictions placed by governments? We saw the same reduction in hydrocarbon fuel use by humans, the same cut in carbon dioxide output from humans, and yet carbon dioxide in the atmosphere continued increasing. And those who understand the science understand that it is fundamental. Humans cannot and do not affect the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's controlled by nature entirely. In my I've cross-examined the CSIRO for three times now in the last few years. Under my cross-examination, which is the first of its kind in this country and the only one of its kind in the world, the CSIRO admitted that they have never stated that carbon dioxide from human activity is dangerous. Never stated it. This is all rubbish that we're being talked about. They secondly admitted that today's temperatures are not unprecedented. Thirdly, they never quantified in three meetings any specific impact of carbon dioxide from human activity. Never. That is the fundamental basis for policy. What's more, they showed their sloppiness because they withdrew discredited papers that they initially cited to me at their choice as evidence of unprecedented rate of temperature change and then failed to provide the empirical scientific evidence. They withdrew the papers, the two papers they put to me on temperatures, the two papers they put to me on, on uh, carbon dioxide. There is no danger. Temperatures are not unprecedented. We need to come back to the science not the so-called experts that the Greens talk about, not the pixies at the bottom of the garden. Come back to the science, the empirical scientific evidence, and base policies on that. Senator Still John. Thank you. After the most progressive election result of our time, uh, with more Greens in the Senate and in the House of Representatives than ever before, uh, determined to demand uh, that the climate crisis uh, is something which is addressed on behalf of our communities, uh, the Parliament, every single one of us in this place, uh, is here uh, with one question uh, over our heads, and that is, will we act in this critical moment? Now, there's a good saying that many of in, in our community hold to, and that is that actions speak louder than words. And in relation to the climate crisis, no act can be more impactful than the decision to keep fossil fuels in the ground. One particular project which seeks to do the very opposite of this, uh, which is an incredible concern to so many community members uh, in Western Australia, is that of, of Woodside's Scarborough gas development. 
This disastrous plan is shaping up to become part of Australia's most dangerous fossil fuel project. If it goes ahead, this me mega gas plant uh, off the northwest coast of WA will single handedly increase national emissions by over 10 per cent. Now, I need you all here to understand how significant that is. This project will release as much pollution as around 20,000 airplane flights around the circumference of the earth every single day for the next 25 years. This project irreversibly threatens First Nations cultural heritage, including the 45,000-year-old World Heritage Murujuga Art uh, Precinct, a rock art uh, area. It puts marine life at risk. It, put, it puts life itself at risk. At a time when the rest of the world is scrambling to reduce emissions to tackle climate change, uh, every year the Albanese government uh, is uh, the Albanese opposition and now in government has accepted hundreds of thousands of dollars in donations from Woodside and other mega fossil fuel corporations looking to have their death plants approved. Now the science here is irrefutable. The mining and burning of coal, oil and gas is fueling the climate crisis. And yet despite being on the literally sweltering front line of the climate crisis, Western Australia continues to enjoy the dubious honour of being the worst performing state on climate action in the country. Just last month, the WA Environmental Protection Agency recommended uh, ministerial approval for the 30-year extension of another cataclysmic Woodside project, the North West Shelf Gas Project. That alone will lock in an additional 43 billion tonnes of carbon pollution and single-handedly blow Australia's carbon emissions budget. I have little doubt that the McGowan government will roll out the red carpet for this project. In fact, last year, McGowan indicated that he would intervene to keep the project going, even if a push by conservation groups to block Scarborough gas in the WA Supreme Court was successful. Sadly, when I spoke about this six months ago, we were in the same position. Our community is fighting tirelessly against these projects every single day. Just last week, they flooded the EPA with a record-breaking number of appeals against the North West gas shelf expansion. Unlike the government, they know we must stop every new gas and coal project so that reaching net zero is absolutely achievable in this country. And the earlier we begin this inevitable transition, the smoother it will be. We can harness our abundant renewable resources to generate cheap and reliable energy while creating literally hundreds of thousands of jobs. We can take care of fossil fuel workers in this transition. This is the work that the community sent the Greens to this parliament to do. This is the work which we shall, shall you, now Senator get Steele. underway. John, your time has expired. We are now moving to first speeches, and once our leaders are here, we, I'll call um, Senator Stewart.
order, pursuant to order, I now call Senator Stewart to make her first speech and ask senators that the usual courtesy be extended to her. I call Senator Stewart. Thank you. My name is Jana Stewart and I'm a Mati Mati and Wamba Wamba woman with links to country all along the Murray River. I want to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the country where I stand today, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. I want to acknowledge your people's continual connection to this land and place that now houses our national parliament. I want to acknowledge all traditional, tra traditional custodians throughout our nation and their unceded sovereignty to country and waters. President, I congratulate you on your election and I want to congratulate other senators who, like me, have taken their seat in this place for the first time yesterday. I also wish to acknowledge the contribution of two Victorian senators, outgoing Kim Carr and the late Kimberley Kitching. Both have made incredible contributions as Labor representatives. Yeah. Senator Kitching was only 52 when she passed away, far too young. From what I've learned about her, she believed if there was a person without power, then you lend them the power of your advocacy. She was someone with immense courage, and we are all poorer for her loss. President, what an incredible privilege to be standing in this place as the youngest First Nations woman to be elected to our federal parliament. And as I reflect on the path that's brought me here, I'm reminded of the words and the women that have inspired me and will continue to inspire me in this place. To my mum, Josephine Kelly, who said to me, you're the oldest, <laughs> it's your job to let all the sticks and stones hit you, to create a, to create a clear path for your brothers and sisters. My great-grandmother, Alice Kelly, who told me, there is power in the pen. You have to learn the white man's way to be able to fight for your people. And my nan, Elvie Kelly, who reminded me, don't forget where you come from. Ignoring the advice of your nan is never a good idea, <laughs> <laughs> which is why I want to start by thanking some of the people who have helped, me, who have helped get me here. Elvie Kelly and her husband, my pop, Joe Kelly. Both of them are now in the dreaming, but both played a significant role in shaping who I am today. I often get told I'm like my grandmother which is a comparison that I wear with honour. She was a fierce defender. I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> she was a fierce defender of Aboriginal families and children through her work in community life. Professionals across many fields both respected and feared her in equal amounts for her work in criticisms in the systems that often that failed to support the families who needed it most. My pop had a strong work ethic, something that I've inherited. He prided himself on being able to provide for his family and set an expectation for home ownership when he and my nan bought their first home in Swan Hill, which was not something very common at the time for Aboriginal families. Everyone that knew my pop loved him. I need to acknowledge my great-grandmothers, Alice Kelly and Annabelle Jackson, both of whom I was lucky enough to know. It is because of these matriarchs that I know who I am. A Mati Mati Wamba Wamba, Barapa Barapa and Yorta Yorta woman. It is because of them that my children will always know where they belong. And it is because they both survived some of this country's, some of the worst policies our nation has ever seen. They survived this country's attempt at a First Nations genocide. They raised strong Aboriginal children who were taught to be proud of their culture and identity in spite of living in a society that told them that they were not equal because of their Aboriginality. What shoulders? I stand on to be here today. I want to thank my husband Marcus. When I spoke to Marcus about joining the Senate and questioned whether we can do it or not with a six-year-old and another Jew at the, end of, or at the end of August, his immediate response was, of course we can. He said, if this is something that I wanted to do, then we would just do what we've always done. Say yes and figure out the details later. <laughs> so here we are figuring out the details as we go. <laughs> To Jude and his unborn brother, you don't need to understand the sacrifice you'll be making for me to be here in this place. But I watch, what I want you to know is that the work I do in this place is for you. You, along with every Australian child, deserves a country that is better than it is today. My hope is for a nation that is more honest, inclusive, safer, fairer and just. And I hope that my time here can go some way to delivering that for you. My mum, Josephine Kelly, who would tell me that I didn't need that Barbie, we didn't need those material things because we had love. We didn't have a lot growing up and we certainly didn't always have a happy home. But what I can say unequivocally is that we always had love. 
the unconditional, non-judgmental, always honest kind of love. My dad, Ronald Briggs, a proud and staunch Aboriginal man, you didn't have an easy life growing up. You could have stayed angry at the world, but instead you chose to use your pain and experience to help other men get back on the right track. That takes a, tip, a special type of strength and courage that not many people have and not many people think is possible. Thank you for showing me that it is. To my in-laws, Jackie and Ray Stewart, thank you. Marcus and I are the envy of our friends and colleagues because of, the em because of the endless support that you provide us. I would not be able to do this without your love and support. Thank you to my aunties and uncles that have been mothers and fathers to me throughout my life. Thank you to my five siblings who have always looked up to me with an awe that I don't deserve but I will aspire to be worthy of. My thanks to the Victorian Tasmania branch of the Transport Workers Union. In particular, Assistant Secretary Mem Suleiman, former Secretary John Berger, current Secretary Mike McNess and National Secretary Michael Kane. Thank you for your courage and fight now and into the future. President, as I said earlier, I carry with me the words and wisdom of the women who have delivered me to this place. My great-grandmother told me that there is power in the pen. You have to learn the white man's way to be able to fight for your people. For her, it was about the importance of education, understanding the systems and structures in order to change them. It's a lesson I've carried with me throughout my life. I remember sitting in a classroom when I was 15 or 16 years old and a teacher talking about the close the gap statistics. I remember looking around the classroom as one of the only Koori kids in the class. So I remember that as they were relaying all the bad news on the health and life expectations of First Nations people, it felt like they were reading out my future as a First Nations person. I was less likely to finish Year 12. I was less likely to go to university. I was more likely to be unemployed. I was very likely to get a chronic health condition. I was going to die 15 years younger than my peers sitting in the classroom with me. And if I was in a home that had family violence, which I was, my odds of being in a violent relationship sat at 50%. There was no malice in this teacher's lesson, but for me, it felt personal. Hearing and seeing First Nations people being framed and talked about in deficit language is something I would learn is not unique to high school. Each of you sitting in this place will have a report or agenda amongst your emails or on your desk that talks about us in just this way. Never in neutral or positive language, we're always an issue. It's why I ask that everyone in this place and beyond consider carefully how you talk about First Nations matters, because a First Nations person will be listening. Words are powerful and words matter. Like many young people, when I completed high school, I had no idea what I wanted to be when I grew up. And in many respects, I still don't. I'm grateful to my 18-year-old self for making the decision to complete Year 12 and get straight into the workforce. Because for me, it was absolutely the right one. When I first moved to Melbourne, I supported myself with a job in retail. Then I found the role that would put the pot fire in my belly. I called my nan and told her that I got a job at the Victorian Aboriginal Child Care Agency, VACA. And at the time, she laughed. At 18 years old, I was a third generation of my family to work here, and I'm sure I won't be the last. My time at VACA played a significant part in my life because where my nan found her purpose and her drive, I found mine too. The kids I worked with at VACA would call me Auntie Jana. It was a much nicer explanation of who I was to their school friends when I would pick them up and take them to an appointment or spend some time with their mum. But Auntie wasn't just a good cover for their school friends. It also, speaks to the, it also speaks to my connection to them for life. Because these aren't just the kids I once worked with. These are the kids that I see today. I see them at the NAIDOC march or at the footy or I run into them at the Aboriginal Health Service. I get the privilege to watch them grow into young adults. To those young people, please know I carry you and your experiences with me into this place. While I was at VACA, I also managed to fit in a graduate certificate in family therapy at the Bouvery Centre. Bouvery took the university campus to the community. It supported the translation of theoretical family therapy frameworks into Aboriginal ways of working. It was empowering to have our ways acknowledged alongside often white clinical frameworks. From Bouvery, I moved to the Victorian Public Service, where I had the privilege of working with traditional land nations from across the state. The role was created to support traditional land nations to negotiate boundaries between one another. 
When we think about boundaries, both in terms of country but also more, more broadly, we think about them as being a line or a point that divides us. I much prefer the description of a boundary from Jai Dorong man Rodney Carter as being a place that unites us and brings us together. It was also around this period that the state Labor government committed to treaty, piquing my interest in politics for the first time. Until Victoria's commitment to treaty, I'd never really seen the power or the purpose of politics. Treaty is why I became a Labor person. In my curiosity to find out more about the political world, I got a job in the office of Victoria's Minister for Aboriginal Affairs and then later for the Minister for Child Protection. A job that not many people would want or consider a privilege because of how heartbreaking the content is. But for me, I couldn't think of a more important role. I then went on to the Department of Justice, working on a legislative spent conviction scheme, the Stolen of Generations Redress Scheme and the Decriminalisation of Public Intoxication in Victoria. All incredibly important reforms and all well overdue. As I reflect on my career to date, I see that there is a defining thread. With each role that I've worked in, I've increased my area of impact. At VACA, I was working with children. At Bouvery, I was working with families. In the public service, I was working with traditional owner nations. As an advisor, I was working for our state. Now, in the federal parliament, I'm here to help change the nation. None of this was planned for my journey in life and work has prepared me well for this moment at this time and in this place. All that I've achieved and so much of what I want to achieve comes down to a combination of hard work, perseverance, passion and never forgetting where I come from. Thanks, Nan. President, all of these experiences I carry with me today. Some of the areas that I seek to change and the reasons that I seek to change them will make people in this place and outside feel uncomfortable. But I don't care about your discomfort because it's uncomfortable to know and hear the lived experiences of women and children and be part of a system that is complicit in the harm and then do nothing about it. It's uncomfortable to read child death reports. It's uncomfortable to hear that one woman dies every nine days from family violence in this country. It's uncomfortable to hear that I, along with many other parents of colour, will have to teach our children the alphabet at the same time as how, as how to deal with racism in primary school, in high school and in everyday life. So it may be uncomfortable for you, but it's been heartbreaking for me to have comforted, comforted families through their trauma, grief and loss, to have attempted to repair trust in the system. These are not the easy things, but these are the things that matter, because people matter. It was early in my career when I learned about the impact of trauma and secure attachments on healthy brain development. I learned how fundamental it is to a child's success in life to have a healthy and happy first five years. There is a very real and visible difference in the development of children's brain where a child has not had the best start in life. I want you to think about that child who hasn't had the best start in life. I want you to think about that child starting prep. What do you think primary school is going to be like for them? And if we all agree that education is one of the fundamental keys to unlocking opportunities and success in life, what is the likelihood of this child, who has had a really crappy time at school, dropping out early? It should not be a light bulb moment for anyone here to know that lower educational attainment leads to big differences. Big differences in unemployment, underemployment, crime, health outcomes and your dependency on welfare. The cost to the taxpayer for a young person who remains disengaged from work for more than half their life is over $400,000. The full lifetime cost for the entire cohort is $18.8 billion. But this should not only be seen as an economic cost, but a cost to our decency as human beings. And if we know how important healthy relationships and attachment are for brain development in the early years, why do we devalue the critical role, particularly of women, in providing that care? In fact, we don't just devalue it, we punish women for it. With lower paid jobs when they return to the workforce, a gender pay gap, less super when they, when they retire, and an increasing likelihood of homelessness for older women. Which is all funny, given how much our entire economy is built on and relies on women and our unpaid contributions. 
The burden of these failures also falls disproportionately on kids in contact with the justice system, particularly those with unassessed and untreated trauma. President, each child that ends up in our juvenile justice system represents hundreds of missed opportunities. Hundreds of missed opportunities to get in early and help. Instead, we stand eager and ready to blame them and their families for our system's failures. And not, and not all children are treated equally. The resources, race and class of your family, all of which a child has no control over, shouldn't determine your trajectory into the justice system. But it does. President, this moment would represent a missed opportunity if I, don't, if I did not use it to make my views clear. I support the position of the United Nations report on the rights of the child. The, the minimum age of criminal responsibility should be 14 years old. Evidence tells us that neither the broader community or the child benefit from putting them behind bars. In fact, it's proven to be quite the kiss of death for any positive future potential for a child. Criminalising children young almost guarantees they'll be back within a year or two, and in most cases, cements their pathway into the adult system. If our answer to a problem is putting a child who is only in grade four behind bars, a child who has not lost all their baby teeth, who would not be tall enough to get onto some of the rides at the Melbourne show, who could not swim unsupervised in the pool at the caravan park, well then we're definitely asking the wrong questions. I'm not going to stand here and pretend that I have all the answers to all the issues that we face. But what I do know is we can't keep doing more of the same. We must start by seeing investment in families as fundamental to our economic future. In my experience working with families, every parent wants, to have, wants their child to have a better life than what they did. Every parent wants to have a strong and healthy relationship with their child. And when a parent feels like they need a bit of extra support in being able to provide that, this for their families, they should be able to lean on us. There is also lots to say about the experiences of women in this country. I'm sure that you've heard it before too. But one of the things that I'm always reminded of is that black women and women of colour are often left out of the national conversation. Our experiences are never captured in data nor articulated with the same level of importance to those of white women and their families. Even when doing my research for today, it was incredibly challenging to find the data to give visibility and voice to the problem. A silence that speaks volumes. One of the few statistics I could find is one that everybody in this place should be familiar with. Our country has a gender pay gap that sits at 13.8 per cent. But what you don't hear is that the gap for First Nations women when compared to non-Aboriginal men is a huge 32.7 per cent. The pay gap between First Nations women and non-Aboriginal women is roughly 19 per cent. You will hear about how important access is to childcare for women in their careers but you don't hear about what a difference it would make for black women and women of colour. You will see and hear people celebrate diversity in their organisations or teams and then post photos of mostly white, able-bodied women. The guilt or fear of stigmatising multicultural communities by talking about the experiences of women of colour must not outweigh our collective responsibility, responsibility that we have to leave no woman behind. What I want to say is that we notice. What I want to say to black women and women of colour is that I see you I hear you and I stand with you. Because unless our ambition for gender equality actively seeks to bring every woman with us, it's not actually equality. We must be true, deliberate and targeted in our solutions and true in our words when we talk about the experiences of Australian women. Because only then will it truly reflect all of us. I know talking about race and privilege makes people feel uncomfortable. But race and privilege are things that I will always talk about because they're things that we should all be talking about. Whether we like to admit it or not, it shapes everything we do and how we do it. It shapes how we experience the world around us. For example, women from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds are highly vulnerable, particularly from an economic perspective. They're much more likely to experience insecure work and wage theft. With a limited awareness of workplace rights, restricted local networks, or lower educational attainment. Whether it be across our gig economy, transport, retail, hospitality, cleaning, aged care or other low paid industries, it's by and large our multicultural communities doing the hardest work for the lowest pay. 
and it seems that Australia suffers from a racial empathy gap, a term coined in a concept confirmed by studies that shows there is less empathy felt for people of colour. It's why whenever I hear someone that they don't see colour, what I really hear them say is that they're uncomfortable with it, because it would mean having to understand or acknowledge the experiences of black people and people of colour in this country. It is, it is easy way out to say that you don't see colour. What a privilege it must be to be able to choose not to see colour. President, it would take a special kind of male arrogance for me to assume that I could give voice and visibility to all black women and women of colour in our country. It's going to take a team effort. The great news is that our Labor team is looking more powerful than it ever has. With the most culturally diverse and gender balanced caucus in the history of any government. It's a milestone I'm proud to be a part of. Now we need to move beyond just looking like the country we're here to represent and add some colour to our words and our actions. President, another matter close to my heart, ensuring that people in the country communities have the access and equity they deserve. As I've said, when I completed Year 12 at Swan Hill College, I didn't know what I wanted to do. But what I did know was that there was no career opportunities for me if I stayed. So I made the call to move to Melbourne. But a young person who lives in the country should be able to stay in their hometown if they choose to and be confident about the equality of jobs av available to them. Individuals and families in these communities should be afforded the same mental health, family support and health care that's afforded to people who live in the cities. And older Australians in regional areas, people who've often built these communities with their own hands, should be able to remain in their communities if and when they need aged care. It's why I'm so proud of Labor's focus on regional equity, regional equity, investments in infrastructure and services that will help bridge the divide between metro and country, working with regional communities to embed a regional lens in all that we do is critical, because nobody knows the needs of a, of a community better than the people who call it home. Our rural, remote and First Nations communities are also feeling the impacts of climate change. Because even though it's the most marginalised communities and groups who contribute the least to this issue, they're often the first to feel the brunt of it. Entire crops are being washed out due to floods, pushing the cost of fruit and vegetables up. Our kids are growing up in a world where more and more animals are added to the endangered or extinct list. And traditional owners who have cared for country for tens of thousands of years are seeing it charred and sacred sites destroyed. We needed urgent action on climate change a decade ago, but today is better than tomorrow. We must ensure that individuals, families and communities who rely on the very industries that need to be phased out are prioritised as we bring in newer and cleaner ways to power our nation. This is only fair, given they have served as Australia's engine room for so long. Together, we will reset our country as a renewable superpower. And traditional owners who, who have the responsibility for taking care of country must have a seat at the table because their interests are so personally and culturally aligned when we talk about our land, our animals, our waterways and our air. Our plan for climate action is, is squarely focused on protecting country and delivering for Australians and families and communities. Labor governments have a proud history of protecting the environment and I'm proud to be part of a team that will continue this legacy. Earlier, you heard me use the word genocide. I'm not using it to inflict feelings of guilt or to cause you to call back from my words. I use the word genocide because it's a hard truth about the history of this country. For those who don't know what the definition of Article 2 of Genocide Convention is, it has five criteria. Killing members of the group, causing serious bodily harm, bodily or mental harm to the members of a group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within a group, forcibly transferring children of a group to another group. I note the definition suggests that committing any one of these acts with the intent to destroy a group would meet the definition of genocide. I note that Australia meets all five. I truly believe that one of the barriers to our success as a rich multicultural nation is the weight of collective shame and guilt we carry because of our history. We carry this because we haven't been able to reconcile. And we haven't been able to reconcile because we skipped a critical step as a nation. 
telling the truth. Anyone who has done any work in conflict resolution systems theories knows how fundamental honesty is for resolution and recon reconciliation. It's difficult to reconcile when there is no accurate, agreed or shared record of this country's history. It's why our nation is in desperate need for a national truth-telling process. We've seen some truth-telling in our time with the apology to the stolen generations, the nation-leading Europe Justice Commission in Victoria, the Bringing Them Home report and the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. We've also had Royal Commissions into aged care, banks and institutional responses to child sexual abuse. Royal Commissions have a strong and proven history of being able to set the record straight. The only difference with the ones focused on First Nations people is that there is no collective outrage when the recommendations are not implemented. I'm proud that in my home state of Victoria we are leading the nation with our work on treaty. That is in large part to the relentless advocacy of the mob in Victoria and the work of the First Peoples Assembly and helped by having a progressive government with the courage to do the right thing. Treaty will deliver genuine self-determination for our communities and for First Nations groups. Voice, treaty and truth is our ask. Meet us in the moment and walk with us. In conclusion, Mr. President, Mr. President, President <laughs> there are plenty of ways to change the world, whether it's holding a placard or holding someone's hand. But being in this place provides a unique opportunity and a profound responsibility. It speaks to that last piece of wisdom, the words of my mum who told me, you're the oldest, it's your job to let all the sticks and stones hit you to create a clearer path for your brothers and sisters. In many respects, her words apply to all of us in this place. It's our job to absorb the sticks and stones, to make sure there's, there's something better and fairer for the next generation and the generation after that. I know there are days it won't be easy, but we are in the business of nation building. We are building a nation defined by opportunity, whether you were born here, drawn here, or whether you have called it home for tens of thousands of years. We are building a nation that protects and invests in its children and grandchildren. A nation that is grounded in truth, integrity, equality, fairness, compassion and action. A nation, President, courageous enough to recognise its past and determined enough to change its future. A nation that we can all be proud of. Thank you.
Senators, pursuant to order, I now call Senator Nampa Jimpa Price to make her first speech and ask senators that the usual courtesies be extended to her. I call Senator Nampa Jimpa Price. Yeah. Thank you, Madam President. I am immensely honoured to be standing here before you as part of the 47th Parliament of Australia as the Senator for the Northern Territory. The Northern Territory is not only geographically Australia's gateway to South East Asia, but it is a place of rich diversity and spectacular landscape. We boast some of the largest agricultural and mining industries operations in the nation, along with a prevalent representation of multiculturalism, Aboriginal land titles and language-speaking Aboriginal people. As a true Territorian, it is this rich mix of coexistence that makes me proud to say I always was and always will be a proud Australian. The growth of the Northern Territory and our government as the youngest state or territory in Australia has been rapid and should not be lost in any dialogue. The Territory, as its own jurisdiction of self-governance, is two years older than I am. My mother was born under a tree and lived within an original Warpri structured environment through a kinship system on Aboriginal land. Her fa first language was Warpri and her parents, my grandparents, had only just come into contact with white settlers in their early adolescence. Despite this rapid advancement, much has been achieved and gained. The Northern Territory calls a spade a spade. We are realists and, is like, and this is likely due to the direct connection to our environment. We have space to think and the harsh reality of our country is that you need to be very aware of your surroundings and yourself, otherwise you could perish rather quickly. We have a foundation of a sophisticated but brutal culture where it was kill or be killed over resources such as water, women and later livestock, food for survival, or from doing the wrong thing, like marrying the wrong way or sharing knowledge that's not yours to share. Like many countries around the world, when cultures collide and are forced to find ways through socialisation, everyone is affected. Often, those that are left behind become even more marginalised and are preyed upon by many opportunists for monetary gain, power and control. This is no different to what we are experiencing in the Northern Territory by labour design. Wadde, Tennant Creek, my family's community of Yundamu, nobody in Australia can pretend they don't know the names of these places and for all the worst reasons. Despite billions being spent, the violence and despair that puts these places and many others like them in the headlines is not changing. We need change and we need the right legislation to affect it. My vision, my hope, my goal is that we can affect change that will see women, children and other victims in these communities become as safe as any of those living in Sydney, Melbourne or any other Australian city. <laughs> My goal is to halt the pointless virtue signalling and focus on the solutions that bring real change, yeah. that changes the lives of Australia's most vulnerable citizens, solutions that give them real lives, not the enduring nightmare of violence and terror they currently live. It is not good enough that the streets of our Northern Territory towns and other towns across regional Australia have gangs of children aged 6 to 16 wandering around with no adult supervision in the early hours of the morning. It is not good enough that almost all of these children have witnessed or been subject to normalised alcohol abuse, domestic, family and sexual violence throughout their young lives and is the reason for their presence on our streets. Such neglect in great numbers 
would not be accepted in the prosperous suburbs of our capital cities. My colleague and Shadow Minister for Indigenous Australians, Julian Lisa, witnessed firsthand these scenes on the streets of my hometown of Alice Springs and nearby communities on his recent visit. I don't know where else in Australia a member of federal parliament can provide a tour of the numerous places their direct family members have been violently murdered or died of alcohol abuse, suicide or alcohol-related accidents. On one route, I pointed out seven separate incidents relating to places we had visited and made reference to numerous other incidents across the Northern Territory, all just within my own family. Just last week, 30-year-old mother of three, Alina, Tamina, Kukla and her two-month-old baby boy, Orlando, were shot dead in what is coming to light as a murder-suicide. The families involved and our community are reeling from these not only deeply tragic but, I believe, avoidable murders. From conversations with, their fa with her family, I've been informed her alleged killer had a, violent, a history of violence, mental, mental illness and was due to face court for perpetrating violence against a former partner. We have a well-oiled supposed justice system in the Northern Territory that acts as a turnstile for offenders. More often than not, instead of being remanded, perpetrators are put on bail. And more often than not, while on bail, they perpetrate more violence. If the perpetrator had been dealt with appropriately, eight-year-old Isaiah and three-year-old Tyson would not be without a mother and baby brother. The system is broken when it serves perpetrators exceptionally better than victims. Another Indigenous woman in Catherine was killed by a woman close to her in a domestic violence incident in the same week. These killings occur so regularly in the Northern Territory that locals can't help but feel desensitisation. Perhaps it is because of the scant or often wrong reporting from the media or the reluctance of the police media to report publicly. These days, we rely on social media and independent media outlets to provide our territory communities with relevant details. The mainstream media have largely been silent on these latest killings. It has not sparked nationwide protests because the Indigenous victims have died at the hands of Indigenous perpetrators. Alina and Orlando were Australian citizens like you and me. They deserve outrage to demand an end to violence and murder. They deserve to be acknowledged the same way the women who protested to this very parliament deserve to be acknowledged. Their lives, like so many other lives taken in black-on-black -black violence, deserve better. Community safety is pertinent to the lives of all Australians, and supporting our authorities to successfully provide community safety is key to ensuring it. When a child is forced to report sexual abuse, it is a police officer they must report to. Therefore, the strength of this relationship will determine the success of a conviction. The police officer may be the only person that child can truly trust. Yet, there is an activist class determined to destroy the healthy relationships between our authorities and these vulnerable members of our society who need them the most. We must uphold the rights of all Australian children by maintaining the same high standards of quality of care for every child and never lower these standards based on racial identity. Nor should we do the same for any Australian citizen under any circumstances relating to social need. Perhaps it is time to give serious consideration to transferring state and territory responsibility for the lives of children to the Commonwealth. I'm acutely aware of the many failures of states and territories child protection systems to uphold and prioritise the rights of Australian children who are not just our nation's most vulnerable but who are our future. If we protect our most vulnerable, 
and hold to account those who cause them harm, we can reduce violence and sexual abuse. Our focus must be to represent the interests of the victims before the perpetrators. However, reducing violence and sexual abuse also reduces rates of incarceration. In the 30 years since the handing down of the Royal Commission into Black Deaths in Custody, we are told there have been 450 black deaths in custody. Despite the expectation the Commission would find systemic racism a fundamental factor contributing to these deaths, the report found it was not in fact the case. Nor did it find Indigenous Australians more likely than others to be incarcerated, but that we are grossly overrepresented. Our greatest problems lie with the fact that in the same 30 years, over 750 Indigenous Australians were murdered at the hands of other Indigenous Australians. Yet there is little concern or acknowledgement that this is why Indigenous Australians are incarcerated at such high rates. We cannot support legislation that for fails to acknowledge the true causes of why Indigenous Australians are marginalised or false narratives that suggest racism is the cause when it has been proven over and again that this is not the case. We cannot support legislation that prioritises freedom of the perpetrator over justice for the victim in an attempt to reduce rates of incarceration or to minimise responsibility for criminal behaviour for the same purposes. The same standard of law and order must be upheld for all Australians, regardless of background. We must not allow the racism of low expectations to prevail. In his book, Arresting Incarceration, Pathways Out of Indigenous Imprisonment, Don Weatherburn, the former director of the New South Wales Bureau of Crime, Statistics and Research, outlines the causes that lead to incarceration. Leading factors include poor parenting, child abuse and neglect, poor school attendance and unemployment. These factors are cause for any person, regardless of race, to be more likely to commit an offence leading to incarceration. Just like Indigenous Australians are overrepresented in prisons, so too are they overrepresented in causal factors. Better employment outcomes contribute to better functioning households, where children are more likely to attend school more often. Like my distinguished predecessor, Senator Neville Bonner, I believe free enterprise coupled with sound fiscal management in a progressive commercial environment forms the basis for economic independence. In other words, business and jobs are the key to economic health for a community, not the shackles of welfare dependency. Under the current Land Rights Act, coupled with growing welfare dependency, this environment has not had the opportunity to materialise for the marginalised traditional owners of the Northern Territory. This is a parlous situation I am determined to improve. The intent of the Act was to provide access to conduct traditional activity and provide opportunity for economic use. But despite traditional owners having around 45 per cent of the Northern Territory land mass and 80 per cent of the coastline under the Act, and it serving over 30 per cent of the Northern Territory population, it has failed to deliver economic independence or generate employment opportunities. Traditional owners have been left to pick the lock that the layers of gatekeepers have welded so hard around the Act. Despite over 90 per cent of the land claims being completed across the Northern Territory and connection already being proven for generations, traditional owners are still being forced to repeatedly prove connection to place to successive anthropologists and representative bodies under the influence of opportunistic Indigenous community politics. It is a constant cycle of Indigenous industry gravy-trained consumers in a static system that gathers under the banner of opportunistic collectivism. I believe in small government, which equates to small bureaucracy, so that Australians may get on with their lives more effectively. We must better determine where our national budget is being spent effectively and change expenditure, expenditure accordingly where it is not. Fiscal management 
is integral to the success of a nation and therefore must be a leading component in all decision making. We have seen the immediate impact of the new Labor government's minimum wage increase forcing small businesses to close. The cries of business people struggling with cost of living pressures, whose livelihoods are now destroyed, have fallen on deaf ears. This would have not occurred under a coalition-led government. Tax cuts are what delivers an increase in a worker's pay packets on payday. Tax cuts are what supports small businesses to survive through the pressures of increased cost of living to ensure they do not have to lay off workers or close altogether. It is not only the private sector that is suffering. Non-government organisations that provide services to victims in domestic violence situations are now being forced to reduce staff numbers. These staff specialise in work specific to supporting victims of abuse and the reduction of family and domestic violence. Careful consideration must always be taken when delivering legislation so as not to produce outcomes that exacerbate already difficult circumstances. Due to the impacts of the recent pandemic, our nation is currently struggling with a worker shortage across many sectors and industries. Foreign workers have played an integral part in maintaining a strong and functioning national economy. The agriculture visa that the farming and agricultural industries have been desperately calling for must be implemented. Their family businesses should not suffer any more than they have during the last few years, where millions of dollars of crops have gone to waste for lack of availability of a workforce. The flow-on effects disrupt food supply and place strain on our economy. The strengthening of our national security and defence systems must be prioritised, given the geopolitical threats we are currently faced with. Simultaneously, we must encourage all Australians to recognise and take pride in our national identity, as historically we have done effortlessly. Without a sense of unity and pride, we leave ourselves vulnerable to external forces that would delight in our demise. Yeah. Along with my fellow senators, we have been elected to the 47th parliament to represent Australians of all backgrounds, to be the voice of the voiceless. But in order to do this, we must listen with intent and serve with integrity. It is not for us to be silent on issues that affect a particular demographic that we may not ethnically originate from or the gender we do not belong to. The purpose of our successful Westminster system is to courageously represent the interests of all. The tireless investment and effort of the former coalition government provide a record funding for education support through scholarships and concentrated programs and investments such as the Yellow Shirt Program, Getting Kids to School, Investing in State and Territory Governments, Universities and Organisations. We know that education provides choices. We invested hard so that better choices have resulted in better communities and lives. We now see these benefits of this investment with more Indigenous doctors, architects, lawyers, teachers, business owners and tradespeople. Thank you to our Liberal and National Party leaders, and to the Country Liberal Party, my Country Liberal Party predecessor, Senator Nigel Scullion, and to every Indigenous person who took this opportunity to build a better future for yourselves and our nation. Your efforts are acknowledged. In Australia, we have experienced historically significant acts of symbolism that include the 1991 reconciliation walk across Sydney Harbour Bridge. For six hours, 250,000 Australians of all backgrounds walked together to demonstrate the fact we are not racist but are overwhelmingly in support of Aboriginal Australia. We have spent a week every year since commemorating this event and what it means. Throughout Australia, the reinvention of culture has brought us welcome to country or recognition of country as standard ritual practice before events, meetings and social gatherings by governments, corporates, institutions, primary schools, kindergartens, high schools, universities, workplaces, music festivals, gallery openings, conferences, airline broadcasts and so on and so forth. I personally 
have had more than my fill of being symbolically recognised. <laughs> it has become a racial stereotype that we Australians of Indigenous heritage should belong to and support the Labor Party. It was an exchange with former leader of the Labor Party, Bill Hayden, who conveyed this very stereotype that compelled Neville Bonner to confirm his membership within the Liberal Party of Australia. Bonner had been handing out how to vote cards for a Liberal friend when Hayden exclaimed, What are you doing handing out those how to vote cards? We do more for you bloody Aborigines than those bastards do. Well, Bonner thought, how dare someone come up to me and presume that because I'm black, I should support a particular party? It is the same attitude we hear with platitudes of motherhood statements from our now Prime Minister, who suggests without any evidence whatsoever that a voice to parliament bestowed upon us through the virtuous act of symbolic gesture by this government is what is going to empower us. This government has yet to demonstrate how this proposed voice will deliver practical outcomes and unite rather than drive a wedge further between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australia. And no, Prime Minister, we don't need another handout as you have described the Uluru Statement to be. No, we Indigenous Australians have not come to agreement on this statement, as also what you have claimed. It would be far more dignifying if we were recognised and respected as individuals in our own right who are not simply defined by our racial heritage but by the content of our character. Yeah. I am an empowered, warrior Celtic Australian woman who did not and has never needed a paternalistic government to bestow my own empowerment upon me. We have proven for decades now that we do not need a chief protector of Aborigines. I have not got here, along with ten other Indigenous voices, including my colleague, Senator for South Australia, Karen Little, to this 47th Parliament of Australia, like every other parliamentarian. Through hard work and sheer determination, that is how we got here. However, now you want to ask the Australian people to disregard our elected voices and vote yes to apply a constitutionally enshrined advisory body without any detail of what that might in fact entail. Perhaps a word of advice, since that is what you're seeking. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to everyone, and not just those who support your virtue signalling agenda, but also to those you contradict. We see, clear, we, we see two clear examples this week of this failure to listen. The news that grog bans will be lifted on dry communities, allowing the scourge of alcoholism and the violence that accompanies it free reign, despite warnings from elders of those communities about the coming damage. Coupled with this, the removal of the cashless debit card that allowed countless families on welfare to feed their children yeah. Yeah. rather than seeing their money claimed by kinship demand from alcoholics, substance abusers and gamblers in their own family group. I could not offer two more appalling examples of legislation pushed by left-wing elites that are guaranteed to worsen the lives of Indigenous people. Yet at the same time, we spend days and weeks each year recognising Aboriginal Australia in many ways, in symbolic gestures that fail to push the needle one micromillimetre toward improving the lives of the most marginalised in any genuine way. But we must always remember that our nation is not simply black and white. We are rich with the contribution of Australians of many backgrounds, 30 per cent of who were born overseas. And this is one of our greatest strengths as a nation. My elders taught me that any child who was conceived in our country holds within them the baby spirit of the creator ancestor from the land. In other words, 
Australian children of all backgrounds belong to this land. They too have chukurpa, dreaming, and they too are connected spiritually to this country. This is what I know true reconciliation to be. These teachings cannot be delivered through legislation, nor through any corporate reconciliation action plan. These teachings are about what it means to be a modern human in an ancient land. It's time to stop feeding into a narrative that promotes racial divide, a narrative that claims to try to stamp out racism but applies racism in doing so and encourages a racist overreaction. Yes, it is time for some truth-telling. Our nation's school's sole responsibility should be to educate, not indoctrinate. But we have in recent times witnessed the overwhelming politicisation of our children. Children are now encouraged to skip school, to be paraded as activists spearheads by adults who place the weight of the world on their shoulders. Meanwhile, children in remote communities where school attendance rates are in some places as low as 19 per cent, do not have the privilege of gaining an education that the activist class take for granted. Everyone wants to be an activist, to push governments to solve their dilemmas, but no one wants to be responsible for themselves. Our aim should not be to blame our current democratic institutions for all our perceived failures, but to encourage individual responsibility of all Australians. Where we fail is where we encourage others to believe responsibility for one's own life can be avoided and the disadvantage can be charged to another. We need to focus on nation building, not nation burning. Our laws, as they stand now, are not racist, as some will claim, but exist because we have overcome historical racist legislation. I would like to acknowledge each and every proud Australian who has joined me, supported me and inspired me on my journey to this day. I would like to pay my respects to our nation's elders of all backgrounds who came together through hard work and sheer determination to forge an Australia we can all be proud of and whose shoulders I stand on at this momentous occasion. I want to thank my husband, Colin Lilly, for challenging me to challenge myself whenever I've needed. Thanks to my sons, Leland Castle, Ethan Castle, Declan Castle and Kincaid Lilly, for your many forms of love that have nourished me. I want to acknowledge my brother, Lino, his life ended too soon, but his love is always with me. I also want to acknowledge those who have worked to support the goals and aims I have outlined today, including my mother, former Northern Territory Minister, Bess Nore Price, my father, David Duramandala Price, the Country Liberal Party of the Northern Territory, the Centre of Independent Studies, my Dada Tess Ross, and my Pulipuli Teresa Ross, Heidi Williamson, Tamara Giles, Sharon Long, Warren Mundine, Elizabeth Henderson, Jamie DeBrenny, Peter Cochran, Susan Ingram, Jim Franklin, Irene Drazoulis, Anthony Dillon, my mixed up black fella, white fella family, <laughs> who've done nothing but love me all my life. And lastly, the people of the Northern Territory for trusting me to represent you. I'm here to represent the Northern Territory, but also to support people across Australia who are experiencing the same problems and to help us all work towards real and lasting change. For Indigenous Australians, white Australians, from a myriad of other cultural backgrounds. Australian Wati, Yungalapa, Mapari, Wargikarmi. In other words, for all Australians.
So order. We will now be moving to the consideration of documents. Could I ask those who are not participating in this part of the Senate's proceedings to please leave the chamber and those senators who are remaining to take their seats in silence? So order, we are now moving to the consideration of documents, and documents are listed on page four of today's order of business. I'm conscious with such a long list that party whips may have a number of documents that they wish to keep, uh, seek leave to keep uh, on the record. So I will go to Senator Ciccone initially. No, uh, I'll go to Senator Askew. Note of items 1 and 2 on page 4, item 7, 11, 13, 14, 15, uh, 18. Senator so Askew, we're just going to do documents first. This is documents. Okay, sorry. Yep. Sorry, 18 on page 5, so 15, 18 on page 5. 21, 23, 25, 28, 32 and 34 on page 6. 35, 37, 38, 39 and 40 on page 7 and wish to uh, seek leave to continue remarks on each of those. Thank you. Senator McKim. I'm sorry, is leave granted Thank for um, remarks to be continued? Is granted. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I uh, take note of documents 14, 16, 29, 38 and 61, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Ciccone. Deputy President, um, could I also seek leave to uh, note and take leave at document number, num number nine on the list as well, too? Thank number you. Nine is leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Roberts. Uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, uh, I seek leave to preserve speaking up opportunities for a later date uh, to take note of the document number 18 on page 5 and document number 62 on page 10. And to continue your remarks? And, and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank it's you. Leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, Senator Steele-John. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note of document number uh, 72, the report of the FADT uh, References Committee, Australia's involvement in Afghanistan. Uh, we're, we're not actually on the I reports. seek leave to speak to it. Yes, we're not actually to the point of reports yet. We're just doing documents. Oh, uh, our apologies. Deputy that's fine. Chair. Are there any other Sorry. people who wish to uh, seek leave to continue their remarks on this very long list? Uh, I will then go to speakers on the documents, but we need to deal with uh, anyone who wishes to seek leave to continue. Senator Hanson Young. Yes, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to um, continue my remarks for. Item 38. It may have been captured in what others have mentioned, but I didn't hear it, so I'm just asking that we save sure. that one. Yes, leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. In that case, now, do any senators wish to speak to the documents on uh, page four? We'll start with page four. Senator Van. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy Chair. I rise to speak to number one on the list the building and construction industry improving. Im Improving Productivity Act quarterly report by the Commonwealth Ombudsman for the period 1 July to 30 September 2021. We've seen, and I've spoken a few times today in this chamber, about acts of cutting out accountability, transparency, 
that this new government have already undertaken that is going to take away protections of everyday Australians. And I'd note in particular the destruction of the Australian Building and Construction Commission that was announced shockingly on Sunday and enacted yesterday by those opposite. The role of the ABCC is to uphold the law and change behaviour to make the building and construction industry fair, efficient and productive. This is an important and just objective. I think everyone in this chamber would agree that no matter what industry you work in, you want it to be safe and that the rule of law that underpins our society is upheld. There is no doubt that our construction industry is key to Australia's economic recovery, accounting for 9 per cent of economic output and employing 1.5 million people, which is why the last quarterly report presented here today is vitally important, because it is a review of the powers exercised by the Commissioner of the ABCC. In essence, this document looks at whether the ABCC acting accordingly under its responsibilities to ensure that law is upheld in the building industry and that it is fair, efficient and productive. I think it would, be, it would please everyone here today that the Ombudsman found, in their view, the ABCC was compliant against the requirements and standards and that they, and I quote, encouraged the ABCC to continue its existing positive practices. By all accounts, one would say it's a markedly positive review, which is why it now astounds me that we see a government looking to rip the ABCC's powers away from them. The ABCC was created to tackle lawlessness in the construction se sector. In recent analysis undertaken by EY, it outlined that abolishing the ABCC could create ongoing challenges which are more likely to, to, to be more economically disruptive in the current business environment. Specifically, labour costs could increase by around 8.8 per cent and a potential decline in productivity of around 9.3 per cent. Not only that, but the output of the construction industry could fall by around $35.4 billion by 2030, and economic activity could de decline by $47.5 billion again by 2030. This would come at a potential cost to taxpayers in the order of $9.5 billion and an estimated reduction in investment of $45.6 billion. They are clearly needed now more than ever. Just, over, it, just the last month, the federal court delivered record fines of $840,000 against the CFMMEU and its officials after the Building Commission prosecuted the union for coercive behaviour across multiple building projects. It is evidently clear that there are unions out there who think that they are a law unto themselves and they will bully and harass anyone that gets in their way. The ABCC, or Tony Burke's announcement that the ABC's powers were being pulled back to a bare minimum proves again that Labor will capitulate to their paymasters at the CFMEU. The mass, um, it is the last time the Labor Party abolished the ABCC, the cost of in infrastructure rose to an astounding 30 per cent higher. That's a lot of hospitals, roads, schools, etc., that won't be built. Without the ABCC, the Labor Party are leaving workers defenceless against thuggish and unlawful behaviour. The Commission's critical work supporting subcontractors recovered $1.69 million owed to subcontractors following ABC intervention in the 2021 period. This is money going back into the pockets of everyday Australians. For all the Labor Party's talk of transparency and integrity, their actions could not be further from their words. Reserve, reserve my right to continue my remarks. Noted. Uh, does anyone else wish to speak to documents on page four? In that case, other than those that have been held over, we will move to page five. Does any senator seek the call to speak to a document listed on page five? Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President.
As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I speak to the Auditor's General Performance Audit titled Snowy II Governance of Early Implementation. Some background for those who may be new to this project. Snowy II is an extension of the Snowy Hydro project, hence the name. In 2017, Prime Minister Turnbull announced the cost of Snowy II as $2 billion. This report states the cost is now $5.1 billion, plus billions of other costs totalling well over $10 billion. Completion date is out to 2025, so we can expect further cost blowouts. The project involves using electricity from unreliable sources like wind and solar to pump water from a lower reservoir, Talbingo Dam, through underground pipes to an upper reservoir, Tatangara Dam. Water is then sent back down to Talbingo Dam, generating electricity on the way. Snowy 2 is referred to as a big battery because water is stored in the top reservoir until it's needed. The same turbine is either pumping water uphill or generating electricity from the water coming down. Total pipe length, 27 kilometres. Generally, water is pumped up during the day, provided the sun is shining and the wind is blowing. The water is then released down the pipe to generate electricity in the evening peak when it's most needed. As the sun does not shine and wind does, goes quiet at night, pumping water back up the hill overnight, ready for the morning peak, will need coal power. The upper reservoir may hold multiple days' worth of water, and at some point the dam must be refilled, especially at, as Tatangara Dam is currently only 17 per cent full. Pumped hydro only works when the dam has water in it. For every megawatt of power generated by water coming down the hill, the turbine needs 1.3 megawatts of power to get the water back up because of losses. In total, 30 per cent more coal is used in using Snowy 2. Pumped hydro, put simply, entails generating electricity 2.3 times to be used by consumers once. This is not cheap electricity. It's actually really expensive electricity. The solar and wind fairy tale needs pumped hydro as a way of storing unreliable wind and power generation, which occurs mostly during the day, and moving that capacity to the evening peak when unreliable solar and wind can't provide baseload power. Maximum generation for Snowy 2 is an impressive 2,000 megawatts. But here's the catch. Annual generation is listed in this report as 350,000 megawatt hours. Running at full capacity, Snowy 2 will generate electricity for only 175 hours a year. To put that in, into perspective, my home state of Queensland used 68,000, 68 million megawatt hours last year. Snowy Hydro will contribute the equivalent of one half of 1 per cent of Queensland's power each year. One tenth of 1 per cent of Australia's annual generation at a cost of $5 billion and rising. And that doesn't include all the costs. This madness will send us broke. There's a far better way. A 2,000 megawatt coal-fired power station is able to run at 2,000 megawatts 98 per cent of the time, 24-7. Liddell in the Hunter Valley generated 9 million megawatts last year. For less than the cost of this green fairy tale called Snowy 2, a coal plant can produce at least 25 times the amount of electricity. That's why Germany's Greens Coalition government is turning Germany's coal-fired power stations back on. Shutting ours down when we see what's happening in the rest of the world is criminal irresponsibility. Prime Minister Albanese is, promised, is promising reduced electricity prices while at the same time building horribly expensive power generation. <laughs> the Prime Minister's agenda will fail and he will take Australia down with him. Instead, One Nation will build baseload power stations, reduce the cost of electricity, restore grid reliability, restore grid stability, restore Australian manufacturing and restore the income of working Australians. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Are there any other senators who wish to speak to documents on page five? In case other than those where people have sought leave through the whips, we will move to page six. Are there any senators who wish to speak to documents on page six? Senator Bragg. Thanks very much, uh, Acting President. Um, I would like to talk about item 20, which is about the uh, National Audit Office's review of the uh, Commonwealth Super Corporation Board. Very exciting review, I know. And uh, what I'd like to say is that it is very good that we have the Audit Office, which is able to look at 
the, the structure and operation of government organisations. Uh, now, in this particular case, uh, this very exciting review has made some recommendations that the Commonwealth Super Corporation itself has decided that it would adopt. Uh, but it is, a, uh, it is a review that's going to make some small improvements, um, maybe a bit like moving uh, deck chairs on, on the Titanic. Um, the bigger issue here is why would we have a situation where the Commonwealth Government is running its own superannuation fund or sovereign wealth fund called the Future Fund. Um, it also is running a Commonwealth super corporation. Um, and then separately, we're running an enormous superannuation scheme for the public, which costs the budget an absolute bomb, uh, doesn't work particularly well, charges the Australian people $30 billion a year in fees, and doesn't make any improvement to the budget over the long term. So you've got a, a public pension scheme outsourced to the private sector, which is completely failing uh, as measured by returns to taxpayer over the long term, as measured by theft of the Australian people's savings, uh, as measured through some of the highest fees in the world. And as I say, you have a highly successful future fund, which is run by the Commonwealth, you have a Commonwealth Super Corporation. We've had a very exciting inquiry into that, that board's uh, governance, which, by the way, is all, all pretty much good. Now, why wouldn't we entertain a conversation about merging those entities and then allowing the public to invest into the future fund or that future fund to become a default fund, uh, given its strong performance over a very long period of time? I would think that would be quite a good idea, uh, given that the whole concept of super, of course, is a government-mandated scheme. So you have a very successful future fund, which has uh, beaten the super funds that the public are forced to invest in over the long term. You have a Commonwealth Super Corporation, which is running the administration of, the organi of, of a large uh, super fund-like organisation, which is managing the public's requirements, the public being Commonwealth public servants and former Commonwealth public servants. Uh, so I think in this parliament one of the things we should be pursuing is how can we get the Australian people better bang for their buck in superannuation and how can we deploy the organisations of the Commonwealth here through the Future Fund and the Commonwealth Super Corporation to deliver that aim. Because ultimately, if we are going to force people to put their money away into a lockbox and we have a perfectly well-functioning and high-performing government agency, why would we not do that? And one of the policies I'd like uh, my party to seriously consider developing and trying to work with uh, other colleagues and other parties on in this parliament is a better deal for the Australian people if they are going to be forced to have this superannuation scheme into the future forever. And I think that we can deploy these organisations for the benefit of the Australian people. Uh, thank you, Senator Bragg. Are you seeking leave to continue your remarks? I don't believe I am. Am I? <laughs> I am. I am. How did you know? Thank uh, you. Telepathic, Senator Bragg. So you're seeking leave to, leave to continue your remarks. Did, were there any other senators wanting to take note of documents? Uh, Senator Pocock. Thank you. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I take note of document 47, um, which relates to grant approvals through the Australian Research Council. And I would just note that this is not my first speech. Um, docu document number 47 is a small document, just a few pages, uh, but it deals with a, a big issue. Our country is facing huge challenges, climate action, inequality, dealing with a pandemic. To deal with these issues, we need the very best research and the very best university graduates. Document 47 lists an important set of new university research funding through the Australian Research Council's linkage and centre grant allocations. I want to acknowledge the extraordinary efforts of our country's researchers that lies beneath every line of these grants. Our nation's researchers spend their summers crafting and redrafting and honing, based on peer review, their proposals that face our biggest challenges. They're trying to get them as good as they can. 
I know because I've spent many a summer and I bear some of those scars. Writing those applications takes persistence and a ridiculous level of optimism because they have only a 33 per cent chance of success. Grants on things like these are listed in document 47, creating climate-ready uh, um, social housing, improving the well-being of our healthcare workforce, creating greener ro roads and waterways and preventing abuse of people with disability. I'd like to make three points in relation to this document and what it symbolises. Firstly, we need to keep politics out of the Australian Research Council. The selection processes are robust. Indeed, they're often onerous. They're lengthy and they're very thorough. While we might certainly improve on those processes and make them less resource intensive, we need to make sure the process ret retains its integrity and that politics is kept out of the decision making. Secondly, we need to increase our funding for research. I know from personal experience as a peer review over many years how many excellent proposals don't make the cut. This is because we put too little money into research in this country. The 33 per cent success rate reflects too little money for all these critical research tasks that we face. Thirdly, projects like these need our very best people on the job, working under the conditions that let them get the job done. We need to make sure our researchers and academics are treated fairly. I'm sure that many Australians would be shocked to learn that 69 per cent of our university workforce now work on casual or limited term contracts. These are our uni teachers, our researchers, and half of our university teaching force is now made up of casuals. Our kids and our students deserve better. To keep our best researchers, we need to reform the casual conversion provisions in the national employment standards to allow university workers employed from semester to semester for year after year to convert from casual to permanent. People like Dr Lara McKenzie, who I met today, a researcher of 10 years at one of our most prestigious universities, the University of Western Australia, currently re researching COVID vaccination behaviours and don't we need that research? but kept on a casual contract year after year. She's been doing that for over a decade. We also need to stop endemic wage theft in our universities. The National Tertiary Education Union has recovered over 30 million from our universities who have underpaid their staff in recent years. Our country needs our best research from our best researchers, and we need our university students to be taught by the best. So in sum, we need to keep politics out of our university research funding. We need to put, put enough money there to get the research done on the big challenges we face. And finally, we have to attract and retain the best university teachers and researchers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Pocock. Are you seeking leave to continue your remarks? Uh, the question is then that the Senate take note of the document. All those uh, in favour say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Any other senators seeking to take note of documents? Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I seek to take note of uh, document 62 on page 10. Sorry, Senator Roberts. We aren't quite at that point in the program yet because that is a committee report, not a document. Okay, thank so you. So if you wait but a moment, I suspect we'll be moving on to that section very shortly. Any other senators seeking to take note of documents? No. In that case, we will move to the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Um, and I might follow the lead of the previous chair and ask the whips if they have um, some documents. Oh, sorry, some reports and responses they'd like to consider first. Senator O'Sullivan. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, on behalf of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs References Committee. I present additional information received by the committee on its inquiry into the performance and integrity of Australia's administrative review system. So that's just it. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. And Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Environment and Communications Legislation Committee, I present additional information received by the committee as shown at item 17 on today's order of business. I also present additional information received by the Legal and Constitutional Affairs uh, Legislation Committee on its inquiry into the provisions of the Social Media Anti-Trolling Bill 2022. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Uh, Senator Shoebridge. Acting Deputy President, I hope I'm on the right matter. Um, 
this legal and constitutional affairs? Is this legal and constitutional affairs reference committee? Uh, so which, which which report was it that you were seeking oh, to take note of? My mistake, Sorry, Senator Shibridge. No, I've been led astray by my own failure. Just, oh, hang on, just, yeah. That's all right. We might come back to you, Senator Shibridge. Senator Shikoni. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit, I present four reports as listed at, at item 17 of today's order of business. On behalf of the Sorry, Joint Senator Standing— Sorry, Senator Shibridge. We might just let Senator Shikoni work through the— Sorry, Senator Shikoni, just on um, advice from the clerk, um, we might take note of the reports as that they are tabled. Sorry, my confusion around um, initially getting um, whips to move uh, on, a, on a block form. So, Senator Shoebridge, could you just perhaps remind the Senate which uh, report you are seeking to take note of well, there, uh, and there, then proceed? Um, there are two in Table 17. The first is I, I move that the Senate note the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Reference Committee additional information on the performance and integrity of the Australian's administrative review system and seek leave to continue my remarks in that, reg in that regard. Thank you. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Shoebridge. And then, Madam Acting Deputy President, if we're at it, it's the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit, um, the 489th report on defence and major projects report. Again, I, I move that the Senate note that report and seek leave to continue my remarks. Very good. That, that is perfectly uh, correct, Senator Shoebridge. Well done. Uh, Senator Roberts, are you seeking to take note of one of the reports that we've already tabled? Uh, or I, th I think we still have one more to be tabled okay. from the whip in this slot. Senator Shikoni. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties, I present the committee's 200th report. Very good. Uh, and if there were no senators specifically seeking to take note of that report, Senator Shikoni. Thank you again, Chair. Um, just, I'd like to take note of document number 61 on page 9 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Shikoni. Is that the only document that you are doing that in regards to this evening? Very good. Uh, Senator O'Sullivan, I'm assuming you are seeking to do the yes, same. Yes, very similar uh, thing that I'd like to do. I'd like to take, I rise to take note of uh, items uh, 55, 56, 58, and 59 on page 9. Also, uh, item 67 and 68 on page 10. And 70 and 73 on page 11, and 79 on page 12. I hope I've done that uh, slow enough, <laughs> and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, Senator Roberts, were you seeking to take note of one of the documents uh, on uh, yeah. some of the further pages? Yes, I move that the Senate take note of document number 62 on page 10. And I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Did we have any other senators wishing to speak on the uh, committee reports and government responses? Senator Steelejohn. Uh, thanks, Madam Acting Deputy Chair. And maybe I could seek your advice on this. I'm seeking to do two things. Uh, one, I uh, am seeking to reserve the uh, document number 77. The NDI says joint uh, standing committee report for 2022 general issues uh, and seek leave to continue my remarks there. You may do that. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, and then in relation to document number 72, the FADT uh, committee, uh, Australia's involvement in Afghanistan, I'm seeking to speak to that document. Would this be the appropriate time to do that? You would need to move to take note of that document, Senator Stilton, I, and then you yes, can speak to it. Indeed. I move that the Senate take uh, note of document number 72, uh, the FADT References Committee, Australia's involvement in Afghanistan. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, uh, here we are, 40, uh, 346 days uh, since the fall uh, of Afghanistan uh, to the Taliban. 
as we reflect today, uh, more than 59 per cent of the population of Afghanistan are in need of humanitarian assistance. Now is the time for us to reflect uh, and to examine how it came to this and what we need to do to make sure that this never happens again. Our actions in Afghanistan as a nation have led to a dire humanitarian crisis that have seen starvation and erosion of human rights and a crackdown on journalism and, activism and activists since August of 2021. My office has been contacted by many people desperately trying to get out of Afghanistan. We've heard from multiple uh, reports from Afghani people who assisted Australia during our time in Afghanistan uh, that have been injured, killed or, or, or who are currently uh, in hiding. This report uh, recaps that, and I quote, what is most disturbing is that the Australian government knew and reported on the risks the Taliban government had publicly and repeatedly broadcast their intention to seek retribution against anyone uh, who worked for coalition forces and foreign governments, including the Australian embassy, security guards, contractors and their family. The Morrison government actively chose to leave people behind. Now let me repeat that again. After dedicating uh, their lives and risking their uh, families' safety and security uh, to support Australian forces in Afghanistan, the previous government, through their incompetence, through their incompetence, left those people behind. They knew the harms that would come to civilians who worked for Allied forces. The value of camaraderie and service to our neighbours has not been applied to the Afghan civilians we left behind to face such terrible consequences. Their safety and sanctuary should be the priority of the current government and their repatriation must be prioritised. Given the risks they have taken, to protect Australian personnel, it is, very, it is the very least that the Albanese government could do. The deaths of Australian uh, locally contracted and engaged employees, as quoted in the report, is disgraceful. Their blood is on the hands of the Morrison government, and we must now work to help those we still can and reckon with the damage that has been caused. A recent UN report has highlighted the dire state of a growing humanitarian crisis uh, in Afghanistan uh, since the Taliban's uh, takeover. The Brereton report highlighted the consequences of involvement in a war with an unclear purpose and mandate. A strong signal of poor leadership and culture within special forces maintained by an ineffective chain of command. We are reminded by this report that war crimes committed by Australian forces in Afghanistan have caused immeasurable grief to families and communities of victims. An acknowledgement of the harms caused by members of the ADF, the Greens, committed in the run-up to the election and remain committed to establishing a reparation fund for victims and their families. The Greens will continue to call on the government to apologise to the people of Afghanistan uh, to contributing, uh, for contributing to, their, to the destabilisation of their country. As we consider where to from here, this report Ends, uh, this report and the end of the Allied war in Afghanistan presents an opportunity to recalibrate and re-strategize our, our defense priorities. For too long, we have blindly followed in the shadow of the United States and contributed to destructive war in our own region. Rethinking our relationship with the US and creating an independent, an independent defence and foreign policy for Australia will centre us as a country committed to peace, non-violent conflict resolution and the practice of uh, diplomacy among our allies. 
Importantly, the Australian Greens will continue to fight for War Powers legislation, which would require every member of parliament to vote uh, to approve the decision to commit Australian forces to a deployment or war overseas, legislation that is supported by the submissions accepted into this report. The power should not remain in the hands of the Prime Minister and his executive, but as with similar democracies abroad, be answerable to the parliament. Thank you, Senator Steele. John, are you seeking leave to continue your remarks? Uh, not in relation to that report. Very good. The question is that the Senate take note of the report. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Any other senators seeking to take note of committee reports and government responses? No. In that case, we will move along to delegation reports. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to present a delegation report. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I present the report of the Australian Parliamentary Delegation to the 144th Interparliamentary Union Assembly at Nusa Dua, Indonesia, which took place from 20 to 24 March 2022. I seek leave to move a motion to take note of the document. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Uh, in March of this year, I uh, attended the 144th Assembly of the Interparliamentary Union, or IPU, which took place in Nusa Dua, Bali. Uh, the overwhelming theme, and I attended with uh, Senator O'Neill, I do note that both of us attended the conference slightly late, and in part of that was due to the passing of Senator Kitchings, and which enabled Senator O'Neill to attend the funeral before joining me in Indonesia. Uh, but the overall uh, theme of the assembly uh, was getting to zero, mobilising parliaments to act on climate change. However, whilst uh, that was the official theme of the IPU, uh, what was incredibly apparent and what dominated much of the official proceedings uh, that was attended by 778 delegates and uh, 404 of those were parliamentarians representing 101 member parliaments. We were there to uh, look at, discuss and come together with regards to Russia's unlawful invasion of the Ukraine. Uh, Belarus and the Ukraine, uh, uh, sorry, and Russia were not in attendance at the conference. Uh, Ukraine was also not represented, but we did have a presentation from one of the Ukrainian ministers uh, expressing their thanks for our support. Uh, both Senator O'Neill and I spoke in the debate with regards to the emergency motion that was adopted by the Assembly in relation uh, to the war in Ukraine. Uh, the resolution was, uh, that was put was uh, calling for the peaceful resolution of the war in Ukraine, respecting international law, the Charter of the United Nations and territorial integrity. And that emergency item was submitted by New Zealand and their delegate lead, Louisa Wall, uh, who, whilst a member of the Labor Party uh, in, uh, in New Zealand, uh, was an absolutely outstanding delegate uh, and person and, unfortunately, uh, has now left the New Zealand parliament. Uh, when I spoke to the General Assembly with regards to the Ukrainian war, uh, Australia, through me, was the first nation and, in fact, uh, I think potentially maybe the only nation to directly call out China for its complete lack of uh, condemnation when it came to the illegal invasion. Uh, the Assembly also adopted uh, the, uh, a number of reports that it's required to do each time it meets. Uh, and, uh, that included, obviously, financial results and communication strategies for the IPU moving forward. Uh, we also, as Australia, participated in the 12-plus geopolitical group. Uh, we met a number of times uh, around the conference, but this was in part very much around coming to an agreement of the wording of the resolution that was put emergency item with regards to the war in Ukraine. Uh, Senators O'Neill and I, as the Australian delegation, 
uh, together with the British and New Zealand delegations, uh, went to the memorial site of the Bali bombing. I had actually never been before uh, to Bali, let alone to Kuta, uh, and to see where this bombing occurred, the tightness of the space, uh, it was absolutely horrific to imagine what would have occurred on that terrible, terrible night where so many Australians, New Zealanders and British citizens lost their lives. Uh, we did hold a number of bilateral meetings while we were there. Uh, some of the uh, ones that, that I think were, were very significant, we had a, a fabulous bilateral with Israel um, and particularly Avi Dikta from there. Um, Harriet Baldwin from the UK was an outstanding delegation leader. As, as I said, was Louisa Wall from New Zealand, who was accompanied by Nationals member Scott Simpson. Uh, the importance of some of these things are also the relationships you develop with your international parliamentary colleagues. And I would like to give a shout out to Silje Hjmalvo, which I'm sure I said wrong, from Norway, and Michelle Muttenferin from Germany, uh, who uh, were not only uh, colleagues that it was wonderful to meet and discuss issues with in Bali, but we have also stayed in contact. And Silje, as a libertarian in particular, has a very interesting Instagram account worth following. Uh, but overwhelmingly, it was an incredible conference to be part of, and I uh, am very grateful to have had the opportunity to lead the Australian delegation and the contribution that the IPU makes in bringing parliaments together across the world. Thank you, Senator Hughes. The question is that the Senate take note of the report. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, are there any ministerial statements? There are no ministerial statements. We move to committee memberships. The president has received letters nominating senators to be members of committees. Senator Watt. I seek leave to move a motion to appoint senators to committees, something I have never sought is, leave for before. Is leave granted? <laughs> leave is granted. Senator Watt. I move that senators be appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Watt be agreed to. Uh, Senator Waters. Yes, uh, Acting Deputy President, I seek to move an amendment to the motion and I move that at the end of the motion we add, except in relation to the Joint Standing Committee on the National Disability Insurance Scheme and in relation to that committee, paragraph 6 be amended as follows. Paragraph 6, the committee elect a minor group senator or independent senator as its chair and government member as its deputy chair who shall act as a chair of the committee at a time when the chair is not present at a meeting of the committee. My apologies, Senator Waters. Um, that was very well articulated, but we aren't at that point yet. Um, so move that motion in a f couple of minutes' time. We've got another few messages to go through uh, still. So the question before the chair is that the motion moved by Senator, or senator Watt be agreed to. All of those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, we go to messages from the House of Representatives. Thank you, Clark. The President has re received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment Royal Commission Response Bill 2022 for concurrence. Call the Minister, Senator Watt. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Watt be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to aged care health and aged care pricing and information sharing in relation to veterans and military rehabilitation and compensation and for related purposes. Thank you, clerk. Uh, I call the minister. Senator Watt. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Watt. I move that the debate be now adjourned. Uh, the question is that the motion moved by Senator Watt be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Messages have been received from the House of Representatives transmitting for concurrence resolutions relating to the formation of joint committees as listed on the dynamic red. I call the Minister, Senator Watt. I seek leave to have the messages considered immediately. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister, Senator Watt. Uh, I move that the Senate A concurs with the resolutions of the House of Representatives contained in messages numbers 2 to 6 and 8 to 16 relating to the appointment of joint committees and B, 
concurs with the resolution of the House of Representatives contained in message number seven, except that paragraph six of the resolution be amended as follows. Omit joint select committee and substitute joint standing committee. Senator, Wal uh, Senator Waters, rather, I think uh, that amendment that you attempted to move earlier is relevant to this section. So, yes, I will give you the call. Thank you very much, uh, Dep Acting Deputy President. With pleasure, I uh, reiterate that we'll be seeking to amend this motion um, and amend it in the terms as follows: that except in relation to the Joint Standing Committee on the National Disability Insurance Scheme, then in relation to that committee, paragraph six be amended as follows: that the committee elect a minor group senator or independent senator as its chair and a government member as its deputy chair who shall act as chair of the committee at any time when the chair is not present at a meeting of the committee. Uh, I seek your guidance as to whether I or any other speakers may speak to this amendment. Senator Waters, you are able to speak to the amendment, yes. Okay, well, look, I'll just make some very brief remarks. Um, we made history with the election of Senator Jordan Steelejohn uh, as a proud disabled man and some functional changes needed to be made to this chamber to even physically accommodate him. Um, we now have reset up the Joint Standing Committee on the National Disability Insurance Scheme, and it is my firm belief and the belief of my party, and perhaps a belief shared by others, that in fact disabled people should be in charge of making decisions about themselves. Now, we have uh, sought to obtain support to have Senator Steelejohn as either the chair or the deputy chair of this committee, um, and we have in good faith uh, sought to reach agreement on that. We have been unsuccessful in that. Um, and the reason for that is that the two big parties like to carve up the committees as the spoils of the two-party system. Now, we think in this instance it really would have sent a powerful message to the disability community that people who share a disability um, can be in charge of making decisions that set the rules for everybody else and that lived experience is crucial in decision making. That is why we seek to have a more diverse parliament, so that we can make decisions that appropriately reflect, reflect people's different lived experience and therefore can make better decisions for them. So it's for that reason that we sought to move this amendment. Um, the two parties have a real decision here. Do, do you want to seek to just control this as a committee that perhaps you might? Um, I, I won't speculate on your motives, perhaps they're noble motives, but the strong and powerful statement that having a person with disability chair this committee would, I think, be um, a real step forward for Australia. It would be a step forward for inclusion. It would be the right thing to do. So we urge every senator to think deeply about their vote to allow our senator um, with a disability to chair the, select, uh, the Joint Standing Committee on the Disability Insurance Scheme. Here, here. Here. Oh. Senator Lambie. To um, make a short statement, but um, I tell you what's going on here, and I've been saying this for a long time, that when you pick people to do jobs in this place, it's never, jo it's never um, picked on merit. I know what it's like um, with veterans, the amount of work that we have to put in, the fight that we have, to, we have to go to. I know what it's like that Senator Steelejohn also has to do all that extra work. He knows all those groups out there. He has contacts there everywhere. While you guys do a continuous revolving door of ministers, of people in charge, we are stuck with this from the time when we're fighting, whether it's for disabilities or veterans, we are stuck from this from the time we walk in to this chamber until we are finished, until our constituents say, we have had enough, we are voting you out or we leave on our own terms. If you want things done properly in this country, then you'll give it to the people that are stuck in these situations that know all these people on the outside that hear from every one of them every day of the week. These are the people who are the professionals. This is what you would do in business. But I'll know because of some stupid tradition, you would rather stick with that than give it to the job, to the people who deserve it. And I'll be honest, if somebody knows about disabilities in this Senate chamber, it is Senator Steelejohn. There is no debating this. I really wish you would start thinking outside the square, because quite frankly, if you haven't noticed, major parties are going out the door. This is happening. This is happening. Okay, you have a bloke that lives this, he breathes this, he knows everybody in the sector. It makes it that easy. Isn't this the person that you would want in the deputy chair or the chair? 
Isn't this the person that these people out there want representing them? To have the strongest voice possible where it matters most. Based on merit, because he's earned it. He's earned this. But oh no, because tradition is more important than humanity and doing the right thing in this chamber. When are you going to learn? When are you going to start paying merit to people who deserve it? And not because they're in your faction or they're over on this faction. Because this is how it works in here, people of Australia. It doesn't work. It's not the best person for the job in here. It's whether you're mates with someone or you're in a certain faction. This has to stop. This is killing politics in this country and is not giving the people that need a voice a fair go. It's got to stop. You want a fair go? You talk about a fair go over here, Labor. Right? You talk about merit, fair go? There he is. He's earned it. And by God, has he earned it. He's been his whole life there. You've got to start thinking outside the square. It is not fair. This tradition crap, it's finished. This is the 21st century. Start doing the right thing, giving the jobs to the people who deserve them, who've earned them, who've actually earned them. That's what I'm asking. We will be voting for you to be the chair, mate. Senator Still John. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy President. Let me thank, uh, let me thank Senator um, Waters and Senator Lambie uh, for, for your contributions. Uh, I thoroughly and deeply appreciate it. Um, I wasn't expecting to be able to speak to this motion this evening, um, but what I, what I will just add to the contributions that have been made uh, is this. I've, I've been a proud member of the Joint Standing Committee on the NDIS now for um, the best part of four years. Um, and I know from first-hand experience um, that it is a committee of the parliament which is held in very high regard by disabled people. Uh, because for the last four years particularly, they have known uh, that it is a committee which will be on their side. Uh, when the Liberal government particularly uh, was trying to push through independent assessments against the advice of many of their own colleagues. It was the Joint uh, Standing Committee, it was the NDIS Committee working with the disability community um, that delivered uh, so many of the key moments in that campaign, created the space for them uh, to be heard in the parliament. And the report that that committee handed down uh, was a key moment and ensuring that the Morrison government got the message that, in, that independent assessments needed to be uh, chucked in the bin. Uh, now, I, I want to reflect also that uh, since the election, the disability community have been really clear with all sides of politics. They want us, disabled people, uh, to work together urgently uh, to fix the NDIS and to break down the barriers of structural ableism everywhere they exist in society. And they have been really clear with every MP in this place that one of the best ways you do that is you put somebody uh, with lived experience in those roles. In those roles. Now, having been here for four years, I do also understand the importance of collaboration as part of these committee processes. And should the Senate tonight take uh, the step of uh, placing me in the position of uh, chair, I will, of course, work collect collectively and collaboratively across every section of this parliament to ensure that it is a committee which continues uh, to deliver uh, the uh, consensus uh, voice of the disability community. I absolutely pledge myself to doing that. Uh, but I also urge both parties tonight, both parties tonight, uh, to heed the words of the disability community in relation to placing people with lived experience in those leadership roles, in demonstrating clearly. You have another opportunity tonight to demonstrate clearly that you believe that disabled people belong in politics, that you believe that disabled people uh, should be trusted and are able to lead, lead the conversations in relation to our lives, 
in relation to our systems and processes, the systems and processes affecting four million disabled people, 500,000 of us on the NDIS and our families. Take this opportunity tonight. Let one of the conventions of this place that have existed for so long, stifled so much, go in this moment. Let it go and let us work together, not only to deliver an NDIS that works for everybody, but also to create a more accessible and inclusive society for everyone. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Does any other senator have a contribution? I put uh, to the chamber the amendment from Senator Waters to the motion that the Senate concurs with the resolutions of the House of Representatives relating to the appointment of the Joint Committee. So this is the amendment of the Greens. I put the question, those for the question say aye. Against, no. no. I think the noes have it. No. Is a division required? Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question before the Senate is, is the amendment to the motion that the Senate concurs with the resolutions of the House of Representatives relating to the appointment of joint committees. Those, are the, those for the ayes pass to the right of me, the noes to the left of me. I appoint as teller for the ayes Senator McKim and teller for the noes Senator O'Sullivan. Honourable Senators, there being 13 ayes and 37 noes, it's passed in the negative. I will now put the original motion that was before the Senate that the Senate concurs with the resolutions of the House of Representatives relating to the appointment of joint committees. Those for the question.
Honourable Senators, I'm the current question before the Senate now is the, uh, the motion moved by Senator Watt that the Senate concurs with the resolutions of the House of Representatives contained in messages number two to six and eight to sixteen relating to the appointment of joint committees and concurs with the resolution of the House of Representatives contained in message number seven, except that paragraph six of the resolution be amended as follows, which omits joint Senate committee and substitutes joint standing committee. So there is one minor amendment which is a typographical error. I'm going to put that question. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against? No. The ayes have it. Clark. Order of the day number one, Governor General's opening speech, resumption of debate on the motion of Senator Payment proposing an address in reply. Senator Wright. Senator Rice. Thanks, um, Acting De Thanks, Deputy President, and congratulations on your appointment. Thank you. So look, here we are: a new parliament, a new government, a new beginning. The night before election day, I wrote this in my diary. I said, I'm not daring to hope not daring to imagine what might evolve if we win one or more seats and the teal independents do too, this may be the election that breaks the back of the two-party system. Standing here just a couple of months later, I don't have to imagine. The people have spoken and they have elected 30 Greens and independents into the House and the Senate. And as far as our Greens vote, I want to thank every voter every volunteer, every member, every campaigner, every staff person who worked together to de deliver this excellent result. I can't tell you how delighted I am to be joined in the Senate by three new Green senators and three members of the House of Representatives. And as I welcome them to this place and their first speeches have begun, I've been reflecting on my early days as a senator and just how much has changed since then. Senator Rice, I, <laughs> it pains me, and I, but I have to interrupt you. Uh, and you'll be in continuance. I propose that the Senate now adjourn. Thank Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Oh, Deputy President, sorry. Um, we'll have to get used to the personnel changes around here. Uh, thank you. Um, Deputy President, and I rise to acknowledge the outstanding work of the Labor candidates and their campaign teams across the great state of New South Wales. Um, as the duty senator for the great seats of Farrah, Hume, Parks, Riverina and Robertson, I was indeed privileged to campaign alongside some incredible Australians, members of the Labor movement, friends of the Labor movement. Uh, unionists who stood with us, community members. Uh, some 70 per cent of the volunteers in the seat of Robertson were people who had never participated actively in politics of this nation previously, but were inspired uh, by the leadership of the candidate there and by the need for change in this country. And they came to life, and of course it was a remarkable result. I want to um, in particular acknowledge in that campaign of uh, Dr Gordon Reid, now the member for Robertson, the, um, there's a degree of a pride in that I live in that community and, having represented Robertson myself uh, in the House between 2010 and 2013, I know how hard it is to win as a seat. And I want to congratulate him on his tireless and very effective work to make Robertson a Labor seat again. Uh, Dr Reid, you are a true son of the coast one of the finest examples. I also want to thank uh, Joe Lloyd, his incredible campaign manager and his campaign team, Jesse Corder, Sarah Loney, Heidi Helliard and all the other countless volunteers who ensured that Labor became a majority government, that the Central Coast is now entirely Labor held and that our margin in Robertson was the biggest it's been in nearly three decades, uh, just gives a voice, uh, gives um, flesh to the reality of this historic campaign that will be spoken about and written about for many, many years to come. In other seats uh, where we put up a great fight, I'm sorry that I won't be joined by uh, new colleagues Darren Cameron, 
Greg Baines, uh, Jack Ayub, and also Mark Jefferson, who uh, are, are local branch members who really put their shoulders to the wheel and achieved incredible uh, swings and success in their push for uh, a place here in this parliament in the House of Representatives. Thank you to Darren Cameron for your years of friendship and your selfless decision to run for the Labor Party in Farrah. Thank you to your remarkable campaign team uh, and particularly to uh, the people who really operationalised that campaign in the city of Albury. Um, I'm sure that the success of this campaign uh, that you achieved in such a short period of time are an indication of a revitalisation of the labour movement in that region, up and down the Murray River. To uh, Jack Ayub, our tireless candidate for Parks, uh, and uh, the stellar campaign team that he had uh, on the road with him all the time, Zach Hatsis, uh, Stephen Lawrence, Phil Priest, Daria Turley, um, John Gordon, Marion Brown. This is a seat that covers from the uh, South Australian border. Uh, up and down the length of the, the Darling River and uh, right out to Dubbo. Amazing, amazing commitment to that seat. Uh, we made a number of commitments that are very important, especially delivering for the dialysis, uh, two dialysis buses for the far west, far west um, particularly impacting the Indigenous community in Wilcannia, who, uh, who let us know on the banks of the Darling uh, as we sat there with them. Uh, on Barker Country, that people simply could not afford to go and get dialysis in Broken Hill. They couldn't afford the petrol in their car, and people were dying because of a lack of access to uh, the service. So that's a remarkable uh, commitment from Labor, and it was hard earned by that community in the campaign out there. To Greg Baines, our outstanding candidate in Hume, um, fantastic swing to Labor on 2PP. Uh, the next adventure in, of uh, his life is equally as exciting. Thank you to his team. There was incredible leadership there by Michael Pilbrow, former Senator Ursula Stevens, and uh, the former candidate uh, um, Aoife Champion. Uh, it's a big seat, and they ran a brilliant campaign. Mark Jefferson, uh, down in the beautiful town of uh, city of Wagga, thanks for sticking your hand up once again to run for the Labor Party, which was then the safest seat in New South Wales. But thanks to Mark, that is no longer the case. So Mr McCormack has some serious competition. Congratulations to that campaign team, then, including Mick Sprague, Graham Cotter, Dan Hayes, Tim Krilovitz, and all the other members who fly the flag in Tiger Territory for the, part, for the party, and this was an excellent result. We have to represent all Australians everywhere, and I am absolutely committed as a duty senator to the western part of New Thank South you. Wales in the course of this parliament. Senator Anting. History is replete with examples of emergency powers being granted during a crisis, whether real or imagined. From ancient Rome to the events prior to World War II, tyranny descends under the cloak of emergency and the promise of safety. Well, history is repeating itself all over the Western world. In Rome, dictators were given absolute power for six months to lead the Republic in times of war. This worked at first, but eventually led to certain dictator generals taking absolute control and rewriting Roman laws and the constitution to entrench their power. The convenience of centralised power, although arguably necessary in war times, eventually led to tyranny. As Australian historian, historian Dr Stephen Chavira noted, emergency is the language that you use when democracy is no longer working for you. Political power is rarely relinquished voluntarily once it's acquired. And it's often acquired by those who would seek to subvert the democratic process by exploiting or inventing a crisis. Freedom must always be safeguarded, and the apparent convenience of centralising power in the hands of a few must be resisted. There may be circumstances, such as wartime, in which emergency powers are necessary for a limited time, as the purpose of emergency powers is to suspend the regular democratic process so the nation can efficiently deal with the threat at hand. The COVID period has highlighted this so clearly. But two and a half years on, Australia is still in virtual states of emergency, and in many cases, the true democratic process is still suspended or partially suspended. Victoria and South Australia's Labor governments have permanently entrenched newfound emergency powers and have su significantly expanded the scope of these powers, ready to be enacted when the next so-called emergency arrives. Now, magicians perform their tricks by using distractions. The same is true with the swathes of our political and bureaucratic classes. As the great Thomas Sowell wrote, 
If eternal vigilance is the price of freedom, incessant, incessant distractions are the way politicians take away our freedoms in order to enhance their power and longevity in office. Does COVID still look like an emergency to you? Would anyone still be afraid if not for the incessant propaganda of the corporate media cabal and our bureaucratic class? The greatest emergency I see is a lack of strength. And of course, the pattern continues with the lamentable World Health Organization declaring a monkeypox as a global health emergency, while the White House is now pivoting to the monkeypox emergency without even batting an eyelid. And coming up next is the so-called climate crisis. South Australia's parliament recently declared a climate emergency with no real evidence, and their proposed solution is transforming the economy to net zero emissions. Quite a goal, but how exactly it will be achieved? Well, here's the spoiler alert. It will involve more government control over your life, restricting your ability to run businesses how you want, restricting your ability to buy what you want, go where you want, along with soaring food, fuel and electricity prices. People do strange and terrible things when they're afraid. They behave emotionally and look for people to blame. Those who want rational debate and value freedom over the promise of safety are now labelled as threats to the public. We saw this with people who refused COVID mRNA injections. They were called anti-vaxxers, conspiracy theorists, just for wanting transparency and not wanting to be locked in their homes. I'm sure we'll see that with climate lockdowns too. Australians need to be aware that whether through apathy or by design, we are allowing our liberty to be sacrificed at the altar of safety. The weapon is fear. The remedy is the emergency declaration. As Edmund Burke said, no passion so effectively robs the mind of its powers of acting and reasoning as does fear. Aspiring tyrants know this well and will continue to exploit it. The game plan is to hold us in a perpetual state of emergency until absolute power is obtained. Don't sit by the sidelines and watch our freedom fade away. You better get involved before it's too late. Thank you, Senator Antic. Senator Rice. Thank you, President. I rise tonight to remember Philip Sutton, a dear friend and climate campaigning colleague. Philip died suddenly on the 13th of June, aged 71. He was a pioneer of the climate emergency movement and a powerful influence on environment campaigners across the globe. I met Philip when I started working at the Conservation Council of Victoria in 1983. Philip was the vice president and I was fresh out of uni. I remember so well late night conversations with Philip after CCV executive meetings over a chocolate mousse, yarning about what was needed for all life on the planet to have a, have a healthy future. In particular, the need for strategic planning to start at the end point of where we needed to be and then to develop genuine strategic plans that would achieve that rather than so-called strategies that are actually just lists of incremental actions reflecting on what is judged to be pragmatically possible at the time. Philip was one of the authors of the 1978 book Seeds for Change, crea creatively confronting the energy crisis. It was a groundbreaking alternative energy strategy for Victoria. Philip initiated the campaign that led to the banning of nuclear power in Victoria in 1983. And he was the architect of further groundbreaking work, the Victorian Flora and Fauna Guarantee legislation, which became the model for wildlife legisla legislation across Australia. And then, as the gravity of the climate crisis became clear, Philip turned his huge intellect and drive to tackling this existential challenge. Philip Sutton campaigned knowing that the climate risks threaten the future of the planet and of humanity and that therefore they required a society-wide mobilisation at an emergency scale and speed. And he argued that getting into emergency mode rapidly was the central challenge for the climate movement. And he outlined this in his 2008 book, Climate Code Red, The Case for Emergency Action, written with David Spratt, which codified the term climate emergency and shocked many readers into becoming climate activists. Philip was active with a huge range of environment and climate organisations. I'm indebted to Luke Taylor from the Breakthrough, the National Centre for Climate Restoration and the Sustainable Living Foundation for his obituary for Philip published in The Guardian, from which I have drawn much material in this speech. Philip was an initiating member of the movement that led the Darabin Council in Melbourne to become the first local council in the world to declare a climate emergency and he played a leading role in the international campaign that's resulted in more than 1,000 local, regional and national governments to follow suit. 
However, I received a classic Philip response when I texted him in 2019 after the Oxford Dictionary announced that climate emergency was its word of the year. Philip immediately texted back to say that he wasn't interested in ego gratification, nostalgia or virtue signalling, saying there is too little time. Philip emphasised the need for climate strategy to have an approach to risk with no less rigour than those applied in engineering and aviation. And he railed against the two degrees safe warming limit. Such a, re such a result would amount to a death sentence for billions of people and millions of species, he argued. Setting goals based on the protection of all people, all species and all generations, or maximum protection, was a framework which he pursued with tireless dedication. Philip was so frustrated at the slow pace of action on climate, he railed at our Greens policies as not being ambitious enough. And in this place, Philip is always with me when I hear the ongoing spruiking of coal and gas by both the Liberal and the Labor parties, and when I contemplate the unthinkable consequences of our climate crisis. To Philip, the future was real and tangible. He, looked, he refused to look away from how we are heading over the climate cliff. He loved nature and life, and he felt the pain and the suffering of people and animals and precious environments now and in the future. I send my love to Philip's sons, Daniel and Joey, his former partner, Cathy, his sister, Vidya, and brother, John, and to everyone who knew and loved Philip. Philip's legacy is the enormous role he played in our journey towards the time when we as a global community recognise the crisis we face and take the action needed for a healthy future. We aren't there yet. It is up to all of us to take this action, to continue this journey at emergency speed, in emergency mode, Thank until you, we Senator succeed. Thank you, Senator Your time has expired. Senator Davies, just in the nick of time. Thank you very much, Madam President. And, uh, it is my first opportunity to congratulate you on your appointment. I am sure you will do an outstanding job. Uh, I rise to talk on behalf of Donna Gilchrist, who lives in The Hunter. Donna and I met during pre-poll during the election campaign. And Donna has a story that she is desperate to tell. Donna, as a retiree, moved from Sydney to the Lake Macquarie area, um, purchased or, or took residence of a new place and thought she wanted some work done. So she did what so many people do and she got online to look for a tradesman. Unfortunately, she got scammed like so many of our aged and vulnerable do. Um, she entered an agreement with a supposed or alleged local gardener who called himself Luke from First Catch Gardening and Maintenance Service. Um, and she entered an agreement whereby she paid him up front. And then he did not return the services. So Donna went to the police and the police said, this is a contractual dispute. It's not a criminal matter. So we can't help you. Despite, apparently, the police having heard about Luke from First Catch Gardening and Maintenance Services before and from previous um, enterprises. According to Donna, she has now evidence to believe that Luke is a habitual scammer and has perpetrated dishonest activities under the guise of presenting himself as a qualified tradesman. And she's got evidence and uh, commentary from at least two separate individuals. Unfortunately, and as is so often the case, these individuals don't want to admit publicly that they've been scammed. One such individual who spoke to Donna is an accountant, still a practising accountant, and he doesn't want to put his name 
to uh, the allegation because he's worried it will affect his business. Because how can a smart, intelligent, qualified accountant be so easily scammed? Now, this is an issue that happens far too often in our society. But the police are hamstrung because the laws don't account for it. And in cases like this, where it's often a cash transaction, other authorities that are available to look at contractual disputes can't do anything. So the matter is left to civil affairs. But people like Donna, a retiree who was set to um, start her new life in the Lake Macquarie area, who was looking forward to a glorious garden that she could potter around in in her uh, latter years, get scammed, get taken for their savings and get left. Donna reached out to a current affair um, who did respond to her inquiry, uh, requested further information by way of photos and corroboration. Donna provided both. But because uh, the corroborating stories would not put their names to it, um, a current affair decided, and, and probably for quite just legal reasons, not to progress with the story. So Donna, at wit's end, was talking to me on the polling booth, and she said, I just want someone to hear my story. I just want someone to warn people that people like Luke from First Catch Gardening and Maintenance are out there and to give people a cautionary tale so that it doesn't happen to others. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Davey. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam President. Not a stitch of evidence we've heard from Senator uh, that spoke earlier, Janet Rice. Not a stitch of evidence, just wild, fearful, false claims contradicting hard evidence. I listen to the scientists, I cross-examine scientists, I debate the science, and in my life I have used the science to protect hundreds of lives in my role of knowing about atmospheric gases. Earlier this evening I discussed my cross-examination of CSIRO, and I will continue that at another date. Now I want to discuss the political class abdicating the people abdicating their responsibilities to the people. And let's start with the Howard Anderson government. When John Howard got booted from office in 2007, I wrote him a letter saying thank you very much for what you've done for the country, because he'd had 30 years of service. Six years later, I rescinded that letter, and I'll explain why. The Howard Anderson government introduced the renewable energy target in response to the UN's Kyoto Protocol. The Howard Anderson government said it would not signed the Kyoto Protocol, it, but it would comply with the UN's Kyoto Protocol. They, so they introduced the renewable energy target. That is now gutting our country's electricity sector, driving businesses overseas and causing unemployment in manufacturing in particular, but also farming. He became the, his government, the Howard Anderson government, became the first federal entity to have a policy calling for emissions trading scheme, a carbon dioxide tax. The first was these people here on the Liberal national side of politics. Then he did something that is so, so unbelievable and unimaginable for the Liberal Party, which is supposedly based on sanctity of life and the security of property, property rights. The Howard Anderson government stole farmers' property rights in a dirty deal done with the Queensland and New South Wales Labor governments to steal farmers' property rights. What they did was that they, they enabled the clearing of vegetation, that they stopped the farmers clearing the vegetation on their own land. And it is on hand, first of all, the deal was done in, in uh, Brisbane with Rob Borbidge's National Party government. So we had Howard Anderson, Liberal National Government, doing a deal, a dirty deal, to get around the Constitution, Section 51, Clause 31, requiring the payment of uh, just terms compensation for the stealing of property rights or the, the or the taking of property rights. Then that, that led to an agreement with Peter Beattie, who replaced Rob Borbidge, 
and the Beattie Labor government brought in measures guy, under the guise of a UN protocol saying that we would stop the clearing of land to protect native vegetation. And yet it's in record, it's on record in Hansard in the Queensland government, in Queensland Parliament, that the Beattie Howard deal with exchanges of letters from both was due, was due to John Howard needing to comply, his government needing to comply with the Kyoto Protocol. Farmers missed out on hundreds of billions of dollars of compensation in what it amounts to a naked theft of property rights, the rights to use property, and the Howard Anderson government went around the constitution to bypass so you could get Queensland to do the, do the dirty work to stop the clearing because the state government does not have to pay compensation. Six years later, after John Howard was booted from office, in 2013 he addressed the annual lecture at the Global Warming Policy Foundation, a skeptic think tank, and he confessed that after bringing in the renewable energy target that last year he said it was decimating our electricity sector and he regretted that it's gone so high, after bringing in place a carbon dioxide tax as policy, the first to do so, and after stealing farmers' property rights, he said, that he was agnostic on climate science. In other words, he didn't have the science. There was not a single stitch of science to back up John, ha John Howard and John Anderson's policy. Not a single stitch. Yet farmers around the country have lost their rights to use their land with no compensation. No science, just theft, no compensation. That is what we're looking at in this country. The abandonment of science. The parliament needs to come clean and restore integrity to use data and true science proving cause and effect. They have never done that. And to do cost-benefit analysis. The onus to provide the logical scientific points and the empirical scientific evidence is on those claiming a climate emergency and climate action. Until we see that, no policies. Rescind all policies on climate and, and uh, energy that are based on climate. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Your time has expired. Um, there being no further speakers, the Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m.